Good evening. Ms. Omesh? Can you hear me? I can now. Hello, uh, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Good evening, everybody. Ms. McLaughlin? Good evening. Hello, Ms. Tolan. I'm here. Thank you very much. Hello, Ms. Marin. Hello and happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Uh, Ms. Derenek Koufax. Hello, happy Hanukkah. Hello, uh, Dr. Anderson. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Good evening, everybody, and happy Hanukkah. Good evening, Ms. Cohen. Hi, guys. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Ms. Pekarski. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mr. Anabudo. I'm here. How's everyone doing? Doing all right. Thanks for being here. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to the Fairfax County School Board's December 10th return to school work session. Roshna Sizemore Heiser and I will be tonight's meeting managers. Um, just to give an overview of, of the evening, tonight's staff presentation, a little unique this time around, um, will be divided into two pieces, each followed by comments, <coughs> excuse me, and questions from board members, uh, each of whom will have three minutes to speak and ask questions. Staff and those presenting will also be encouraged to keep their answers to three minutes or less to provide for ample discussion. The first portion of the meeting, we will be joined by Dr. Gloria Odwayensu uh, from the Fairfax County Health Department. And the second portion of the meeting, we will be uh, also be joined by representatives from the principals associations. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn things over to staff to begin the first portion with tonight's first presentation. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Thank you, members of the school board. Uh, I'm glad to be here tonight and uh, to share with you and our community an update on our return to school plan, which we do monthly. As you know, returning to school safely, efficiently, and as early as we can remains our top priority. I want to say out of the gate that this presentation is for information only. There is no decision that I am asking for the board this evening. Uh, or that is required. This is an informational update around return to school. Um, obviously, this is a topic of great interest. And of course, we continue, uh, especially in these last weeks, to see increases in community transmission, both locally and across the country. We know that these increases in transmission in our community are concerning to our staff and to our families who have questions about safety of teaching and learning in person at this time. And tonight we want to address those real concerns and anxieties. I am here to provide the board and our FCPS staff and students and families with additional data and transparency to respond to and hopefully alleviate and reduce many of the concerns that we know exist. We will share data that demonstrates our effectiveness thus far in working on that core third factor of the CDC around our school mitigation strategies, and that we can contain the spread and have contained the spread of COVID in our schools, and that we are taking additional safeguards and collecting data to analyze so that our schools remain safe as we look to have additional groups of students return to school and our measured phased in approach. Our presentation objectives, if we could go ahead and put up the presentation, we'll go through those uh, objectives. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, remain the same objectives that we've had with you before, updating our local uh, uh, and FCPS specific health data, including analysis of the COVID cases we've seen in FCPS thus far. And as I said, it's very important to note that our FCPS COVID cases in our schools remain low. We're going to discuss our mitigation efforts and our safety team and deploy the schools. And we are very thankful, as you referenced, Mr. Frisch, that Dr. Gloria, who's the Director of Health for Fairfax County, is joining us for the first portion of the presentation to provide some updates on our considerations for decision making around in person learning. We'll share staffing updates, we'll share our grade uh, data from first quarter, and we will provide a strong 
systemic response this evening with equity at the center around the issues of grading uh, and needs and supports for our students. Finally, we'll share our draft timeline for in-person learning. It is a draft, but it is helping us begin to continue to prepare and our families and students prepare for returning to school in person in 2021. I wanna to go to our guiding principles. They remain the same as we've shared each uh, month with you. Uh, and we believe again that in-person instruction is best to meet students' academic, social, and emotional needs. We've seen that in our data and we're hearing those challenges loud and clear from our students. Our phase in decisions have been and continue to be made with student and staff safety as the highest priority with an increased emphasis on health and safety protocols for students and staff. And we're gonna turn now uh, to Dr. Boyd, our Assistant Superintendent for Special Services, who will focus on the health updates that I know are so important to everyone here in FCPS and our entire school community. Dr. Boyd. Good evening, good evening. And thank you, Dr. Bray Brand. Again, we are fortunate to have joined with us today, Dr. Gloria Adeyensu, and we'll be happy to talk with her momentarily. Right now, we want to begin by looking at our health metrics. As noticed in various news coverage and as discussed at our November return to school update, COVID rates have been increasing at the national, state, and local levels. The graph displayed here reflects community transmission, specifically as it relates to the first two core CDC indicators the total number of new cases per 100,000 persons within the last 14 days, and percentage of PCR tests that are positive during the last 14 days. As shown here, both number, both the number of cases per 100,000, the red line, and percent positivity, the green line, are both increasing in Fairfax County. As you may be aware, there was an update to the BDH dashboard today, which resulted in some changes in our community transmission metrics. Those updates have been made in our database for the last seven days and are reflected here on our graph. As we look at today's data relative to community transmission reflected in the first two core CDC indicators, Fairfax County is at the highest risk level with 477.2 cases per 100,000 persons within the last 14 days and is at the highest risk level for percent positive with 10.3% during the last 14 days. As a reminder, these two core CDC indicators are now being used as our interim stoplight for interim for in-person decision-making. Later this evening, we will share information with you about the process being implemented by our safety teams to provide data for the third core CDC indicator, implementation of mitigation strategies. Beyond the first two core CDC indicators, we also have secondary indicators that provide insight to community transmission. The secondary indicators are composed of Fairfax specific data and regional data for Northern Virginia. The percent change in the number of cases per 100,000 speaks specifically to the locality of Fairfax and is currently at the highest risk level with 77.5%. The remaining three secondary indicators are reflective of regional data in Northern Virginia. Percent of in-person inpatient hospital beds occupied in the region is 82.4% at the moderate risk level. Percent of inpatient hospital beds occupied specifically by COVID patients in the region, 14.4% at the moderate risk level and the existence of community or public outbreaks, which is 0.07. As a result of the increase in COVID rates in our community, Governor Northam took additional action in an effort to curtail the increasing trend. More specifically, on November 13th of 2020, Governor Northam issued the Sixth Amendment to the Executive Order in which the following was shared as a rationale for additional restrictions. Statewide increases in new COVID-19 cases, positive tests and hospitalizations, case-based investigation interviews that show a pattern of increased socialization with extended non-household family members and friends, and modeling data that demonstrates large gatherings substantially increased transmission of the virus. The Governor, governor Northam tightened the various restrictions, one being a reduced cap for in-person public and private gatherings to a maximum of 25 persons. 
While the new cap is not applicable in the educational or instructional settings, it does limit the use to 25. Our FCPS partners have been notified of the revised restrictions and their impact on scheduled events. This order will expire at 11.59 on, on Sunday, December 13th of 2020. A new executive order was released this afternoon, Executive Order 72, that it, which will go into effect on Monday, December 14th, at 2020 at 12.01 a.m. and will be in effect until 11.59 on January 31st, 2021. Dr. Braybrand will now provide us with a brief update on that new information. Dr. Braybrand. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Just briefly, and we're continuing to go over the multi-pages of the Governor's Executive Order 72. Uh, many things you've already heard in the media, a stay-at-home order starting on Monday at 12.01 a.m. to 5 a.m. unless commuting to and from work, limiting social gatherings to 10 people. Uh, that order will be in effect through January 31st. The Governor did mention that these regulations uh, will not change anything about schools, colleges, and universities. He shared that superintendents and school leaders are making the best decisions for their school districts, and he will continue to uh, rely on school boards, superintendents, and uh, school leaders to do that, and that he'll be working with education leaders uh, to continue to look at how we can help uh, address learning loss from COVID. He also shared that they would work on finding ways to get teachers uh, vaccinated um, and was hopeful that if the v VDA um, uh, does approve the vaccine, and they were meeting today that Virginia would start to get the vaccine within 24 to 48 hours. There'll be some additional things that we'll look at in the executive order and provide any additional updates uh, to our community and to our staff as needed. But most of this is focused on uh, our community at large and not specific to our schools and school operations. So thank you, Dr. Boyd. I'm sorry, I had some camera challenges. Thank you. We've examined our data regarding COVID transmission in our community and as discussed and discussed subsequent action that was taken by our governor to curtail the spread of COVID-19. Now let's look at the presence of COVID-19 in FCPS. Of the total of 12,410 in-person students and staff from September 8th to December 7th, 12,104 students and staff have not reported being COVID positive, representing 97% of our in-person community. 384 in-person students, staff, and visitors have reported being COVID positive, representing 3% of our in-person communities. Of the 3% of our are representing 384 cases, now let's look to see exactly how that's represented. Of our in-person students, 32 or 0.8% of our in-person student population was COVID positive. 295 of our in-person staff or 5.8% reported being COVID positive. 11 SRS students or 0.8% of the SRS student population reported being COVID positive. 16 SRS staff or 2.8%. 10 of our visitors to FCPS facilities 17 of our student athletes or 2.2% of our student athletes, three of our athletic coaches or 0.5% of our coaches, and of our 384 cases, 39 of those cases reflected transmission in schools, representing 10.2% of all cases or 0.3% of all in-person students and staff. Of the remaining cases, 345 of the 384, were cases from community transmission, which reflects 89.8% of all cases or 2.8% of all in-person students and staff. Of the EpiLink cases or the 39 cases that reflect transmissions in schools, that reflects 13 outbreaks. As a reminder, an outbreak in a school is defined by the Virginia Department of Health as at least two confirmed cases of COVID-19 where persons are linked by a common exposure in the school setting to an ill person, setting, event, and time period. Of the 13 outbreaks, the primary case staff 
was a staff member in 11 situations, and the primary case was a student in two situations. Nine of our outbreaks had two to three associated cases, and four of our outbreaks had four to six associated cases. Our number one defense against COVID transmission in our schools is the five key mitigation strategies. Consistent and correct use of face masks and that masks are covering one's nose and mouth, secure under the chin and fit snugly against the sides of the face. Social distancing to the greatest extent possible where we're maintaining a distance of six feet between people whenever possible. Hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette where we're washing our hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. We're covering our coughs and our sneezes with a tissue and washing our hands with soap immediately after for at least 20 seconds, or we're using hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Our next key mitigation strategy is cleaning and disinfecting. And when we're cleaning our frequently touched surfaces as much as possible. And last but not least is our collaboration with our health department around our contact tracing. As part of our process and our collaboration, BDH has made available free testing with one day results available to symptomatic students and staff or those identified as close contacts as a result of a positive case in school for those persons who need support accessing testing. This is an extremely valuable resource as it can assist in decreasing the amount of time that staff are unavailable for in-person instruction. As a reminder, CDC defines close contacts as someone who is within six feet of an infected person for a cumulative total of 15 minutes or more over a 24 hour period, starting from two days before illness onset or for an asymptomatic patient two days prior to a test collection until the patient is isolated. We've talked about our five key mitigation strategies. And as you can see on this diagram, mitigation strategies are everyone's responsibility. Students, staff, family, and the community. We're changing our culture, we're changing our way of life to ensure that the five key mitigation strategies become a part of our consciousness. We must all help each other with the correct and consistent implementation of mitigation strategies with focused, friendly feedback as the successful implementation of mitigation strategies can prevent or reduce transmission of COVID in our schools and enable students to engage in in-person instruction, even when our community transmission is high. As a reminder, it's extremely important that everyone stay home when sick. We love that our students want to be in school and that our staff want to come in to support our students. However, we want to do so safely. I want students and staff to take the time they need to get well by staying home when sick. Also, please be reminded that students and staff who are symptomatic who have someone in the household that is COVID positive or who have been identified as a close contact or to stay home and follow the guidance outlined in the parent commitment form and return to work form. As we reflect and as we have lessons learned from instances where we've had transmission in school, we've made some adjustments and some additional measures, measures to support the health and safety. One of the things that we noted is that sometimes we unintentionally revert back to pre-COVID practices. This has certainly been a change in life and a change of ways of thinking for all of us. So the things that we're doing to help with that is increasing daily messaging to remind all stakeholders of the importance of mitigation strategies. We'll be doing that through email, social media, and announcements, and that has already begun and we plan to increase those efforts. Face mask exemptions. We know that face mask exemptions or of concern with a number of our stakeholders because as Dr. Brabrand shared at the beginning of the presentation, these are truly challenging times and we've all just been impacted in various ways. So what we're doing to ensure that we're fostering the safety of all persons is examining on an individual basis, our ability to support face mask compliance, excuse me, face mask exemptions by looking at the environment and identifying if we can support students by pro providing alternative supports or protections. Again, that's going to be done on an individual basis to ensure and to foster the safety of all students and staff. Social distancing has also been something where we had lessons learned regarding our transmission in schools. So we've been collaborating with the health department 
and department managers and FCPS to look at our practices and some of our unique departments to determine how our work functions can be done while implementing those five key mitigation strategies specifically to ensure that we're social distancing to the greatest extent possible. Additional strategies that we're implementing beyond our lessons learned from transmission in schools also reflect and refer to social distancing and face masks. The first piece is that we will be restricting visits to other classrooms and offices unless it's required to complete one's work functions. We know in school we, we, we found ourselves and proud ourselves on collaboration and working together, but we're just going to continue to do that, but just do it differently. And we may do that virtually via phone, but we really, really must encourage and must um, ensure that staff and students are only in rooms needed to complete those work functions. Also with social distancing, we're requiring the use of PPE associated with the task risk as identified in our PPE strategies and guidelines for the proper use of PPE. We know that some of our staff are working in close proximity with students and need to do so to complete their job functions. And we want to ensure that all staff that are engaging in higher risk activities, that they're using the appropriate PPE because they can't social distance six feet. So again, we want to make sure that you're protecting yourself and protecting others. Around our consistent and correct use of face masks, we understand that we have students that are developing tolerance to wear face masks, and we've been working diligently with those students as we understand that some of our students have special needs and may have sensory challenges or other challenges that make it difficult to wear face masks throughout the school day. Staff have done an amazing, amazing job really working individually with students to develop that tolerance during the last six or seven weeks that we've been in school. At this time, our procedural support liaisons will be partnering with schools to identify students who have not yet, even with the support provided, developed the ability to correctly and consistently wear a face mask. And we'll be providing next steps to families um, regarding the potential need for those students to transition back to virtual learning if they haven't developed the consistent and correct use of face masks prior to us departing for winter break. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jeff Plattenberg, Assistant Superintendent for our School Facility and Transportation Services, who will provide us with an update on mitigation strategies, specifically as they relate to our safety teams. Mr. Plattenberg? Thank you very much, Dr. Boyd. And one of the measures, as uh, Dr. Boyd mentioned, the mitigation strategies are everyone's responsibility. And I'd like to reiterate what she also mentioned. Our teams, our, our parents, our students, our faculty, the teachers, the custodians, the bus drivers, our principals and assistant principals, ever since this pandemic has hit, has worked tirelessly to ensure that we have mitigation strategies in place and the ability to go ahead and meet the needs of our students and our teachers. Um, as an extension of that, we have implemented the mitigation strategy safety team, and we have an overview that we're gonna provide about what they are performing. We've implemented these safety teams to monitor the COVID-19 mitigation and these strategies within the schools. And the two main purposes for this monitoring is to provide the continuous improvement feedback to our schools so they can improve on the implementation of the great work they've been doing regarding mitigation strategies. It's also to provide reliable valid data for the use of our third health metric. The United States Centers for Disease Control indicates the mitigation strategies are that are consistently and correctly utilized risk this, uh, reduce the risk of spread within the school environment and the surrounding community. So the safety team monitoring for metric data, the teams are gonna be, they're gonna monitor for reliable valid data on correctness and consistency for implementation of the five key CDC mitigation strategies. There will be external non-school-based observers to ensure objectivity. Observers will have regularly scheduled joint observations to ensure interrelated reliability and for the consistency of the ratings across the observations. The safety scoring rubric is a basic uh, Likert scale, a five point scale for the overall school grade. And the indicators here are just depicted for um, green, the top for five, that all strategies are correctly and consistently implemented. Four, all st five strategies correctly but inconsistency, inconsistently implemented. Three, three to four strategies are consistently and correctly implemented. Two, one to two strategies are correctly and consistently implemented. And then one where no strategies would be implemented. 
And they would then indicate the risk level for the mitigating strategies based upon these. All these numbers are rounded down. The comparison district mitigation strategies based on the publicly available information, FCPS is going above and beyond many school districts in the mitigation strategy management and monitoring. Almost all comparison districts provide a COVID dashboard for transparency, but few provide data on mitigation strategies. Most national comparison districts did not provide public information on mitigation strategy implementation. Those that do reflect the same CDC strategies that FCPS is highlighting required face coverings, hand washing breaks, physical distancing where possible, deep cleaning of the buildings and communication and response plans for positive cases in buildings. Only one comparison school district, Chicago City Public Schools, indicated that the strategies would be monitored and reported to the state. At this point, I'd like, uh, after this, we also, by the way, as part of our teams, we've implemented the Office of the Ombudsman, who we already have had and has done amazing work within that office for community feedback on our mitigation strategies. Not only are we inspecting what we expect with these safety teams, but we're also asking the Ombudsman to pull another role to provide the ability for confidential or indirect or direct feedback on our mitigation strategies, uh, where community members, parents, visitors, and staff have the opportunity to provide that feedback on the five key CDC mitigation strategies. Community members can share both the strengths and the challenges and observe in their observations of how the schools are implementing these mitigation strategies. And the feedback provided by the community members will be shared in a confidential manner with the appropriate personnel to make sure our continuous improvement continues. And keep in mind, since we began in this entire process, we've been addressing the five CDC mitigation strategies through a number of various ways. And we have evolved to utilizing this process to make sure that we can be informing and also inform our decision-making process. I'm now gonna turn it back over to Dr. Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Plattenberg. We've talked about three CDC indicators and we've shown you those metrics at each of our return to school updates. And we've also talked about how we are collecting data for our third CDC indicator, mitigation strategies. The CDC indicators for dynamic decision-making is available to all schools. So one might wonder why school divisions with the like community metrics within Virginia and other states are different, different regarding our level of opening status. On the screen here, you'll see a number of our neighboring districts, as well as their number of cases per 100,000, their percent positivity, comments regarding their opening status, and data that was publicly available regarding their positive cases within their school divisions. This, the school divisions listed on this screen, Arlington, Fairfax, Falls Church, and Montgomery County, would be classified and aligned with phase one of Virginia's guidance in that most students are vulnerable and a small number of students with disabilities are participating in in-person instruction. As we look at the next slide, you'll see an another list of districts that have similar metrics, but those districts are participating or engaging in phase two or phase three guidance if they run on with Virginia's phase guidance. And so you'll see that again, all districts are in highest risk on both slides in phase one, phase two, and phase three with the number of cases regarding their community transmission. And there are some variants with percent positivity, but there is a distinct difference. We've been so fortunate to be able to partner with the, the Fairfax County Health Department in determining how all those things align. The key question that many people have been asking us and that you wanna know is how will, we, how will we implement or how will we measure or weigh community transmission and transmission in schools? Dr. Gloria Adienso from the Fairfax County Health Department is now gonna to talk to us about a draft model that we've been collaborating on. Dr. Gloria, I turn it over to you and thank you so much for joining us on this evening. Of course, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you well. Great, good evening everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present. Um, if I may have the first slide, please. So as you know, over the past 10 months, the health department has been working with colleagues at FCPS to provide guidance on how best to balance the risks and benefits of in-person education 
using um, guidance from CDC and VDH. The guidance has not changed per se, um, but has gone through uh, a number of revisions to make the decision making more tangible and predictable, um, although it is still highly recommended that uh, decisions be informed by um, what the contact investigation reveals about in-school um, transmission. So I'd like to recap um, the CDC um, recommendations. So CDC recommends um, the use of three core indicators, as you've heard, when deciding to open, close, or reopen schools. Two measures uh, of community burden and one self-assessed measure of school implementation of the key um, mitigation strategies. Um, the community um, 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 measures are the number of new cases per 100,000 in the past 14 days, as well as the um, positivity rate from the PCR testing. The um, community indicators, um, as you know, are a measure, these measures that we just talked about are a measure of the level of community transmission. And while increasing community burden increases the risk of introduction of the virus to a school, the risk of transmission within the school is dependent on the implementation of those five key mitigation strategies, which is why you've heard it over and over again, and we continue um, to stress. The two are different. Um, community, trans from community transmission um, increases the likelihood that somebody appears to the school building with COVID, but it doesn't have to um, translate into transmission within that um, um, building. So, you know, even if community transmission is low, um, but school mitigation strategies um, are not implemented, then the risk of subsequent transmission of the virus in a school will increase once it is introduced by either a teacher or a student. Alternately, if community transmission is high, but school mitigation strategies are implemented and strictly followed as recommended, then the risk of subsequent transmission of the virus in a school will be lower, even when the risk of introduction may be high. Um, as I said, this is something that you've heard over and over again but um, it bears repeating because these measures are all we've got and they are very effective when practiced consistently and correctly. School systems in many parts of the world, including our own um, Camp Fairfax and um, the SRS program have shown that it is possible to remain open. So as you think about the potential risk of transmission in school, I would ask that you start with FCPS's ability to implement the key mitigation strategies system-wide and in each school. These strategies are most effective when compliance is universal and when all the strategies are used together. And for FCPS to be successful, these mitigation um, strategies um, cannot be a checkoff exercise. It has to be a strategic process that incorporates the correct and consistent practice of these mitigation measures into your operational culture. And I have to say that I've been encouraged um, as I've spoken um, to Michelle um, over the last um, week or, or two, uh, as I learn about all that um, FCPS is planning to do, um, I'm encouraged that, um, um, that, it, that, it is, that you will be successful. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? So, I'm sorry, the, that's correct. So over the last few months, um, we've had multiple conversations about uh, concrete, concrete um, triggers for transitioning between the different levels of instruction. Um, recent tools that you have seen um, developed by CDC have been somewhat helpful in assessing risk of transmission in the community, as well as in school but it does not go far enough. Um, and what you see here is a revision of a recent document um, that we saw from New Hampshire, which um, I think is the best attempt, at least that I have seen so far, 
at connecting the dots between contact tracing and the CDC core indicators. Um, what you see here is a little tweaking um, of that document to make it more applicable to our Fairfax situation. Um, let me just um, you know, say that it is work in progress, um, but I wanted to share it today to get your feedback as we work to finalize it. My hope is that um, FCPS will be able to adopt this approach um, to decision-making in the future, as opposed to solely relying on the community transmission indicators. Um, so to look at the first table, this table uses the same two CDC indicators for determining um, COVID community transmission. Um, the number of new um, infections per 100,000, um, as well as the PCR um, positivity um, um, as a seven day um, average. What is different between um, this table and the CDC table is that the um, risk levels in this one here have been collapsed into three levels as opposed to five. So for the CDC document, if you recall, it has lowest, lower, moderate, higher, and then highest um, categories. Um, but in here, we have um, collapsed it into three. Um, so for minimal, we have um, less than 50, which in the CDC um, um, uh, uh, table, lowest, lower, and moderate was up to 50. So we've, collect, we've condensed those three um, into the minimal. And then the moderate is 50 to 200. And that used to be CDC's uh, quote unquote higher um, um, area. And then the substantial, what we have here as substantial is what they had as the highest. In the second um, table, um, what, what we're looking at here um, is school specific um, impact um, of in-school transmission, which is the first um, criteria, as well as the ability of schools um, to remain open um, based on, uh, for example, adequate staffing um, and transportation, teaching, and to do administrative um, functions as well. Again, we have um, three um, categories, low, medium, and high. Um, for the transmission within the school facility criteria, um, low is when we have zero or sporadic cases um, with no evidence of transmission within the school setting. Um, so an example of that is, for example, the, um, the SRS program where they've had 33 uh, uh, cases and in only one instance has there been um, transmission um, between two um, staff members. So you can have sporadic cases. It could be 100 times, 200 times. Increase transmission in our community. We expect to have more and more people showing up. But so long as we're not having any evidence of transmission within the school, the numbers really don't matter and will con continue to remain low um, in terms of that impact. Um, and then under medium, what we have um, is up to two unrelated clusters in a school within a 14-day uh, um, period. And we define a cluster as two or more individuals who are confirmed with COVID um, who are uh, part of a related group of individuals such as a classroom, um, and um, who, and 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 these cases have come about because of the uh, potential to transmit that infection through contact within that setting. And then for the th the third category, which is the high level, um, we are designating that as, oops, when we have greater than two unrelated um, clusters. I'm sorry, my computer might actually go off in a moment. I don't know what's going on in this building. I'm sorry. Um, so, so as I said, the high um, category is when we have greater than two unrelated um, clusters. And then in terms of the um, staff capacity, 
Um, I think that um, even, even though you are uh, probably tracking that, I think it's important for us to group all of these factors together because it is a very significant um, factor um, that will um, determine whether FCPS is, is able to um, 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 fully operate in person or not. Next slide, please. So I'm sorry, can you, can you go back a moment? One of the things I want to um, note is that for both tables, the overall level of school impact should be assigned based on the highest level identified by any one of the criteria. So when it comes to making decisions um, um, in, in regards to the level of community transmission, if the um, number of new infections is substantial, regardless of the positivity rate, we're going to go with substantial in decision making. Um, when it comes to the second table, um, regardless of um, what the um, transmission within the school facility is, even if it's low, if staff capacity to conduct um, classes and school oper operations is not sufficient and is therefore in the critical or, or high category, then schools will have to make decisions about in-person um, learning because it is not feasible um, given the, that the staff capacity is not there. Next slide, please. So putting all of this together, <clears throat> what we are proposing is that FCPS uses the assigned community transmission and school impact levels to identify the most appropriate method of instruction, um, as well as make decisions around when we move between methods of um, instruction. I think the in-person and remote learning options are clear cut. So the in-person is shown in the green and then the remote options are, are, are red. Um, but the, the, the hybrids may be a bit nuanced um, in practice. And in some instances, in some circumstances, schools may um, take a less restrictive approach than what is suggested here in the table. And for example, if a school is operating with a full in-person instructional model and able to manage with low school impact, despite a, a substantial level of community transmission, then that school can reasonably, uh, reasonably hold course and continue with in-person instruction if resources allow. Um, this suggestion is based on um, global data that suggests that uh, schools are not associated with an increased um, risk of COVID-19. Um, our own experience here with Camp, Dave, uh, Camp Fairfax and SRS is an example um, and so, like right now, even though uh, our community transmission is substantial, um, we are not making any recommendations to dial down um, the SRS um, um, program because um, because of the uh, of the uh, current surge um, in cases. What the SRS program needs to be doing now and is doing is to ensure that they are intensifying ongoing efforts to implement the mitigation measures correctly and consistently because there is now a higher risk that someone or, or a higher probability that someone is gonna to come to school um, infected with COVID. Um, just to give you a little um, <clears throat> um, update of how they are doing, I know Michelle touched on it a bit, um, but of the approximately 1,200 students that they have enrolled. Um, there have been 33 cases to date, as I said, um, 19 um, staff and 14 students. And in only one situation did they have transmission from one staff member to another staff member. Um, what this means is that with ongoing community transmission, um, there has been introduction of the COVID virus into the SRS program 32 times. However, with good mitigation, there has only been one instance of transmission between staff. And I sincerely believe that this is possible at FCPS. Um, I look forward to continuing to um, work with Michelle and others um, to support ongoing efforts 
um, at FCPS. Um, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to present this information and I really appreciate your, your feedback um, directly or through our FCPS um, colleagues um, in, the, in the near future. Uh, we purposefully did not um, make any final decisions around this. This is something that I, I've shared with um, Michelle in the last few days um, and asked her if you know she thought it would be something that um, you all might be interested in, in in looking at and to have the opportunity to think about. I know you have another um, meeting coming up in January. And so um, between now and then, if there was interest, um, we could um, you know begin to um, refine it um, based on feedback that we hear from you all. And um, hopefully um, moving forward, it will be a useful tool that we can use um, for schools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. As we think about the key points in our health section, most of our COVID cases, 345 reflecting out of three, excuse me, 345, which is the 89.8% of our cases reflect community transmission, not transmission in our schools. We're taking additional action because just a small number of transmissions we had in our schools, that's not sufficient. We're not happy with where we are. We wanna take additional action and are taking additional action to review, reduce and minimize or eliminate transmission in our schools. The correct and consistent implementation of mitigation strategies as we've shared this evening, and as Dr. Gloria has so eloquently stated, is critical in minimizing and preventing COVID transmissions in our schools. Mr. Plattenberg talked to you about our safety teams. They're providing additional support by assessing schools. And again, it is for continuous and ongoing improvement. Yes, we're using that information to inform our data, to inform our third CDC indicator, but more importantly is to ensure that all of us are safe. And last but not least, we're providing um, the Fairfax County Health Department, as you just saw, is providing us with an additional tool um, to assist us in our decision-making process. Is that the conclusion of the, the first portion? I'm sorry, I apologize, Mr. Fisher. No worries. For a second. Go ahead. One more ahead. slide, sorry. Um, just as some final points that we'll con as shared, we'll continue to work with the health department to finalize our tool. But in the interim, we will continue to use our current decision-making process in the interim. It's based on those two of the three CDC indicators. And last but not least, just want to reiterate that given the correct and consistent implementation of mitigation strategies, we can reduce risk in schools. And so we are continuing to proceed with our planning for a phased return of additional groups. Um, and we'll share those in-person target start dates um, with you later this evening. At this time, we'd like to take questions. If you have any questions of Great. Dr. Gloria or the health team at this time. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Uh, before we get started, I encourage my colleagues to focus their first round of board member time on health metrics and other items included in this first portion of the staff presentation, since we have limited time uh, with Dr. Odwayansu uh, this evening. That said, you are, of course, free to use your time as you see fit. So we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Anderson. <clears throat> Thank you. Just trying to turn on my video there. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Adoy, Adoy Yensu, um, I had a question regarding what you just shared with us. You talked about um, having some school specific um, thresholds and measures in place with the new approach from New Hampshire. And you talked about the mitigation factors being really essential and offsetting school decisions. Um, you also talked about the successes of the SRS program. Um, can anybody speak to uh, as to whether or not we have had the safety audit teams um, audit the SRS programs? And if so, what is that data? Dr. Anderson, at this time, we have not had the safety teams to audit the SRS programs. Our safety teams have primarily to date have focused on our FCPS classes, but we certainly um, welcome the opportunity to collaborate with our partners um, so that again, we can learn from one another. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Adoy Yensu, you talked about the related groups of individuals. Can you be a little bit more specific? What does that mean? Is that within the same class, within the same group? Two people who share a similar, like who work in a similar environment, like in the cafeteria. What does that mean exactly? And I can't remember what page number that was on, what slide number that was on. Thank you for that question. I believe you were um, talking about the clusters. Um, sure. I don't. It was the slide that. It was the slide consideration for transitioning. Yes. Yes. The second set, the second um, chart that talked the high where it says greater than two unrelated clusters. Yes, that's right. It's the clusters. That's what do we mean by clusters of individuals? So, um, so two unrelated clusters in um, in a school. So, with every case, we get every case. Um, gets a, its own case and contact investigation. So we look at who may have been exposed to that case and then quickly identify them to see whether they are ill um, or not so that we can separate them if they are ill from others. Um, but even if they are not ill, we know that they may be infected, may be incubating, um, and we try to um, quickly uh, um, um, separate them as well through what we call quarantine. So um, quarantine and isolation is um, just referring to the um, um, separation of individuals from the rest of community to protect the community. Isolation refers to the separation of ill individuals and quarantine refers to the separation of well individuals. So when we have a case, we will identify the close contacts, those who have been within six feet um, for the cumulative time of 15 minutes or more. Mm -hmm. And if there are, if no one fits that um, criteria, then it is determined that no um, um, exposures may have happened in that setting as relates to just that one individual. So if in a day, four individuals um, show up in a school, the, the, each case will have its own investigation. We'll be looking at them separately to see if there are any connections. Obviously, if all four of them are in the same classroom, then the, you know, it, it, it kind of sends off um, the alarm bells that something happened within that classroom. But if those four individuals um, happened um, to be anywhere in the school, one person in the administrative office, one in classroom A, another in classroom B, and so on. Each of mm -hmm. the investigations are looked at separately, and in doing so, it is also um, we also look to determine whether there's any linkages. Even though they are not in the same classroom, could something have happened? And that's how you get, that's what you gain, you try to ascertain through the detailed um, questioning of all of these cases. What did you do? We know that um, you know um, people start shedding virus two to about uh, two days before they become symptomatic. So the first thing is to determine when the symptoms started. Then we go two days back and we ask them, where have you been? What did you do? Who were you in close contact with? All of those things. Each of those four people in the school will be asking the same thing, and the investigators will be trying to piece together. Sometimes, um, you know, after the first line of uh, questioning. And you know, people put their heads together. Um, we decide we have to go back. Something just doesn't add up, or there could be more. It's trying to make sure that we are not missing um, something more, um, you know, insidious um, that is within the school system. So, a cluster. So each of those people, if they determined that there was that, that there were no um, contacts within the school. That would, no, that would not be a cluster. Four individuals, okay. not. If, however, person A has three contacts and the two of those contacts become ill, person A um, and the contacts are now considered one cluster. And so another individual, we go through the same thing mm -hmm. to find the clusters that way. 
Thank you for that. So it's possible that there might be several cases in one school building, but because the contact tracing um, would reveal that they were not related, it would not be considered a cluster. Is that, that correct? Is correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that this is a fairly new procedure or approach or model that's come out of New Hampshire. How long has this been in use? And where else do we, do you know that this has been utilized? Actually, this is not new as an approach. This is what we've been trying to articulate. It's just been difficult to articulate because, you know, I know the first time I, I met with you all um, in trying to convey this picture, I said, it depends. Well, that was not good enough because it, there were so many, there's so many permutations and, and people, I, I understand it's important that you're able to um, have more concrete um, um, parameters around. So what this has done, what is new about this is, this is the first time that I've seen on paper, this very complicated um, um, relationship between mm -hmm. contact tracing and the transmission, the five, um, um, uh, what do you call it, mitigation strategies and how they impact, um, because the five, um, the five mitigation strategies, although you don't see them here, is what prevents the clusters from happening. If you're doing good mitigation strategies, you're following all of them consistently and correctly, that decreases the risk of transmission in schools. And by decreasing the transmission, the, the risk of transmission in schools, you are not going to have, it's going to be um, um, rare that you have um, these clusters or additional cases from, from, from occurring. So, um, so again, this is not anything new. It's just, I think, um, a, a, a better, the best visualization that I have seen of all of these concepts that we've talked to about in the past. Okay, and um, this brings the decision making to the school level rather than to the division level as well. That is correct. So that box, um, that second slide there, you can look at it as happening within a school. It works for a school and it also works for schools. Um, the the um, the how should I put it? Um, the the fact that um, you know a school is 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 having issues with transmission um, doesn't mean that the entire school system needs to close down. Um, if there are no issues at the other sites. It's, it's almost like when you have a, a problem with, um, you know, with um, lead in pipes or whatever um, in a school, one school, the investigation is done. And if it leads to, oh, maybe there was this old um, drinking, you know, fountain um, that, you know, had the, the, the highest lead level in the water, that issue is addressed and it's, it's, it's over. However, if FCPS decides to do an investigation of other school and, and keeps finding additional um, lead problems, um, it might um, um, be forced to um, shut the whole system down because, you know, you, you, you go from 10 to 20 to 30, you're thinking this is, that, you know, this is appearing to be a pattern as opposed to be a one-off. Maybe we need to close down and check the whole system out. So the same okay. the same kind of thing <clears throat> applies to this school. A school might have an issue because they are not complying or implementing the mitigation strategies well. That is um, an issue that needs to be um, addressed with the school. But as I've said to Michelle many times, each case that each transmission that occurs in a school should be a um, learning opportunity to see that to make sure that system-wide, if those issues are happening, that either through policy or training, um, you know, that issue is corrected so that FCPS doesn't have to learn the lesson 196 times. Um, so, yeah. And you also mentioned that you're bringing this for us for, for feedback, for consideration. We would come back to this. 
and I, we appreciate that, but is this also a recommendation that you're providing that we adopt this approach? I, I'm unclear in terms of the guidance. So, you know, as again, we, it's only been a couple, several days now um, since I've been looking at it um, um, seriously. And I, I have said this to uh, my colleagues at FCPS numerous times that I think the current decision making of um, you know um, dialing up and down um, based on um, community transmission or a PCR positivity rate is really not um, the right way to um, to to really make decisions um, because it's it's based solely on community transmission, which as we we've seen here in Fairfax County. Um, does not have to equate to transmission within the school setting. Um, so I'm hoping that this will will help um, in 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 should, maintaining um, um, the in-person learning. If FCPS does not have to, um, you know, uh, dial down um, and in, you know into the virtual. Um, a learning mode, because we do know that, um, you know, we've seen, um, it's not unique to FCPS, we do know that, um, you know, not being in school has had a significant impact on our students um, um, and our kids. So, um, again, looking at how we can do this safely, safer than, um, it's, as I said before, it's not going to be completely safe because we're in a pandemic but how do we make it safer and continue to learn from um, lessons um, within school, the, each, within a school, uh, within the school system um, to, com to continue to make it um, safer for our kids um, to be able to um, benefit from in-person instruction. Thank you. Uh, just one last, more, one last question for you. Uh, are, are you seeing that this model um, will be utilized by the other school divisions that are surrounding us, Loudoun, Arlington, et cetera. What's been the conversation from your um, counterparts um, regarding their guidance to schools in terms of this model? I haven't shared it with um, the um, other Northern Virginia um, to help health directors simply because this is, this is um, you know, relatively new um, um, and, um, recognizing that I was coming here today. Um, Michelle had asked whether I could come. Initially, I couldn't because I have um, a family obligation. But when I saw this tool, um, I said, actually, um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, um, you know, just, you know, um, share it to see what kind of feedback we get before we work on it. Um, you know, time, time is of the essence. And I didn't want us to, you know, work on it and then be and then presented in January, and if there were concerns, um, have more de delay in you know, working out the kink or whatever. Um, so, it, but, thank you. But as I said, there's nothing new here. This is everything we've seen um, uh, from CDC, from VDH, everything we've talked about in the past. It's just that now it's more tangible and um, you know allows for people to. Um, wrap their heads around what it is that we are doing and how decisions could be made. Thank you. I know there'll be many more questions in the, along these lines, so I'm going to move on to another set of questions um, to staff regarding the safety teams. Um, thank you for that information. I would love to hear what data to date can be shared, because I know that we've had these discussions um, several weeks ago, and I know there's been some training what data has been compiled to date regarding those audits? Mr. Plattenberg, can you talk a little bit about the safety teams and the data being collected uh, in the last yeah. couple of months? Yeah, I can, Dr. Brayman. I'm sorry, I was trying to share my video and I'm having a little bit of a problem doing that. There we go. Well, no, it's not there. Okay, it's working. Yeah, so as I said at the beginning, when we talk about how we stood these up, we've had we've had ongoing teams out there. Actually, they weren't called teams when we first started them. 
But then we've had the teams uh, for over a month that were going out doing different data collection. And the metrics that we set up, um, we've been improving that process because we realized that, you know, as we said earlier, that, you know, when our principals were doing it and our bus drivers and our teachers, we realized that our, our teams that we stood up, we needed to expand them to include more people on the teams so we could provide the adequate coverage. We brought in the uh, Office of Research and Statistics and worked closely with the uh, Department of Student Services to make sure we could collect more data. But to your point, we started um, through the training of the, the latest iteration. We finished that training up last week and began Monday um, collecting the data that we feel is the most, uh, it has the most integrity behind it. We have data that we've collected, uh, I consider it anecdotal data, that we've improved our processes all along where people have identified the need for additional uh, cleaning, sanitization, for additional plexiglass, for masks, for more PPE for staff, et cetera. And that's been going on for quite some time. But the actual data that we're talking about really is um, that I think is the reporting out component has been uh, since Monday. Okay, um, and you don't have that compiled to share right now or any sense of what that data shows? No, I, I don't think that, um, I mean, that certainly could provide what we have in terms of the five that I shared, the different metrics, the five individual metrics. I can tell you that um, we've gotten feedback from our principals about our process and also from um, the reliability of the actual teams that are doing it. Mm -hmm. So I could share, I could follow up with uh, something they could share what we found initially. And then also I could, I think it would be also important to know the data that we shared over the past month um, that that's anecdotal as well. I think the two of the data elements would be good for, for a proper perspective and context, um, but I don't know if that's what you're asking for. I, not quite. I, you know, we're looking on those mitigation strategies as a way to also inspire, inspire confidence. I would just like to have that information. And also, are they scheduled visits or are they just I believe that's your time, surprise Dr. visits? Anderson. Thank you. And, and I'll just add that they are currently scheduled, but we're looking at have, you know, they're informed that we're, they're going to be happening on which days, but they don't say the actual times. However, we are going to implement some, some of the feedback we've gotten, some of the associations and so forth about having um, more surprise uh, visits, if you will, uh, as a part of our process. So it's going to be a combination. Thank right. you, Mr. Fresh. Thank you, Mr. Plattenberg. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Up next, we have Ms. Cohen. Thank you, and thank you, um, Dr. Gloria, for being here today. Um, just a few questions. You know, I'm a big fan of apples to apples, um, especially when it's my kids uh, that we're talking about. So I think all of us on here, um, you know, take this really personally, as you can imagine. Um, I just wanted to ask, in, in New Hampshire, I see that one in five of their school districts is closed. Um, their biggest school district has 14,000 students. And they've been back hybrid since October 26th. And I see they've already had five clusters um, in their very limited school system. So, you know, I'm a little concerned um, when we're looking to that as guidance um, for, for our system. Um, because again, I, 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 believe, I believe in apples to apples. So to that end, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about SRS, since that's a county program, I know that you're a lot more familiar with it um, than probably many members of, of our board, including myself, are. Um, I wanted to ask how many kids are in each classroom in the SRS model? Um, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you um, on that one. I know there are 37 sites and there are about 1,200 students. Um, so I don't know if, if they're evenly distributed, um, but we can assume that they are um, um, evenly distributed and that would make it, I don't know, about 30 or so, um, th you know, th yeah, roughly 30. So about 30. Okay, so about 30 or so kids in a building um, and, and we've had about 33 cases. I'm, I'm wondering, and maybe Dr. Brabrand could better speak to this, how many schools could replicate 30 kids in a building um, to have the success that we keep hearing about SRS with COVID mitigation? 
Yeah, I think your question, Ms. Cohen, I certainly understand what you're saying there. I think um, we can go back, Michelle, you may know for sure. I think it, the, their limit is about 10 in the SRS per classroom. Our capacity, and Mr. Plattenberg could add for elementary, I think goes up to about 15 in a typical elementary. So we, we would be putting in our return to school plan for elementary school, our kids, uh, at about uh, five more kids per classroom. Jeff, is that about right? Yes, sir, it is, Dr. Brabrand. And if you keep in mind, when the SRS program started, uh, in comparison, the, the end value, the number of actual students um, or children versus what we're talking about here, um, the different shape and sizes of some of the classrooms, um, really at the elementary level, you can get around 12 to 15, depending on the vintage or the chassis of the building. Yeah, so, the, so Ms. Cohen, the bottom line is, yeah, our numbers would have to go up for doing return to school by a, probably about five kids, two to five. I, I'd, go, I'd go a little higher, actually, on the five side. And then the difference between 30 kids in a building versus, you know, what would you say is a typical number of kids, even in the hybrid system, in one of our buildings? Well, we have, we have class, again, Jeff, you may be better at this. We have our smallest schools, maybe 400 elementary kids in a school. Our largest have over 1,000. Um, so now it, the model would be 50%, right? It would be a... Uh, hybrid model, so 200 kids to say 500 kids in the building in that hybrid. Uh, again, uh, and it's d different based on the groups, we would be in the earliest grades limiting any mixing between the classes, which is what SRS does. There's no mixing in SRS. They do not move between classes. And in our earliest uh, grades, that's what we did as well. And I know the SRS you know, really focused on on safety. And that's what we're trying to do here as we're standing up our first groups is doing this safety team data and and sharing it and seeing comparing. I mean, you know, it's a it's a it's a healthy competition in the we want to be as safe or safer uh, than uh, SRS and their numbers have been good and we want to match those. Our numbers are low, uh, but even SRS numbers are are slightly lower. Sure. I, I would just argue that if we're talking about 30 kids in a building versus, let's just say, Lake Braddock, that on a on a good day, pre-COVID, ran probably about 5,000 people almost in the building, um, you know, even if we've cut that in half. Um, I would definitely say we're comparing, you know, apples to watermelons. Um, you know, I, I guess that I would ask if SRS has been so successful, I... I know I have many families who would really appreciate full day SAC um, coming back. And so I guess I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering why when we haven't even tried a larger model of that, I'm confused about how we are scaling such a tiny program. It would be a fraction of what we're actually doing, even in one school, if we combined all of these kids together in one school and we're using that, um, I'd, I'd argue that it's a better, um, you know, comparison to what we're looking at. And I guess I would further ask of those kids, you know, how many of those kids are special needs? Um, how many of those kids are high needs? How many of those kids are like our cat food and cat to toileting, can't wear masks sometimes, particularly, um, you know, consistently. You wrap it up, Cohen. Yes. Um, again, I just want to make sure if we're talking about the health and safety of our kids and our staff, I want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. I don't feel like that's what's happening here. Uh, thanks, Ms. Cohen. One quick nugget: our our student uh, our student. Uh, rate with COVID is about the same as SRS. Dr. Boyd was uh, correcting me and our staff rate is, is a little higher. Um, and we would continue to partner with our county colleagues around that uh, information. And uh, we can we can try to get more information on the demographics of those kids. Uh, we really try to target kids and families that had needs for uh, uh, child supervision and support as their uh, families were returning to work. Uh, but thanks for the feedback. Thank you, Dr. Braybrand. Up next, we have Ms. Omish. 
Thanks, and and thanks to you know everything um, folks have put forward, uh, staff and everyone who's worked on this. Uh, you know, just two work sessions or so ago, I was really encouraged by the possibility of what we can do with cohorts and and safely bringing kids. Right now, I'm looking at these slides and having a hard time putting things together in a way that makes sense, and I'm fairly certain it's not because of my lack of understanding. So, to start off, I just want to clarify: Did I hear correctly that since our last work session, we have not received any information from our auditors or we just don't have any information about well, it? No, what I said was in terms of the data, and I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Omesh, uh, what I said was in terms of the data integrity and the level that I thought Dr. Anderson was asking for, um, we, we have retrained and trained as our part, you know, we talked about the continuous improvement process and our teams have been doing uh, an amazing job. We stood them up initially. Um, really, we had custodial folks that were actually reviewing what was going on. We got feedback from our bus driver groups and so on about what was working, what wasn't working. We got feedback from teachers on what was working, what wasn't working. And then we stood up the, um, the teams to go ahead and do it. We developed the metrics that we had, but then we thought it was because this is to inform returning to school and obviously by the questions that are being asked tonight, we brought in the research and statistic folks coupled with the, uh, the Department of Student Services and the Health Department liaisons with the health department to make sure that the integrity of the reporting process and consistency and reliability of the data would be able to be reportable and reported out in such a manner that we felt the community, the public as a whole, and the school board would want. So the data that we have that's coming up to this, when I say that we've been doing this all along, and I refer to Dr. Boyd's comment that we're all in this together, everybody working together has evolved to the point where in addition to us all working together to make sure we have these mitigation strategies, we now have this group that is quasi external that is gonna be collecting this data with the level of integrity that the research and statistics office uh, confirms and will be able to report to rather than say the assistant superintendent for facilities, I, if that makes sense. Yeah, so so we we have them lined up and ready to go, but we haven't we don't have kind of data or information based on anything that they've been able to work on, right? I have three days worth of data that they've worked on on their training because of the inter reliability comment that I provided, but I do have data that I've amassed that I don't think is appreciable. And given where we are now, uh, I call that the anecdotal data that we've been collecting that I can report out to. And I, I intend to provide uh, both. Yeah, no, I appreciate that and, and the candor especially. Um, I mean, given that that's the case, how do we have any assurances to claim that we're following mitigation measures given how much we're relying on that to do any of this successfully? I'd love to hear from staff. And the second piece is really given how much we're relying on these numbers, what assurances we even have that people are reporting uh, or you know, that the numbers we have are accurate uh, since we're relying on self-reports. Yeah, and to your point, Ms. Mesh, that's an excellent question because the reality of what we're talking about here is, you know, I this whole pandemic and this virus, I don't have any assurances about any of this. Um, these are, as you heard uh, the health director speak to, these are what we've been looking at as improvements and enhancements to our process. The, if this was an exact thing, we wouldn't have been having all these conversations and we wouldn't have started virtual and the metrics in the community and everything else, I think, I think because this has been thrust upon us the way it has, everything has been a discovery process. I know that's not a good answer, but it is very real. And that's why we have, um, as I said to you, three days of, I think, more reliable information. But I will tell you, the feedback and the candor of that of our teams going out there um, and the feedback from principals and the feedback from staff has been informing. And so I, I would just suggest that um, we're gonna continue that. We'll have seven days worth of data that I think is reliable and dependable. I'm sorry, what's going on? I apologize. Uh, Ms. Omesh, if I could just add to Mr. Plannenberg, we're gonna share later. There's only one school district in, in the country we found doing what we're doing with a quasi external team, gathering the mitigation strategies, reporting it public, Chicago City Public Schools. So we know the level of scrutiny. This is Fairfax. People are watching. This is an important piece. 
but not just the strategies, which Jeff said we've been doing for weeks, but we formalized it, standardized it, created inner rate of reliability. But it's also what Michelle shared on slide nine. What's our own FCPS by the numbers for COVID? What are our cases? What's the percentage? 3% of our staff and students have presented with COVID. And then of that 3%, you can see actual transmission in schools is down less than, you know, it's tens of a percent. So the strategies is a way to check how well you're seeing real-time feedback in schools. And then you check the numbers, right? And, and you, you really look at both of those to go, the strategy feedback is good and the numbers stay low. And, and that's, um, that's part of what we're trying to bring together here is we're making our decision-making about return to school. I saw that Dr. Ivy wanted to say something. Yes, I was actually going to, to say exactly what Dr. Braybrand just shared, that while yes, we're determining how we're going to um, actually measure and use those mitigation data, the cases tell a story in themselves you know, as especially with the number of cases that we've had um, in our, our uh, schools and, then, and, and if um, they have spread or not. So uh, uh, that's an important story that tells us um, about mitigation, how staff and students are following that. Yeah, thanks. Dr. Raybrand, you mentioned slide nine. I wasn't going to get to it just yet, but I did find that slide a little bit misleading. So I wanted to, I mean, given that we don't have this data to rely on, we're looking at what we have here. It's representative of a wide time amount of time, right? And we know that with this virus, it's it's surging at certain points and not at others. Um, so do we have this information for the past two weeks? Is that what we're relying on? Uh, because when I was mentioning, by the way, earlier, the point of having this data, I wasn't even asking so much for it to be posted somewhere for our own internal use to be able to rely on it in making these decisions. Um, so I'll, uh, I'd love to hear an answer to that question. Sure. Well, first of all, and I know you know this already, we don't want to be misleading about the data at all. I mean, that's not our intent, of course. And, and, and Dr. Boyd, I imagine we could go back and start to cut this data by every couple of weeks. I mean, you want to know what's the last two weeks of this data represent, right? Um, we can go back and look, Dr. Boyd, did you want to make a comment about that? We'd have to go back and, and see whether we can just divvy out the data in, in one week or two week increments. Absolutely. So, so the data on slide nine is through December 7th. And so we can certainly go back and say, if we want to look at a particular uh, moment in time. So what was our data like once we exceeded 10%, what was our data like, um, or a certain number of cases. So we can do it that way too. Um, and we, we wanted to make sure we gave you as, as current data as possible, but also with making sure it was disaggregated and we were able to make it available. Um, but we'll certainly do that because again, we wanna make sure that everyone is informed. This is a collaborative process. We wanna make sure that we're clear, you know, we're all parents, whether you're, you know, biologically or not, we all care about our children and we care about our staff that have really, really, I can't say enough how much the staff have been doing um, and really supporting our kids. So. Yeah, we'll and, sure we yeah, and Abrar, what I think you're looking for is a frequency chart by by time. As you, if if you had on the bottom axis over time, what's the frequency? Is it a trend of COVID cases going up? And I would say it's likely, as Dr. Gloria said, as there's more COVID transmission in the community, there'll be more people that present in the school with COVID. So I imagine it has gone up some. Uh, it is also still very low. Uh, as a factor of the total number of kids and students, uh, students and staff in our schools. But we'll, we'll work on breaking it down by time. And I certainly will uh, make sure our folks follow up to do that. Yeah. And again, you know, it's one thing for the public, but another thing for us, I mean, we're, we're making big decisions that we need to be looking at this information for. Um, the, the other piece, Dr. Adoyensu, uh, I know that, you know, when we talk about transmission, you shared something about, there's this distinguishing of the community transmission and, and in the building transmission. Can you clarify? I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, right now we're at about 12,000 bodies. We're going to end up with nearly 200,000 by the end of this. Um, I'm imagining community transmission isn't going to be separated, but you're the expert, so please. Thank you for that question. So, um, the mitigation measures 
that we are stressing for schools are the same mitigation, community mitigation measures that we speak about for individuals in their own homes and so on and so forth. Um, the, what constitutes an exposure is having, uh, of, of, of being within six feet of someone for a prolonged, for more than 15 minutes. Uh, we know that um, in schools, we try to make that work, even in the work setting. Um, we, as we do our investigations, we find many times that the exposures that happen in the workplace is not between a client who came for government business and the government employee, but rather two friends, two colleagues who um, over lunch break relax and um, are talking over lunch or whatever and um, are not within uh, and, are, and are violating the six feet social distancing. They're not wearing their masks. Um, so the um, the uh, the 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 uh, measures that we are stating for inside buildings should still be adhered to when we are in our home setting, because we come we we live in our home setting in our community and we come to FCPS. Every case that comes into FCPS is going to be from someone who is associated with FCPS. And so if we are as, um, uh, what do you call it, careful to consistently and correctly do the mitigation measures that we are striving to do in school, if we practice that at home, in our home setting, then our likelihood of becoming exposed and infected in the community setting decreases, and that then decreases the likelihood of 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 people coming into the uh, school to do that. I mean, with um, with COVID and then and then the, the transmission or caring. So they're really two separate things. Community transmission does not have to result in in school transmission. I, I'm not I, the adults as well. Is what you're saying? That's that's correct. If you are following the mitigation strategy, so. Why is it that um, you know um, many times a, a pay, somebody comes into work and we are not able to um, establish um, that any exposures has has happened? It's because they can't identify anyone whom they've been within six feet of. That is critical. That is critical. So if even that one measure, if FCPS looks at ways to really limit the likelihood that two individuals are going to come within six feet of each other. And that's what the spacing of the desks, desks are about. That's what the one-way traffic through the hallways are about. That's what the capacity, uh, maximum capa the new maximum capacity in, in you know, um, conference rooms or whatever are about. That is to ensure that six feet distancing is always adhered to. Um, and then the next thing is the, the facial covering to make sure that you're always wearing your face covering, um, especially if you're going to be um, in a situation where you might come in contact with someone. So for example, at the health department, um, if I can use this as an example, uh, we've had, we've been fully operational um, since COVID, obviously, because we are uh, responsible for the um, response. Um, since COVID started, we have actually added to our numbers. Um, and we're still in the same building. And, you know, let me knock on wood here, but um, we have not had, we have not had um, transmission within our, um, within our main here that, that I'm speaking from right now. Every, every conference room is marked in terms of capacity. And even when you go in there, if it, even if the door says five, you just can't, five people can't sit anywhere. There are five X's on the tables that you're supposed to sit at. On the floors, there are markings. I mean, on, this, on the elevator, there are signs. There's, there's just every day 
we get a, an email from the deputy director for operations reminding us if you're, um, you know, stay home when you're sick, make sure you're wearing your face coverings and so on and so forth. When I'm in my office alone, I don't always wear my face covering. But the minute somebody comes in, I put it on. When I'm leaving my office, just even to go to the um, Xerox, I get I, I, I put on the face covering. And this practice is practiced by everyone. So we it's when you adhere to, and those two um, 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 mitigation ma measures are key, key in transmission. We are seeing a decrease in um, severity of illness um, in this country, and it is being attributable, attributed partly to the face coverings. We now know that face coverings um, um, not only um, protects um, the, you know, before we, you, we used to um, say that you should wear your face covering to protect others. Now we know that it protects you, the wearer, as well. And so it protects you, and if you, as well as the uh, people that you are in, in, in contact with, and this is, why, this is how it, it, it works. When you if, you, if you were to be infected, and typically without a face covering, you would, um, through your droplets, have X amount of viral particles that um, is transmitted to someone else. When you have your face covering on, you, the individual who is sick and has viral particles, even if you are um, um, expelling virus, it is decreased because the covering, the face covering cuts back on how much virus you can actually um, shed out. And then for the other person who is going to be receiving your droplets, because they are wearing face coverings as well, also they receive less virus. And because you, you decrease the inoculum that, um, or the amount of virus that a person receives through the use of face covering, um, the severity of illness is less. And that's why we're seeing um, you know, less um, severe illness, less um, hospitalizations and so on and so forth, um, even though we are seeing an increased number in cases. So we're seeing lots more cases, not as high increase in hospitalizations and not as high increase in deaths. And that's being attributable to the um, face covering. So these measures work, they are important. And um, it's not because, you know, success is not only because you have, obviously the less number of people you have in a building, um, the um, less, um, um, you know, um, risk in terms of transmission because you're able to spread out more and so on. But if FCPS um, 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 plans reopening based on the six foot social distancing, that will um, enable FCPS to determine the maximum number of people that the build that can that the building can um, hold, and then you put mechanisms in place to ensure that the six foot social distancing it adhere is adhered to at all times. Markings on the floor, markings on tables, whatever it is, cohorting and changing practices to make ensure that that six foot distancing is maintained at all times. That's why I use the term a culture. It has become part of, um, typically, you know, I, I, uh, I have a little um, um, area in my office where, you know, people can come and we, we have meetings and so on. Since COVID, not more than one or two people are in my office at a time. And even when they come, the chairs are separated. People don't sit the same way that we used to sit. The minute I see somebody at my door, I, tell, I put on my, my mask. The same thing happens when I go into somebody's office. It has become part of our culture. Um, and that's what, and it takes time. So I don't want, it takes time, but with determination and also with lessons learned, that's why this group, that's this team that's gonna go out to um, you know look at practices and so on, they should come back and share and not only make changes for that particular school, but if they think that these practices need, it's probably happening system-wide, then system-wide changes have to be implemented just based on one um, um, incident at, uh, um, at a particular school. Yeah, 
Um, Ms. Trotten, were you going to say something? Okay. Um, no, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm trying to identify what we're trying to think is exceptional about schools that's different than the outside and how things get transmitted, right? Because what you're sharing still happens in the building, whether there's implementation success or failure, wearing masks, right? I mean, and, and distancing. Um, so but I appreciate that clarification. I did want to go on a related note to the slide that you shared with us. Uh, when you talk about, and I'm out of time, but I will uh, mention this in my go back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Up next, we have Ms. Tolan. Yes, thank you. Um, I was going to start with Dr. Gloria. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, for um, standing up and assisting us with testing for um, people associated with FCPS um, concerns and cases. I wanted to ask a little bit more about, um, you know, how that that will work? Are there multiple locations across the county? How available is it? And then um, I had a question, and this is maybe a combination of um, people that might answer, as far as documentation, if we have people that need to be tested, um, what kind of documentation you know, will they get from the county? And will that be sufficient to then, um, you know, if they've got a negative test, for example, um, you know, to allow them to come back into the schools? I just, you know, if we've got an issue where someone needs to be out of the school, what kind of documentation do they need to come back in? And, um, you know, how will that work? I heard a story, for example, that, um, you know, people needed a doctor's note. And of course, we have a number of families that don't have relations as with physicians. So I'm hoping that perhaps with this testing program, county documentation um, of the test results will be sufficient. So a couple of questions, a little bit more about the testing and then the documentation. Thank you for that. So um, yes, when a person um, gets tested through our lab, they do get a lab re report. So that should be sufficient to um, show that, um, you know, to show what the results of the test was. Um, how this, how it works is that we, um, the um, the school PHN is the conduit for requesting the um, testing, um, and so once that is um, when that request comes through, they're one of many uh, several sites. I think we have five sites where um, an individual could go and get um, their test from, and then typically within a day, um, they will have the results available. Great, thank you. Um, and so I don't want to take a lot of time, but maybe that's something I'll follow up with staff on is um, I, you know, how we handle that documentation. Um, speaking of testing, um, I've just been you know, reading about other school districts and how they're opening and what they're doing. And um, New York City it has been in the news a lot recently with their quick turnaround and uh, resumption of classes. And they have a mandatory random testing uh, weekly um, going on in their schools. And um, they're testing up to 20% of the population within any particular school within a month, both students and staff, uh, using community partners. So um, Dr. Gloria, as an additional mitigation measure, do you how important do you think that might be? I mean, they're using it both to, you know, keep their spread low um, by, I guess, finding asymptomatic carriers and um, helping them to also then monitor and determine exactly what the spread rate is in their schools. So um, the, I think we have to look at just the different circumstances. So I don't think, um, so we, for example, um, um, because of our lab, we're the only um, health district in, um, uh, Virginia that has a lab. And so we have uh, full control of um, the turnaround times. And as I said, we've worked to increase capacity. Um, um, we are now at around 750, um, going on to 1,000. That's where we hope to be um, um, in the next uh, couple of weeks as our, our, our um, expansion um, 
um, process um, con continues. So we do have the testing, um, um, we do have the lab. Um, first of all, both CDC and BDH do not recommend testing of K through 12 students um, um, through as a, you know, as a surveillance um, method. Um, New York City is doing it, some schools are doing it, but um, we don't think it is necessary because we have a process in place that quickly identifies um, individuals who might be ill and um, separate them and um, and then um, those individuals could get testing through our, our, our program if they don't have um, any other means of doing so. Um, and then we have um, the contact investigation. We have um, good um, um, response um, times um, that we're able to identify individuals who um, may have been, who, who are part of a contact, um, who are part of a contact investigation and are able to ask them to, you know, get them to clean and separate them from the rest of the school and so on. So at this time, that's not, that's not where we're going. Um, it also leads to a false sense of security. You can get tested today and be negative and think that everything is fine only to get ill, uh, to become, um, you know, start shedding virus two days from now and then, um, and then spread disease if you're not maintaining those mitigation strategies. I think that those routine testing actually create that false sense of security. We saw that, I, I think that's what happened with, um, with the White House where every day, everybody entering the White House gets tested, but you see what happened when just one person um, came through that, I don't know what happened, whether the test missed um, them or they became symptomatic after or whatever. I mean, they became, um, they, they started shedding virus after, I don't know, but it can lead to severe consequences. So let's stick to the five mitigation strategies and try to, um, implement them consistently and correctly together with the home assessment of our kids before they come to school. If our kids are sick, they should not be, they, they should not be coming to school. Um, and then um, I think together with all of those measures that schools can be um, as safe as we possibly can make it for um, instruction. Thank you. Um, one of the other things I wanted to follow up on, I know um, based on the, you know, 300 some, you know, cases that we've had in the schools, we have all different kinds of scenarios. Um, you know, it's a student, it's uh, a parent, it's, um, you know, someone at home and the child is still coming to school, you know, all these different scenarios. And, um, you know, our administrators in the, in the schools are then asked to, you know, based upon whatever that scenario is, figure out, you know, what to do, who to call, what are the next steps. And I do want to thank, um, you know, Dr. Boyd today. She very kindly sent me um, all of the various, you know, pictures. And um, so if I can just finish quickly and maybe ask our principal on the spot as to how, um, how you feel about being able to react to those various situations. Um, Ms. Tolan, our principals will be joining us in the second part of the conversation. Oh, okay. Well, I will ask that question. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Keith Kamara. And before we continue, um, uh, uh, Dr. Adway and Sue, I just wanted you to know that there's, you may have heard a weird buzzer sound that sounded ethereal. Um, we, board members here are timed for three minutes and then our presenters are not kept to the same time, but they're reminded of the same time so that we can keep the conversation on track. So I just wanted you to know that that's what you're hearing. I appreciate it. Ms. Keith Gamara. Thank you. And I um, want to get a few clarifications and pick up on some of the comments of my colleagues. Um, uh, Dr. Gloria, you mentioned that the slide stated earlier, we had a 3% positivity rate in FTPS, but it was 5% or above with staff. And it also stated that of the 300 and uh, I believe it was 345 of the 384 um, cases, uh, the transmission was not uh, in our schools. I'm a little 
unclear as to how we're recording um, cases that's somehow unrelated to our schools. And I, I ask that because I think the community may be somewhat confused as well. You're absolutely correct. And that is the uh, the challenge of, of just collecting data, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, and I understand everybody's interested in how many cases, but really what FCPS should be concerned about is how many cases have occurred in, FEF, in, in um, FCPS that was a result of school transmission. That's what you guys should, that's what FCPS should be focusing on because the cases that are coming from the community into schools has nothing to do with you all. It's just that somebody probably spent Thanksgiving last week with a, some family members and one of them was ill. Or somebody went to a bar or, or whatever. And, and got infected that way. It has nothing to do with FCPS. What FCPS should be concerned about is um, the example that I gave with the SRS program where there's been one individual that has been um, infected in the as a result of being in the SRS program. It happened on site. And then you use that opportunity to say, what happened? Was the six foot um, social distancing adhered to or was it violated? with people wearing their um, face coverings. What what does the cleaning issue look like? That's how you make the decisions. But right now there's just so much noise with all these people that you are uh, that FCPS is collecting and it has it's not going to help you do anything um in 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 correcting what deficiencies may exist in the school system as it relates to those five mitigation uh, measures. So I, I understand, I, and I think for the community looking in, some of the things that we're talking about is a distinction without a difference. If there are people within the schools who are infected, then parents and staff members see that as a potential exposure to harm, irrespective of how it came about. Um, and so I'd like to talk about that in two ways. Uh, one Ms. Tolan started in on testing. And while I have heard the um, recommendation that that is not the way to go, I think from the standpoint of understanding, well, yes, so many things can happen and look at the White House, which I'm not sure is the best example um, because we have mitigation here, but we don't have mitigation in other parts of the, oh, we may have it, but it may not be as effective in other parts of our county. I think we, I'd like to look at those from two different ways. I, first of all, believe that what we're talking about is a lack of confidence that people will be protected in our schools. And so if testing, random testing, helps to improve that confidence and helps people to believe that we have a structure in place that protects them, then I would argue it may be a worthwhile measure uh, to implement. And I would also argue that this problem shouldn't belong just to FCPS or the county, but we should be looking at all of these strategies across our state and perhaps uh, advocating in that way. So, you know, I think I'm not gonna argue with your scientific knowledge. I'm, you certainly, this is your arena. But I do believe that we have a crisis of confidence. And I think that perhaps we need to look at testing from that perspective. Did you have any comments? Yeah, um, Dr. Arwin, too, if you'd like to respond to that. So I was just gonna say that I, I think that the, given a false sense of security is actually worse than, um, than the um, issue that you have, uh, as you have just dis dis as you have described, because complacency is so prevalent. I mean, we do look. We did better. We did. We we, we were more compliant um, immediately after the lockdown. And as time has gone on, people are getting tired. That's part of the rise in cases that we're seeing. Um, and so, 
every day when you get tested or periodically and you sort of quote unquote pass psychologically, you, you are not going to be as strict about adhering to the uh, measures as you would. And that's what I used. That's why I used the White House example, because every day people get tested before they get into the building. And so they are relaxed. Whereas, and, and that's why we are afraid of our uh, clients that we, the people who come into our businesses to talk to us, we are afraid of them more than we are afraid of our colleagues because we are comfortable with our colleagues. And psychologically, we relax with our colleagues. But when we see someone who um, the, if a new customer, we quickly want to wear our mask. We want to stay away. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'd like to go back. I, I'd like to go back and I'd say that even though the White House tests, they still don't wear masks. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Keys Kamara. Before we continue, I deprived Ms. Tolan of the end of her speaking time because I said the principals were not here until the second half. I was mistaken. So Ms. Tolan, if you'd like to ask your question really quickly, I'll give you back the time that I took from you. I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Um, so my question for the principals was around, um, I know we have, um, and I, again, thank Dr. Boyd for sending me all this information today, you know, flowcharts um, for administrators and people in our buildings to follow if there is, a, you know, a, a person with symptoms, um, a situation where perhaps, um, you know, a caregiver of a child has tested positive and the child is at school, you know, there are all these different variations. Um, behind that, those 350 you know, cases that we've had. I just wanted to hear from um, principals, even though we have all these flowcharts, how comfortable you know, are people in knowing you know, when we have a situation, you know, what do we do and you know, do we have things in place? Because um, I just feel it's very important that in a situation like that, we need to be able to react quickly and, and, to, and efficiently. Thank you. Go ahead, Principal Litz. Good evening. Um, I would say overall, we find the flow charts to be helpful. Um, each situation is unique and different. Um, and uh, sometimes it can be uh, a little bit confusing uh, to figure out um, you know, the intricacies of each particular case. That said, as principals, we know who it is that we need to call or contact if we have questions uh, with regard to um, the intricacies of each case. I had a case today. Um, I submitted it as I'm supposed to submit it. I got a call from the health department in 15 minutes. Um, so I feel assured in that regard that the health department is doing the best they can um, to respond to us as quickly as possible. Um, but it's not an easy process, I would say, um, just uh, because each case is different. Um, but as principals, I would say we very much appreciate the flow charts because it has given us uh, a good place to start. And uh, we do have plenty of resources to, um, to contact folks if we have questions about a specific uh, case. Thank you. Mr. Bestekis, I see your hand up. Uh, I would just offer much of the same uh, in that we do have many, many intricacies when it comes to dealing with these things, um, incredible different situations as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. But the FCPS officials and, and the health department officials have been incredibly responsive. Um, I, I've dealt with it personally and, and have just very quick guidance and certainly the flow charts have been very helpful. I think the, the big point of contention though is obviously what happens when we scale up, right? And so that's why when we do it, we just wanna make sure it's done in a really, um, you know, uh, well thought out staggered approach to help manage the implications and the time to uh, that administrators spend dealing with it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Tolan. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. <laughs> All right, up next we have Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you, um, and thank you everybody for being here tonight. It's greatly appreciated. Um, 
Dr. Gloria, one of the things you mentioned was about the importance of having a baseline of um, how for all of our buildings and that you, so one of the questions I have is how you've worked with FCPS to establish that baseline to make sure that in each one of our buildings before we introduce students and before we introduce more students that we've gone through and made sure that we have all of those measures in place um, similar to what you described in um, in the health department with X's on the floor for spacing, for ensuring that um, directional signs are that students only go one direction in a hallway um, and that the training is done, as well as we talked about the what we last month called audit um, teams, which we're now calling safety teams. And I'm wondering about the makeup of those safety teams and whether or not um, we actually also have teachers and um, community members on those. And then I have more questions, but let's start with that. Thank you. So the role of the health department is to provide FCPS with guidance and then FCPS makes it happen. So we have not, um, you know, our, our role um, hasn't been to, um, you know, do these inspections, we're, we're happy to provide guidance. And I believe that um, XPS has reached out to us to um, to our liaisons to do walkthroughs and, and to give an example of how um, these decisions can be made. Um, but at the end of the day, the for the 196 um, school buildings, um, we are leaving that to FCPS to, to actually make that happen. So principals, how are you making it happen on in each building? If I could, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Jeff, can you talk about the composition of the teams and then the principals can share the specifics about what they do in the building when the teams aren't there? So Dr. Brybrand, it's a two-part question. I think the teams are part of it, but before we have students coming in initially, how do we make sure the baseline's done in each building before those kids come in? Like how have we been doing? Yes. I also see Principal Goodlow has her hand up. And Mr. Litz. I did not see it. I apologize. I stepped away for a moment, so I missed the question. Go ahead, Ms. Corbett Sanders, if you want to repeat it. I'm just worried I'm eating up my own time on this one. How do I'll we give ensure, you, I'll give you 10 seconds back. <laughs> how do we ensure that the baseline is in place before we invite students into the building? So the six feet social distancing, the signage so that kids are only going one direction in the hallways, you know, basically making sure everything's in place first, then we bring kids in. And then we have the safety teams going in and making sure that we adhere to it. That's what I understand is our process. So kind of walk me through how we make sure we are fully compliant. So I had a safety team in my building yesterday. Um, they were very thoughtful about the suggestions that they made uh, with regard to signage, specifically in my case. Uh, my administrators have been going to every single room and physically setting up every single room uh, with six foot social distancing between desks. So the teachers don't have to worry about that specifically in terms of are my desks at six feet. Um, I personally plan on walking the building with my entire admin team and my building supervisor to ensure that we have everything in place that we need prior to kids coming in. Um, and then once kids are in, I imagine that the safety teams will continue to come and visit us and we'll work uh, collaboratively to make sure that we're doing everything that we need to do from a safety uh, standpoint. And if I may, Ms. Corbett Sanders, um, this is Amy Goodlow. Um, just to echo what Mr. Litz is saying, I had a visit um, last week on the very first day that the audit teams were working on inter relier uh, Innovator reliability and had a wonderful chat with those, you know, they're retired administrators, they're retired facilities people, they know what schools 
um, should look like. They know um, the expectations of our current health conditions, and they can converse with us as administrators to advise us. Um, I also had a, a visit today um, where you mentioned teachers. Um, my Cat B students were in the building today. Um, they were observing our teachers and our paraprofessionals working with the students and making sure we were following all of the social distancing procedures and that students were masked. Our, we're preparing the buildings now. That's that's what we're doing. I mean, we're in buildings, but your administrators are in buildings right now doing this work, being ready for kids. So that's part of the audit team's work and our supervisory responsibilities right now is to ensure our buildings are ready and compliant. So in, in my mind, we're establishing a baseline with small groups of students and staff in the building at this moment with these teams doing the audits weekly and then we're working forward to scale it up so uh, just i just want to echo what mr litt said you know our our job is right now to set those classrooms and meet all of the standards so we're well prepared ahead of larger groups coming back yeah miss corbettan i would just add that we've been practicing for quite a while now so we have all of our ppe and equipment we've uh, have plenty of it and uh, everyone has been great about making sure that schools are well equipped so we've been in there practicing uh, for a long time and, and certainly anticipating i would say is the right word anticipating all of the issues and, and concerns that might come up and different scenarios that we've been dealing with along the way has certainly helped us uh, prepare as well so uh, i think that's been a long time coming we're in good place as far as that goes thank you so um with dr gloria still here i do want to talk to ask about um, what lessons learned we can find from page 26, um, the slide that was submitted today that outlines um, how uh, schools have come back uh, into uh, buildings across the country. And I'd like you to um, perhaps give us a little bit of a better understanding of what we can learn from, um, I believe it's Palm Beach County. Um, yes where they have had significant numbers of students, um, almost twice the number of students as um, teachers having COVID. And I think that's the fear people have. So if you could walk us through what we learned from that. Ms. Corbett Sanders, oh, uh, my apologies. Go ahead, Dr. Adiosa. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so I'm, I don't know the specific about um, Palm Beach um, County, um, but what I do know about transmission in buildings is that from many contact investigations that we've had, it's mainly because of the violation of the six foot social distancing. So for some reason, people are not able to maintain the six foot social distancing that's what makes them a contact to begin with. Um, and then in some circumstances, um, some of the other issues um, like the cleaning um, and so on could be a factor, but the, the, the biggest factor is the inability to adhere to the six feet. So is that why when you get to page 26, I, the tw page 22 is where Palm Beach was listed. On page 26, you see that there is a risk factor with the hybrid in three different cat uh, columns is that purely because the mitigation factors are or are not being adhered to i do not know and i'm sorry i um i don't have the slides in front of me that was a slide from i believe um was that dr boyd's um slide she's referring to the decision making um matrix the transitioning between instruction method i believe the colorful slide dr gloria Okay. Thank you. That is colorful. <laughs> so this this slide here is not specific to any one school um, situation, but to help us um, dial up or down. So if we have, and, and this is especially helpful for situations when schools are not um, in, 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 in session to begin with, to help you in your opening. And then when you're opened, it helps with the um, moving back and forth, which is why I said for the hybrid um, 
uh, the, the, the sections marked hybrid, it's a little nuanced. If, for example, if you look at the very top, uh, where the substantial um, level of transmission is high and the level of school impact is low. If you have, if a school has been doing well um, in the in the moderate phase, and now the um, the um, data shows that we are at substantial, there's no reason for the schools to dial back to hybrid when everything has been going great. There's been, I'm, I'm making it up now, there's been 40 cases that have showed up at the door and none of them have resulted in a transmission within the school. The schools don't have to do anything in terms of um, you know, dialing back to hybrid in that circumstance. But if a school was starting for the first time um, 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 and uh, looking at in-person um, instruction and how and what level um, um, of that should occur, then they could start with the hybrid. So your assessment is the community um, transmission has the highest impact on decision making on bringing stu more students into the building versus on making decisions about dialing back. Is that your, is that how you would describe your recommendation? No, it is both. So the um, the level of school impact has embedded within it the second um, table on the previous slide, which talks about transmission within the school setting. That also talks about the, the staff um, cap, um, availability and so on. All of those have gone into that one um, box of you know, either low, medium, or high. Thank you. Um, up Could next, you put me on to go back, Mr. Frisch, please? Um, as we said at the beginning of this, Dr. Uh, Gloria and, and folks are only available for so long, um, and we won't have time for go backs with Dr. Gloria, although you will have another opportunity for three minutes of questions and speaking time after the second portion of the presentation. Um, Ms. Pekarski. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gloria. Um, this is very helpful and informative. I appreciate you being um, here tonight. Um, would you agree with um, what the WHO has put out that um, when uh, the risk of outbreaks uh, rise, are, rise when um, community transmission is high and that there's a strong link between outbreaks within schools and local transmission? Um, numbers, uh, regardless of uh, the mitigation strategies, that at the end of the day, there is a correlation between those two? So I wouldn't say regardless of the mitigation strategies. I think we get away with um, not following it consistently when only a few people are showing up. So I think um, when more people show up with it, it tests the system. Um, because now there are more, there's more opportunity for spread. Thank you. And I think, you know, going back to what Ms. Keys Gamara said about that confidence, and when we put so much emphasis on the mitigation strategies, you know, while I follow them very well, people in your office follow them well, very well, you know, anybody who has been in a classroom knows that it is not going to be a hundred percent all of the time. So as we see that community spread, you know, number rise and knowing that our mitigation strategies, no matter how hard we try, will never be a hundred percent in schools. I think there is that um, confidence gap with our staff. And, um, you know, I just, I just think that is where we are, and that's certainly what we're hearing. Um, and anyway, I would like to um, also ask, we do currently have classrooms and students um, that do not follow mitigation strategies because they cannot. We have mask ex exemptions, we have um, social distancing that isn't maintained, and this number in the community is rising. Can you 
uh, talk about that at all and talk about the risk and if we should continue to allow that. Sorry, I got distracted for a second. Can you please repeat no your worries. question? I just said we currently have students in our schools who do not follow social distancing um, because of their needs who have mask exemptions. So these um, mitigation strategies aren't being met. And we know that now, you know, COVID is, is rising. We have the surge. Can you talk to that a little bit? Should we be allowing mask exemption? Should we be allowing kids who cannot follow these mitigation strategies in school currently with our, our climate in the community? So, so I think that obviously um, in these circumstances, um, things are going to be more challenging, especially if it is not already in session. Whatever is going on right now that is working just needs to be continued. So uh, it is my understanding that for example, for um, special um, um, uh, for, for for the um, kids who um, uh, um, who cannot wear um, masks and may be prone to um, you know spitting and so on, that the teachers do have um, a way to deal with that by wearing a face shield um, and or a mask, um, and that protects the teacher from, from, from the exposures. Um, obviously, these are times where we just have to do more of what we've been doing already. I'd like to, and I completely understand the concerns that people have because we haven't done this enough. Um, I'd like to um, uh, like, you know, use an analogy. So we've all been in airplanes and we've seen the flight attendants in the worst turbulence. They're still standing, they're still serving. Why? Because right from the beginning of the flight, they've been up. So when there was just little bumps here and there, they've, they've learned to position themselves properly. They are, they're walking with their feet a little bit, their gait is a little bit um, wide and everything. And so when we get to the worst turbulence, they're kind of ready for it. If you and I, who've been sitting the whole 14 hours, decided to stand up during the midst, in the midst of, these, of this turbulence, we wouldn't even make it past even just even lifting ourselves up. It's very difficult. And so that's how it, it will feel right now if uh, for a school system that has not ramped up to the level um, uh, of, um, you know, that you know that that hasn't run to a level that has a lot of people in the school um, doing in person. It it is it is a challenge because you don't have that confidence, but it is doable, um, and it just takes more effort. So going back to the airline thing, you and I can get up, but it's going to be we we have to be more careful about how we stand up. We're going to need a little propping by by holding. Um, the chair that we're sitting on with both hands and so on, and eventually get ourselves out. And when we get out, we um, balance ourselves and make that trip to the bathroom or wherever we need to go to. But we just need to build confidence, but it's doable. Sure, understood. We, we have to build that confidence. I think that's for sure. I do want to ask about lunch. Our kids are going to have to eat lunch. They're going to be taking off their masks. Um, you know, our older kids will be in very large numbers in cafeterias. Um, uh, does that worry you? What is your guidance? Uh, what can we do to mitigate those risks when they're going to be for a prolonged uh, amount of time, no mask wearing? So that's a good, uh, good question because we've seen that um, in restaurants and so on, we do have um, transmission that occurs because when you are eating, you can't wear your mask and you tend to speak loudly when you're eating um, and, and so on. Um, so again, this is uh, an instance where um, schools have, are gonna have to put some parameters around that. Maybe instead of six feet, they widen the gap a little bit more um, um, between where um, students sit. And um, unfortunately, uh, we can't, I mean, nothing that we're doing this year is what we are accustomed to. Um, so there has to be some rules around 
um, eating at lunchtime, maybe not so much talking. Um, you do what you have to do when you move um, to the classroom after that. It is a balance. We, we can't eat our cake and still have it. Um, so we just have to put in rules that might look strange, but this is a strange year. And um, right. So sorry, didn't mean to interrupt you. Yes, it's the amount of risk we're willing to take um, for the benefit of having kids in school. Just one last question. Um, when vaccinations start, and I don't know what that looks like, and you know, hopefully our teachers will be at the front of that line. Um, will public health nurses be part of that, um, you know, vaccination process? Of having in schools and our access to them. So I didn't hear the rest of your question, but quickly. We do have um, a plan in place to just to distribute vaccines to our um, population. Um, right now, we are looking at phase one A, um, which is, is um, the um, long-term care facility um, residents and healthcare workers. That vaccine is going directly to the healthcare facilities to do that. One B is where um, um, essential workers will be. Um, um, pro will be able to get vaccines. At this time, the CDC's um, Advisory Committee on Immunization has not defined um, this priority group yet, but if it looks, um, teachers are likely to be included in that phase 1B. Again, uh, we're not sure. Um, but if that is the case, um, vaccines will be administered um, through the health department. Private healthcare providers will also be receiving um, 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 vaccines. National pharmacy chains will also be um, receiving vaccines. So there'll be a variety of ways in which people um, will get vaccine. Ms. Pekarski, if you want to repeat the last part of your question about whether the public health nurses will be included. Yeah, that was my question. Will public health nurses um, be utilized for that effort and, and taken away from schools in any way? No. Um, school, the commitment we have to with schools stays. We have MRC, we have a whole um, plan in place to be able to do mass vac vaccinations without interrupting school work. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, Thank you, Dr. Gore. All right. Uh, up next, we have Ms. Dernett Koufax. I'm sorry, Ms. McLaughlin. Sorry about that. That's okay. Did Ms. Darren Kofax want to go ahead of me? I'm fine. I'll follow you, Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. <laughs> go okay. ahead, Ms. McLaughlin. I apologize. Go ahead. That's all right. It'll be point counterpoint. Um, so first of all, I'd like to uh, just follow up on some questions with Dr. Gloria and then make some comments. Um, Dr. Gloria, in terms of uh, the SRS uh, program, who right now, to your understanding, would make any decisions related to closures um, if there were a cluster outbreak in an SRS site? Would it be the county executive? Would it be you? Would it be a deputy county executive? What's your understanding of who's making those decisions? So like everything, it will be in consultation, in collaboration with the health department. Same thing with FCPS. Um, so we would look at the extent of um, transmission and would say, you know, I we think that maybe we need to close down to get a better handle of what's going on, um, the cases are too expensive and so on and so forth. So it is, it is a collaborative, which is why the CDC document really um, states though that uh, contact tracing and collaboration with local health department, it's always a collaborative decision. Okay, thank you. I really want to focus in on something that um, uh, in the beginning you really emphasized, and that had to do with uh, the ability for school systems locally at the state level, nationally and globally, who have been and continue to educate their children in the midst of this pandemic. And as you noted, it all comes down to uh, that fidelity of mitigation strategies. And so I, I, I can't emphasize that enough because when I think about how our families here in Fairfax County moved here, located here, along with our teachers, many of whom are also FCPS parents, because we're a premier school system, 
uh, it's been concerning to me that we can look all over the globe and see uh, school divisions handling this opening in a pandemic, and yet we really haven't uh, gotten out of the gate here in Fairfax. So again, not to put you too much on the spot, but Dr. Fleury, I really felt that I was hearing from you um, a similar belief that with the SRS program and all uh, what we have seen to date, that FCPS has the uh, ability and um, capacity to tackle this challenge and begin to return in-person learning um, while we hopefully start to see cases come down after um, the, the holidays and that we also uh, start to see the vaccine coming in. Could you comment on that? I'm just, I'm, I feel like I'm hearing um, sort of a mindset that maybe we won't return until we've, we've started the, the vaccinations of our essential workers and, and absolutely hope that we'll be including our teachers. Um, I'd just like to get your thoughts as a public health expert on this. Thank you. Um, so again, it's all about risk benefit. Um, I, I think that uh, for those of us in public health, we've always known that the social um, and economic impact of a pandemic could be quite devastating. Um, many times we think of the morbidity and the mortality, which is also um, totally devastating. I truly believe that, um, you know, if we, uh, I, number one, I believe that FCPS is capable of, 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 of um, uh, mastering um, the five key mitigation strategies. Again, it's gonna take time for it to become part of the culture, people to get comfortable with it, and then quite honestly, become second nature. Um, I used our example of our health department, what's happening now, because the way we are interacting now, I don't think we've been thinking about it. It's just second nature. That's just how our new lives are. Um, and then it is, and then you become successful because when you really are able to follow these, these measures, Transmit the risk of transmission is low. And so you don't see cases. You see people coming into the door with the uh, with COVID, but then the investigators do the investigation. There are no contacts. And guess what? No one else gets sick. And then you, the next thing happens and so on and so forth. So I, I think I think that, um, you know, XCPS, we've started small. Um, we're making, you know, we, we had plans to, um, you all had plans to um, to scale up, um, and I just want to encourage you that as your teams begin to look at mitigation and see that there is good um, compliance, and and even though there are a few you know um, issues to be worked on, as they are worked on, that you all would gain the confidence to take one step ahead of the other. It's it's just baby steps, you know, SRS. We talk about it all the time. They weren't as confident like this in the beginning. They also had um, hesitation. The staff was concerned and so on. They now have had so much success. It's the success that they've had from, from Fairfax and then now until now that they're able to move forward um, with such confidence. So, so Dr. Gloria, when we come back from the, the holidays, uh, I think that would be an appropriate time that uh, you working in consultation with FCPS leadership would then assess where we are with um, the, the, both the mitigation training and practices along with where we are with the community um, uh, COVID levels. Uh, but as you noted, um, there, and we're hearing this from medical experts and uh, child experts that um, being able to run this job is gonna be so, so critical. Um, re while we continue to hopefully see an end to the pandemic um, through the, the vaccines. Would you agree? Yes. Thank you. I know my time's up, Dr. Frisch. Went fast, or Mr. Frisch. Thank you for the promotion. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, I had myself muted. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Dernick Kofax. Imagine that, Mr. Frisch. Um, 
Dr. Gloria, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I have several questions that I will ask so I can get them in in a timely fashion and then one comment and I can repeat them if you want to. Um, I am hearing concerns and I want to know your opinion about our, you know, our, our mostly severely would call them our category B students. Um, these are students that due to disabilities cannot wear a mask and cannot social distance. Our staff, of course, is in full PPE when they wear, when they are teaching these. This is like key center in the area where um, Lee District that I represent. And um, I want to know, even though they're in full PPE, what are your thoughts um, about their safety and what we can do? Um, they, are, they are very concerned, some of these teachers, and one class did have an outbreak uh, there. And uh, we are looking to you for guidance on what we can do to protect our staff there. Um, because these people have, they, they, these, these staff and teachers take care of feeding and restroom issues. That's my first question. Um, my second one is talking about um, making sure um, similar issues when the masks are down and we're going to have to serve lunch in the classrooms, how can we ensure safety because that may be for longer than 15 minutes. So I think that's important. Um, I guess also I have questions about the county. How many cases have we had not in the schools? How have they been contact traced and um, how many days does it usually take to do a full contact trace. And then finally, uh, regarding the testing, um, you know, you, would, you and I have spoken over the summer and my concern about testing and where we are. Um, I did look at the CDC guidance and respectfully, they, they didn't say not to do it. They said to do it in conjunction with the health department, particularly when there's moderate to high community transmission. So again, I guess I'd like to ask you, New York City is doing it, colleges are doing it. Um, New York City feels that that has helped their mitigation strategies. Uh, again, I, I just want you to comment on that one more time because I, 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 I guess I respectfully disagree because I've seen there's been so many cases where it has helped, particularly on the college level. And I know that's not K through 12, but there are K through 12 situations and the CDC doesn't really say it's, it, there's only certain areas where it shouldn't be not recommended. And they're always saying it should be voluntary. So if we could start with the Cat B people, that would be great. <laughs> Sorry. So okay. in terms of the, um, the students with disability and the concerns for, uh, from staff, um, you, did mention, uh, you did mention that there was one um, outbreak um, incident. I'm not familiar with that, but if it goes anything like the other outbreaks we've seen, typically it's not the student bringing it in to the um, staff, but to it, it, it usually is staff members who are ill who then um, end up infecting the uh, students. Um, so um, I, I think that the um, uh, the um, PPE you mentioned about um, that um, the FCPS have provided for the staff, um, they, if used correctly, they 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 are protective, and I would encourage that they continue to do so, um, to use that. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure if that is enough for you, um, if you have additional. Well, uh, well, on that particular one, I, I, I think the, the staff is, is, is concerned. And, um, you know, there, there is, um, there was one class that had to shut down and they're concerned about uh, possible other uh, opportunities. So I, for, for them, they are put in that position and I would, it, it, it's difficult. And as the health official, I think they want assurances from you that this is all we can be doing. And um, if they're in full PPE, because they're with these kids that they love and they are amazing um, with them. So um, I guess that, that that's what they're asking me to ask of you. And then also the data bears out that there hasn't been, there's been more cases throughout, not just here in Fairfax, but throughout the uh, the world where, because this is a concern 
of basically um, all um, educational institutions um, worldwide where um, staff have um, that if there's been transmission in this in the classroom setting, it has come from staff to um, students and more so than from students to staff. And staff, staff um, 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 uh, transmission is also quite common. In fact, the, SRI, uh, the SRS example that I used, the one case where SRS had transmission was between staff. So it's, okay. yeah, I, I, we, we we are we are more concerned and it's just i think it's just human nature i use the example of um people in the in in in, in um, the government in the county being concerned about the clients that are coming for services to date we haven't had a client in fact a um Fairfax county employee but we've had employees infect one another over lunch activities they did after work and so on and so forth. All right. So on the issue, thank you for that. Um, on the issue of contact tracing, um, how long does it take to typically complete um, this? Um, how many cases are we pursuing on average? Or, or are we pursuing? So we are, um, you know, our uh, our Thanksgiving week, our metric was a little low. Um, because we took a, a, a staff took a few days off, um, but in the weeks before Thanksgiving holiday, the proportion of cases that were investigated was between 82 percent and 85 percent, um, and that for the Thanksgiving week, um, 87 percent of contacts were reached, um, and 91 percent were interviewed within uh, one day of being identified. We do have this on our dashboard. Um, we are able to, within two days, are able to reach the majority of uh, people that we are looking for. Um, and when we don't reach them, it's because people aren't answering their phone, um, which is why we put out messaging um, about, you know, encouraging people to answer the phone when we call, um, because we we need them to, um, you know, do our contact investigations um, if effectively. All right, and Mr. Frisch, just so that my last question, okay, if last I can repeat. Yeah. Yep. The, the, the last question um, concerned concern the testing. Um, Dr. Ariensu, um, I, I was just wondering if you would ever reconsider, because I think there are mitigating factors. I think there are people who would feel in this community, I'm hearing from them, they would feel com more comfortable if we had a proactive testing. I understand your reasons that you stated already, but I guess I'm asking you, um, would you reconsider um, if the numbers continue to rise um, as a part of a mitigation strategy? So at this time, it is not part of our, uh, our mitigation strategy and we don't um, intend to um, do um, surveillance testing. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Marin. Yes, hi, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Gloria. Um, can you please, uh, you just mentioned about um, being unable to contact some people through contact tracing. Is there a protocol in place when there might be a, a potential case in an FCPS building? Do you go to that building and talk to the administrator? Please repeat, you mean? Um, I'm, I'm asking if you mentioned that you're not able to reach some people in contract tracing because some people just don't pick up their phone. If there's a potential, if it, someone has a case in an FCPS building, and they haven't been reached out. I mean, are you reaching out to the building administrator to say, hey, I've got to talk to these SCPS staff pronto. Um, and I ask because I've heard of a case where this has happened. So, you know, the FCPS staff wasn't contacted. So what I'm asking is if you're not, if you don't hear from people for FCPS, right, we're different than the general public, is there a protocol in place where if you are reaching out to the FCPS staff, are you also reaching out to the administrator of the building to say, hey, we're going to be contacting your staff. We haven't heard from them. You know, get us in touch, please. 
So we use our, um, uh, what do you call it, our um, school health aides and, and nurses um, to help us connect with FCPS. Um, so I'll, I'll be interested to find out a little bit more about, about that individual um, mm -hmm. uh, example that you used because it is, it's worked very well. Um, we're very responsive and we connect. Okay. Um, so I don't know what happened okay. in that case. Sure, thank you. Yeah, that'd be great to follow up with that. We can get that um, to you. So let me just please check my understanding. So you're saying that with the five mitigation strategies in place, we can, as a, as a division, keep ourselves safe you know, per school. And you've cited the success that you've seen in your health agency and building up that, you know, comfort like the flight attendants. But then you also said, well, you have seen exchanges, it's employee to employee. So what I'm trying to reconcile is like, I want, I really want to accept your, your guidance that says, hey, we can be safe to do it. You guys just haven't experienced it yet enough to get it. But it feels to me, it sounds like you're talking about our schools as if they're this closed environment where the kids, once they leave, they're interacting with other adults and other people that then they get exposed and they come in. So is that my understanding? What you're saying is you're, I don't know if you're recommending if that's the right word, but you would say that FCPS should, um, put go forward, bring kids back as planned with a hybrid model, keep the five mitigation strategies. And you're saying that data is showing that it's not expected that transmission would ensue. Is that correct? It, it is not automatic. Transmission will ensue. Transmission will ensue if those five mitigation strategies are not, um, um, are not adhered to consistently and correctly and I believe a previous slide that was shown um, maybe in your previous meeting um, CDC has again five categories lowest risk of transmission in schools yeah, but, and, well, excuse me Dr. Boyle, but what I don't understand is it sounds like you're telling us that as long as everyone stays in this bubble of a building it's okay but what about the fact that all these people go back to their homes and you know I, I love your high aspiration that people all do these mitigation strategies but it doesn't happen i'm glad your staff is, is on it but not everyone is is up to par and it's not it's just human nature so you know even if all of our staff and students were they could go out and be exposed to someone who isn't so i get that to me brings me right back to the risk aversion and to date this board has not felt comfortable as a whole saying, it seems to me that we're willing to risk one life. So, and I asked you this question yesterday. So I'm just trying to again, confirm, trying to confirm my understanding. You can, but you can finish your, your thought. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I, I don't know. Would you rather I, follow I, up directly? Excuse me? Would you rather follow, follow well, up with I, that? I think this is a critical thing. I mean, if that's her recommendation, we need to be clear that that's what she's saying. What I'm saying is that those mitigation measures, those the guidance, is, it's to be used everywhere. That's what we should be doing in our private lives and in our, um, in our professional lives. However, in our private lives, there's nobody to really police what we do in our private lives. But in the FCPS setting, in FCPS schools, people who are within the four walls of an FCPS building, these mitigation strategies can be, uh, they can be protocols put in place to ensure that they are adhered to as best as possibly can. And so the teams that go around and will do spot checks on whatever, will be bringing to attention of FCPS um, leadership, which areas of the mitigation strategies are not being adhered to so that correction can be made. Yeah, and I heard my bell for my time, but can you I ask? Did. That was um, your, I gave you the, the latitude there, Ms. Mary. Yeah, I'm just wondering if Dr. Glory, you've been to one of our schools that has been doing um, in-person learning since September. No, I have not. All right, thank you, Ms. Marin. Um, up next, 
we have Miss Sizemore Heiser. Oh, wait. Yeah, that's right. Miss Sizemore Heiser. Thank you. And I, right, go ahead. It's okay. And thank you. And I appreciate the line of questioning from all my colleagues. A lot of my questions have been answered. Dr. Dr. Glare, I really appreciate your time and your patience in answering all these questions. I do have a couple. One, I want to confirm following up on what Ms. Marin said when she said um, that, you know, we can't control what happens outside of FCPS and students are getting together. If I'm understanding what you're presenting to us today, you're saying that, you know, community transmission is one piece. The other piece are the mitigation strategies in our building. And if our mitigation strategies are good, it can, it, community transmission is not as important of a factor. What about if our mitigation strategies are good, and I know that's an if, can that also help overcome the fact that we don't know what people are doing outside of the school? Because if I'm understanding, you're saying even if someone's coming in with COVID, if we have good mitigation factors, it doesn't matter as much because our mitigation factors are good. I'm trying to understand that piece. So I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm talking about the risk of transmission. Hopefully, these mitigation um, factors, these are actions of people. So hopefully, when you've learned to wash your hands in FCPS, hopefully you're washing your hands at home and everywhere else. If you're learning to social distance in FCPS um, building, you're socially, you're, you're socially distancing at home and so on as well, um, because it's a, you're right. The, the the individuals in the FCPS in the FCPS community are also um, members of a of a larger community, um, and we all have to um, adhere to these um, mitigation um, measures. I mean, we, public health preaches it all the time, not just for FCPS employees or students, but for the community at large. Um, so what we're saying is that. You know, if it's not working in the community, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have to work in, in FCPS buildings because there's more control of ensuring six feet social distancing. There's more control of when kids are eating, of creating space between them. There's more control of the face masking and all that stuff is what it is that I'm saying. So I guess to Ms. Marin's point that it's not as, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter, but it's not as relevant maybe that, you know, they may not follow these. Obviously we want them to follow these all the time because we have the controls in the building. Like we, we, I, we shouldn't. You that's shouldn't not, run, you shouldn't that's not the message I'm conveying. Yeah, okay. Um, no, that is not the message I'm conveying. Outside, you should be doing that. But no, I apologize. But, what I meant is that it shouldn't impact school decision-making as much. Not that it shouldn't matter. Obviously everyone should to follow these everywhere, but in terms of school decision making, if we have the right mitigation measures, should we have remote school because we're afraid people may not be following them outside, even though people absolutely should? I guess that's what I'm trying to ask. Oh, okay. I think what I'm saying is that the decision should be made based on experience. If um, the community transmission is resulting in multiple clusters, then of course, that is saying that something is not working and that should result in either scaling down. Uh, if you had, um, if you are um, already in a hybrid, then it means that you're gonna go to virtual only. And if you are in person, you're going to go down to hybrid and so on and so forth. So that should, that that is a decision, a tool to, to help in the scaling up or down because it is not a fait accompli that because transmission is high, that it's going to impact schools. But right now, the way, um, uh, up until now, the way the decision-making has been done, it's just based on the level of community transmission. Um, and I think when you do that, you shortchange FCPS um, students because um, if you use other countries and other um, school systems that are still operating, um, yes, they, they, these cases are happening, there could be um, a cluster here or there, but it's not system wide. And it doesn't mean that um, the, the whole the entire student body is impacted um, because of what might be happening in a school or two. Okay, thank you. I have two other questions. One, um, if I could ask both of them, so I make sure I get them in. Um, one question is, 
you mentioned earlier the risk to children of remote learning. If you could elaborate on what that risk is when we have this risk benefit analysis. And, and the second question, I apologize for throwing them both at you, is in our previous discussions, we talked about a cohort model and the safety of the cohorts. And there's concerns about some of our teachers, like specialists, that are kind of breaking those bubbles. Can you talk about the importance of a cohort model in terms of some of these mitigation measures in schools? So the beauty of cohorting is that when something happens, only a small group of people are impacted, as opposed to if there's been a lot of mixing, then there's potential. It doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to happen, but there is potential that more people might might be impacted. And um, and so then um, either, either it impacts the ability um, to conduct classes just because the, the, the numbers aren't there, uh, either be it the, the, from the student end or the, or the teacher end, um, or disease is so widespread because people have been all over the place that it's hard for uh, the contact investigation to um, clearly delineate exactly what happened, uh, in which case a recommendation uh, would be made to maybe close down um, until we can sort things out. Um, so this goes back to the, it depends um, um, that I, I used to talk about. It's the contact investigation um, and the repercussions from exposure and transmission is less if um, you have the cohorting uh, because then it, it only might impact a small group of individuals as opposed to the larger class or school. Thank you. And then the other question was about the risk benefit. We're talking about you. You mentioned the risk of children to, of remote learning. If you could elaborate on that, that would be great. I'm sorry. Please, please. risk of students to of remote learning. You had mentioned earlier, I believe, and I apologize if I'm misquoting you, that there was a risk to children of remote learning that we've been seeing. If you could just elaborate, that would be helpful. Hmm. I don't remember saying that a risk. Not a risk of COVID, but just in general risk to, I, I, and I apologize, maybe I misheard you, that there was a risk to, to students of remote learning that we've seen this year. I, I seem to recall that, but if no. I misheard you, then that's, I apologize. No, but so the, 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 the risk to students, um, I, I don't recall saying that, but if, if I did, um, the risk to students of remote learning is just the risk to, of being in the community. That's, um, that's that is the same level of of risk because we are in the community and people um, kids who are doing remote learning are not coming to the school building so whatever risk they have is just the risk of living in the community and um, if they are um, I don't mean the risk uh, of COVID I apologize I just mean the risk in general but that's okay I, there was a yeah. statement that made during Dr Anderson's testimony she just reminded me about the risk in general okay so thank you thank you for your time I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess I will pass the invisible gavel <laughs> to my colleague, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser at this point, so I can take my turn. I got you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Odwain Sue. Um, I believe Dr. Braybrand informed the board that we've had 13 clusters in five weeks, in the last five weeks. Is that right, Dr. Braybrand? And if so, what is your view of that, Dr. Adway and Sue? So it, I think 13 clusters, if it's in 13 sites, is um, a different story than 13 clusters in one site. So, uh, and I'm glad you're asking this question because I may have not made myself clear when I showed that second slide um, that talked about uh, clusters. That slide, is in relation to a school facility, one school. So 13 clusters in one school, there's really something wrong. <laughs> sure, right. <laughs> um, but 13 clusters in the FCPS system in different sites is, um, it just says that we need to look at, um, it's, not, it's not unexpected um, because of the transmission, the high transmission that we're having. But if you look at that that chart that I showed you, that table, um, medium 
is considered up to two unrelated clusters. So it would not even make the median mark um, at this point. Thank but you. I, do, I don't think any of those clusters are in the same school. Um, during normal time, the Department of Health conducts more than 3,000 surprise inspections of food estab establishments each year. Why are these inspections a surprise? Because um, I think for, inspe for all inspections, it's good that they don't, that the, uh, you know, who, who, whomever it is that we're inspecting um, is not inspect is not expecting us because we want to see right. how under normal circumstances um, the uh, food establishments operate. Um, we that's what I, I thought you would say. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it's important that because we don't do it often, we don't go often, and we want to make sure that um, the few times that we go, we're able to identify all the um, you know um, issues that need right. to be addressed. Do you think that safety team inspections at our schools should be surprise visits to make sure an assessment of real world compliance is captured at each school? I I believe so, but um, upfront, if if it is announced, I mean these safety um, um, visits should not be just a one time. Um, it should be multiple multiple times throughout the year. So um, in the beginning because it's also part of a learning experience. It's it's not just about a gotcha. And as I said, it shouldn't be an exercise of checking off some list. It is an opportunity to, to teach. Um, that's how our restaurant inspections are done. Uh, we're not so interested. I, I was just saying this um, the other day to um, um, someone um, in the government that, you know, even though public safe, um, health, public health has an enforcement role we're not. We don't. We're not about issuing tickets because. Yeah, right. Because the, the by the time you issue a ticket for public health, so much damage could have been done to other people because these these are issues that are of disease transmission as opposed to if you overspeed and the police you know catches you, it's just you. You haven't created twenty uh, you know accidents in the making. But with disease, um, if you come to our attention. You could have exposed 15 other people, and that is, an, um, you know, um, illnesses that are going to be unfolding over time, which we don't want. So we use every inspection as a teaching moment, um, and so FCPS can do that as well. Scheduled in the beginning, and then unscheduled as time goes on. Let me. Well, um, yeah, I I think that we can use them as a teaching moment regardless, and then it never has to be a gotcha. Move on to my next question. Um, do you know the percent of adults in Fairfax County who have tested positive for COVID-19? Um, I don't so mean this to be a gotcha. I, I can give you my I, basic math and you can tell me if I'm so, wrong. <laughs> so the serologic, ser the, ser the um, ser um, prevalent surveys say that about 8% of Virginians are um, have been infected with COVID in the past. Um, 8%, because 8%. When, I, when I take the population of Virginia and the number of positive infections we've had, I come up with 3.1, and that includes duplicate positives, it includes adults and children, and yes. the same, I get approximately the same number for Fairfax County without filtering out duplicates. That's correct, and that's because and the reason why, um, so as you know, in the beginning, testing was an issue. So only the very severely ill were tested. Um, we do know that, um, uh, um, as some experts estimate, up to 40% of cases are asymptomatic. Um, so- um, but the cases we know about, it's 3.1%. That's correct. Um, according to the data in the presentation, 5.8% of regular staff currently in the buildings have tested positive in just the last five weeks. What conclusions can you draw from that information, knowing that it's likely that the adult population of our schools is contracting positive uh, results um, at twice the percentage of the general population? I don't think you can make that, um, you can draw those conclusions because um, there is a reporting um, 
component of people coming to work and having to report that they're positive. Whereas in the general population, um, that requirement isn't, isn't there. So we talk about asymptomatics, but they- You have asymptomatics also, in both groups though, right? I know, but they're in the general, but they're also pre-symptomatic. So we, even though we say folks were asymptomatic, um, studies have shown that in a, in a quite a significant number of people, depending on when you when you do the test. So when they took the test, they were negative, and then two days later, they they started showing symptoms. Or sometimes when you question hard, uh, you go back and do your um, interviewing of of patients, they'll see that oh okay, well just this mild little um, sniffle that I didn't think much of it. Um, so. Uh, there's some rec recollection bias as well. So I, I would- But isn't uh, it all self-reporting? Somebody gets a symptom in, in the non-FCPS world, it's self-reporting. They go get tested if, if they choose to. Um, and in our world, it's also self-reporting. We're not screening people with tests, as Ms. Derenek Koufax has pointed out. I know, but individuals are supposed to notify the employer about their um, um, you know, if they become positive. So that mm -hmm. information is being collected. Right. And and so it must just be that people within FCPS are twice as likely to be honest about it. I don't know about, I, I, I think, I don't think we, they are the same things really that the, the community. I know they're not the exact because the 3.1% yeah. includes children and double positives and covers the entire length of the virus, but the 5.8% we congested adults one time. I, I'm sorry, I don't have any other um, insight to okay. give. Is it possible for us I to have a conversation um, offline? Oh, absolutely. And think about of it a little bit, because I think I'm not getting you, and I do okay. apologize. I'm happy to. I'll drop you an email, um, okay. and we can set something up. Um, the last question I think Ms. Derenak was getting at earlier was about um, how we have lunches in practice. One of the things, you know, was brought up was cafeterias. We actually have, many of our students would have to have lunch in the classroom. Um, how would you mitigate transcendence of setting inside of a classroom? You're talking about speaking, laughing. Do we just tell people they're not allowed to do either of those things? You mean over lunch? in the classroom, lunch in the classroom. Many of our students would be in that situation. So, yes, yeah, so again, the six feet social distancing has to, be, has to be maintained. In restaurant settings and at home, when we are congregating around the table, we are violating those six feet social distancing um, guidelines. And which is why as we talk and we laugh and, and then if there's alcohol involved, that actually relaxes people more and, <laughs> and so on. Right. That's that's why transmission occurs more so there. But in the classroom setting, and in or in any setting in SCPS, um, the part of the mitigation and stra uh, uh, part of adhering to the mitigation strategies is to ensure that at no time um, is that six foot social distancing um, violated, um, except in ob obviously unique circumstances where. Um, you know, we talked about the special needs kids and so on. But just for the general FCPS um, community, I think that, um, 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 uh, you know, things should be put in place to ensure that the um, six foot social distancing is adhered to all the time. And so if we have classrooms and we do, where six feet is not exactly possible, it's just a where possible scenario, we shouldn't be having students taking their masks off to eat lunch in those classrooms where six feet is not possible? So I would hope that there aren't a lot of um, um, instances where there are less than six feet um, social distancing um, being allowed in FCPS classrooms. Um, by definition, if there's a case, that entire classroom, because they're not meeting the six foot social distancing, will have a lot more um, contacts that mm -hmm. will have quarantined. Um, so, so I wasn't that's aware, we should, I apologize. I wasn't Go aware ahead. that the circumstances where the six feet social distancing was not being adhered to. So that's something that we should definitely look into more closely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
What about buses where, um, oh, my time is up. Uh, Dr. Gloria, I really appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, please, as I, I, I have a family um, 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 engagement, but if there are more questions, um, if you could please send them to me by email, I'll be happy to respond. Dr. Gloria, I just want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your family obligation to be with us tonight. It is very appreciated by myself and, I, and I'm sure by my colleagues. So thank you for your time tonight. Um, we're going to go move on to the second part of our presentation uh, now. Um, Dr. Gloria, if you need to drop off, that is okay. I know my colleagues have many other questions and I appreciate your willingness to answer them via email um, since I know you have to leave. And again, thank you for your time and your patience um, with all of our questions tonight. It is truly appreciated. Um, thank you. So I, if I may say something before I leave, I'm just looking, I'm looking at my text message and I think I made a, a wrong statement about the SRS. Um, I didn't, I didn't know how many, I knew there were 30 sites and that there were 1200 students. So I just did the math and said probably 30 or 40 in each class. Apparently it's six per class. So there are multiple classes within each site. So I wanted to make that correction and I apologize for the, um, wrong information I gave. No, it's okay. You've had a lot of things thrown at you tonight. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Um, and again, thank you for your time. I know my colleagues, um, I'm sure they would want Thank you as well. Um, so right now, what I'd like to do is move on to the second part of our presentation. Our staff, uh, you know, to continue the slides, to talk about staffing our in-person learning and our distance learning. And then we will have a second round of questioning of three minutes each for school board members. And in our second round, our board members are welcome to ask questions on any part of the presentation or anything else that they wish to ask about. The rest of our staff will still be here. So. Um, Having said that, Dr. Brabrand, I wanted to ask, would your staff like a very quick five minute break before we go to the second round? Sure, that'll be great. You want us to come back at what, 9.06? 9.06, I feel, indulge my colleagues. For, we've been going for an hour, for um, two hours now. We'll take a quick five minute break. We'll come back at 9.06 with the rest of the presentation. And then uh, one more round of board questioning. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in five minutes.
For situations uh, with, uh, where teachers with approved ADA accommodations continue to teach remotely, classroom monitors may be hired to support in-person learning. Employment of classroom monitors is critical to standing up in-person instruction. The classroom monitor position posted on October 31st, and we have been actively recruiting and hiring classroom monitors since. To date, approximately 230 classroom monitors have been hired. However, we still have a need for almost 730 additional monitors. We currently have about 550 classroom monitor candidates in our pool. The table on this slide provides a breakdown of the classroom monitors needed to support in-person learning by student group and the progress that we've made towards filling those needs. As you can see, the largest gap exists for group eight. However, it's important to note that our middle and high school principals graciously agreed to allow elementary schools a head start on hiring classroom monitors as their timeline for return uh, preceded that of our secondary schools. Our middle and high school principals began actively interviewing and hiring classroom monitors after the Thanksgiving holiday, which is likely having some impact on the group eight numbers. We are working to implement a number of strategies to close the gap between the classroom monitor needs and hires, a critical step as we return to in-person learning. We're currently exploring the possibility of allowing schools to compensate teachers who serve as classroom monitors during their planning period. Acknowledging that our teachers have expressed concerns about workload, this would not be our primary strategy. Our goal remains to hire classroom monitors to fill the in-person coverage needs. However, in the near term, schools may in a position, be in a position where it's necessary to ask for teacher volunteers to serve as classroom monitors during their self-directed planning. In order to, to facilitate matches between our schools and the 550 classroom monitor applicants in our pool, HR will be hosting a virtual meet and greet. This event will take place tomorrow and will be an opportunity for school-based administrators to meet classroom monitor candidates and efficiently set up follow-up interviews. Additionally, HR continues to collaborate with partner organizations who've been a tremendous help in getting the word out about our need for classroom monitors. Next week, HR will be hosting an information session for potential candidates and an additional meet and greet the week following winter break. We continue to advertise our need for classroom monitors broadly. In addition to ads appearing across our network of job boards, outreach has included an FCPS press release, messages in the FP FCPS employee news, ad campaigns on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, ads on Handshake, which is an online job board used by colleges and universities, and we've targeted colleges and, colleges and universities in the DC metro area, as well as others within the Commonwealth. Uh, direct outreach to students enrolled in George Mason University's College of Education and students at Northern Virginia Community College. Ads in the Fairfax County Connection newspaper and the Washington Post. Ads on LinkedIn. Uh, listserv postings with the Virginia Career Works and Virginia County Skills, Skills Source Center. Additionally, many of our principals and several school board members have helped out by including announcements in their newsletters, and the county government has agreed to help out to get the word out as well. Next slide. The table on this slide represents an updated summary of instructional staff intent and the follow through based upon that intent. Since no the November return to school presentation, we have received resignations from 12 teachers and five classroom instructional support staff. There were no changes to the total leave of absence count. Additionally, we've received new ADA accommodation requests from 101 teachers and 30 classroom instructional support staff. As we continue to receive the ADA requests, our goal is to ensure a timely response that reflects our commitment to our employees' needs. Despite the impact of the pandemic, an analysis of the data indicates that resignation rates are consistent with what we typically see at this time of the year. In summary, we will continue to actively recruit classroom monitors and substitute teachers to ensure coverage for in-person learning. HR will continue to process ADA accommodation requests. 
and will continue to work flexibly with instructional staff on delaying the start for approved leaves of absence in relation to the return of student groups to ensure that they are, we are able to keep our employees engaged with our students for the greatest length of time possible. Many of our discussions thus far have focused on important topics such as ADA requests, leave requests, classroom monitors, and substitutes. However, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our dedicated HR team as they continue to support our FCPS workforce in other ways, including answering almost 22,000 inquiries since August 1st through our portals, emails, and online systems, direct, providing direct support to our principals and program, program managers as they support their staffing communities, and supporting employee wellness through wellness programming such as fitness challenges, getting word out about supports available through our employee assistance program, assisting employees as they navigate COVID-related leave issues, and our continued work with employee recognitions. I will now hand the presentation over to Dr. Sloan Presidio, our Chief Academic Officer. All right, well, thank you very much, Sean, and good evening, everybody. Um, We'd like to share just some preliminary information with you right now um, about student achievement data that we've been able to collect during distance learning so far this year. And I wanted to start out um, by sharing some of the information around uh, middle school and high school student grade data um, from first quarter this school year. And in the chart that you see here, what we're looking at is the distribution of the total number of grades um, in all of our middle school and high school classes and how um, the, that grade distribution compares from first quarter this year uh, to quarter one in the two previous school years. Um, so you can see here that we actually have quite a bit of similarity um, with our first quarter grade distribution this year in um, some areas. For example, um, we continue to see the majority of our grades um, falling into the AB range. So 78% of the total student grades that were recorded uh, this first quarter were A's and B's, um, and that's very similar to uh, the 79% from the prior two years. But what we really want to call your attention to here is the rise in uh, the number and the percentage of F grades, um, up to 7% this first quarter, uh, compared to 4% uh, in the prior two years during first quarter in those school years. And when we take a look at um, a different look, I guess I should say, at that grade distribution, uh, which we're seeing on this chart here, what we're looking at is the percent of students now who earned particular grades. So one of the things that we're really concerned about is this increase in the percent of students who have earned F grades this year in first quarter. So that percentage has uh, increased from 14% to 19% of our students earning at least one F grade in first quarter this school year in our middle schools and high schools. And while we do see an increase um, across student subgroups in terms of students um, where we're seeing an increase in F grades, it's really this last bullet on this slide that I wanna call your attention to because we've seen some really, really large increases in the percent of students earning F grades uh, for our English language learners. Um, and that percentage has increased from 17% to 35% of our English learners earning two or more failing grades. And for um, our special education students, that percentage has increased from 9% to 19% this school year. Um, so we're very concerned about some of the trends that we've seen in student achievement um, as reported by grades this year. But we're really equally concerned by the stories um, that we continue to hear from our students. And we're doing everything really that we can this year to elevate student voice, because we know that the stories that our students are telling us are very, very compelling about the challenges that they're facing um, with virtual learning and everything that they've been struggling with since we closed schools in March. So we continue to hear from our students, and I know board members have heard directly from students, and um, you know, uh, Nathan Anabudo is our uh, a student rep to the school board has done a great job articulating these concerns and championing student voice this year. Um, but his voice just represents the many voices of students that we continue to hear that have concerns about the impact of grades on their academic future. 
um, that continue to feel disconnected from their peers and from their teachers, who continue to be overwhelmed uh, and exhausted uh, participating in virtual learning, and despite all those challenges, continue to be so deeply appreciative of all the things that their teachers are doing to support them, yet they still feel overall that as a school system, we're not doing enough to hear them, to listen to them, and address their needs. So tonight we wanna to share some very specific intentional actions that we'll be taking to support and respond to these student concerns. And the first is around intentional actions to increase student engagement. Second, uh, to implement equitable grading practices across the division in response to uh, distance learning challenges. And then third, actions to reduce student workload and stress. And we've organized some of these um, actions and strategies kind of into two big buckets. And the first are things that we're doing at the division level. And then the second will be things that we're doing at the school level. But to look first at the division level, the first thing that we're working uh, to implement is revised grading policies for the remainder of this school year that would take effect right after winter break and some of the major changes with those grading policies is to adjust the grading scale so that on a 100 point scale the lowest score that a student could earn would be a 50 and this is in accordance with research-based best practices around equitable grading practices uh, we want to increase uh, flexibility for students to submit late work with uh, minimal penalties changing uh, the weighting of assignments so that uh, there's no one particular assignment that would be weighted at more than 20% of a student's total grade, reducing the minimum number of assignments per quarter uh, from nine to six, and then planning uh, is currently underway for flexibility with our final exams, uh, final course marks, so looking at expanding things like flexibility for pass, no pass, or incompletes, for example, and then we're planning right now for enhanced summer term services uh, to support students with effective uh, course completion and credit recovery. At the end of the year, uh, we'll reassess, uh, we'll collect stakeholder feedback and we'll look at our data and we'll make final decisions about grading policies for next school year and beyond. Uh, but we're working to put these policy revisions in place right after the winter break. We're continuing to work with the college board um, and we have a meeting coming up with them um, very soon in a few days to talk about um, what, what we're requesting is flexibility around the amount of curriculum um, and what will be covered on the AP test to reduce workload for students. And we're continuing to work with BDOE around testing flexibility, particularly in those SOL areas that are needed um, for students uh, uh, to meet graduation standards. And then we have a lot of supports that we have in place uh, through our central offices where we can support schools with data analysis and planning effective interventions for students. So when we look at the school level actions, the major thing um, that we're working towards is to have uh, support for each of our schools in developing a student support plan that will outline the strategies that the school is going to use to put into place um, the actions that we described uh, at the division level with respect to a number of core changes. And first is making sure that uh, all of our schools are certainly analyzing their grade data and identifying students who need the additional support. But we're also asking schools to really enhance and elevate student voice and put together listening sessions where uh, administrators and teachers can hear directly from the students uh, the workload concerns that they do have and work together to problem solve through those challenges. We're also uh, putting in place uh, supports and interventions for students who have multiple Ds and Fs, and we would like to, as much as possible, health conditions permitting, begin in-person support and intervention services for students at the secondary level uh, during the month of January. We're also asking our schools through their advisory periods uh, to do one-on-one -on -one check-in conferences with every student um, by the end of second quarter to make sure that we're not missing any students um, that have needs that we could be supporting them with and that we could be addressing. We've also established two uh, catch-up days uh, per quarter where students will have the ability uh, to work with their peers and work with their teachers on assignments and get caught up without having any new work uh, instructed and assigned on those days. 
And then we are asking um, our teachers to reach out and have parent conferences with any student who's failing and to make sure that those conferences um, are in that family's uh, first and native language. And we do have resources and tools uh, to support with the interpretation uh, in, meeting, in those meetings. And then of course, monitoring the division-wide grading policies that we just uh, discussed, as well as uh, working to ensure that class time is used uh, not just for uh, teacher-directed instruction, but also for students to have an opportunity uh, to work on the assignments and the materials and to be able to work with their peers in a virtual environment that we're in right now and to get help from their peers and from their teachers. So we are asking um, that schools work on developing their plan uh, by January 11th so that we can move forward with these school supports uh, for students as soon as possible. And then, as I mentioned, for the English language learners and our special education students, there's some additional actions that we want to put in place uh, because we've seen the disproportionate impact of virtual learning, at least on student grade performance for these two populations. So for our English language learners, in addition uh, to those parent conferences, um, we want to make sure that we're reaching out to families to check and make sure that they have the resources and materials to uh, successfully access virtual learning. We know that we've uh, done a lot of work to distribute technology, hardware, um, and connectivity to students, but we've got to make sure that students really have what they need and what they have is actually working and adequate for them to successfully uh, engage in virtual learning. And we're also working to ensure that we have translated progress reports uh, by the end of second quarter so that families can view uh, their children's grades in their native language. We've also developed professional development for all of our teachers that we want to make sure we complete uh, by the end of second quarter. And that uh, PD focuses on strategies for working effectively with English language learners um, in the classroom. Similarly, in special education, we have a lot of supports in place right now for our Cat B students but we wanna expand um, those supports for our Cat A students as well and make sure that they have the supports uh, to be successful in virtual learning um, and to make sure that they're not only just making academic progress um, through uh, viewing of their grades, but also making sure that they're making progress on their IEP goals. So in addition to the classroom um, teachers working with those students and families, our case managers will continue to check in with students um, every two weeks and we'll conference with families um, where students have additional academic needs as well. And then finally, we do want folks to know that our Office of Research and Strategic Improvement continues to collect data on the effectiveness of the division's distance learning efforts. Um, we've had several opportunities to um, survey stakeholders and collect information from our stakeholders already this year. That work is going to continue um, there's additional surveys planned for the month of December. Um, additional grade analysis will be done this year. And the next um, updated report on distance learning will be delivered to the school board in February. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Brabrand to wrap up uh, this evening's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Presidio, really appreciate that. I wanna to present to the board and the public our draft timeline for returning all grades back to in-person learning in a staggered and a measured way in the months of January and February. This plan is contingent upon health and operational metrics being met and we'll provide the board with an update on this plan on January 5th at our next monthly return to school work session and as needed as we get closer to target dates for the groups. If we go ahead and look at the timeline, which is up here, you can see under our draft plan, all students, including those in groups one through three, will participate virtually for the first week following the winter break. And that will allow us to make a single bell schedule transition beginning on January 12th. We would return groups one through five on January 12th, and then a week later, group six on January 19th. Group seven and eight would be split. And that would allow elementary, middle, and high school students to return in phases. You can see how we'd have a uh, phase in group seven for groups uh, grades three and four, and then a week later for grades five and six. And then with group eight, that same split, you can see we bring those uh, seventh graders back in our middle schools. And again, at Poe, Glasgow, and Holmes, it would be sixth graders back first. 
And in high schools, we bring back our freshmen and our seniors first into the school. Uh, and then we would then bring back the group eight uh, of eighth, 10th and 11th graders a week later. Um, we have an addition, we would have middle and high schools begin to offer orientation sessions for students who are new to the buildings to support their transition into in-person learning. Um, and we would uh, have middle and high schools begin to offer in-person intervention starting on January 11th to small groups of students, particularly those who are struggling uh, from the first quarter data that we've already shared with this board and with our community. Let me go to the revised bell schedules. Um, this would be effective January 12th. We would shift from our current bell schedules to a revised bell schedule that will allow for increased time needed between bus runs as we begin to bring more kids back uh, on our transportation system. We need uh, that additional time uh, in our schedules for cleaning to occur as well to address the reduced capacity on buses due to social distancing requirements. We have fewer kids that are able to ride the buses at the same time, so we have to spread out the times when students are on our buses to be able to transport all of our students who are returning for in-person instruction. I certainly know that the bell schedule change presents challenges to some of our staff and families. However, it is the only way we can return all of our grade levels back to in-person following health and safety guidance. So that is the challenge and that is the, uh, the need for that revised bell schedule. We do wanna give families advance notice of the upcoming changes to help prepare for the time shifts when that new schedule would take place. If we go now to the next slide, our in-person phase in uh, status, uh, this chart does provide a summary of our in-person status and readiness, and it is based on our operational metrics and two of the three core indicators for decision-making, sort of our existing stoplight. Um, the risk for transmission in schools, well, first let me go over the first part of it. The current status, as you know, groups one through three are in-person, and we are following closely our threshold for group three. If the threshold, which is currently being exceeded, it uh, has uh, in the middle of uh, being exceeded, if it gets to seven days, which would be the Saturday, group three would uh, revert to virtual instruction next week. We are sending letters of caution, advance notice that this may happen to our group three families, and we would confirm that information with them on Saturday. Uh, groups four through six, as you know, already are paused uh, based on our current thresholds uh, that we have already shared with you. And those are those two of the three core CDC health metrics. And uh, of course, our groups seven and eight are still in a virtual format. The risk of transmission in schools, that is the draft that Dr. Gloria shared with you. We also expect some updates from the Virginia Department of Health that are doing what we're attempting to do, which is take some of that existing research and data and present it even more clearly, even more concretely, so that our stakeholders in our school system and outside our school system can really understand the matrix for decision-making. And we would uh, be sharing that update with you at our January work session. The FCPS operational metrics for staffing, we are a go for groups one through three, they're already in school, and we're a go for groups four, five, and six, which had been on pause. Uh, and so we are a go for those. For, for groups seven and eight, we do have that as a caution. We need 730 classroom monitors still needed. That is a lot. Um, uh, that is a lot. Again, you heard about the virtual uh, job fair coming up. We have a pool of about 500 already um, that we're looking at, and we're also exploring the tool of allowing teachers um, uh, to get some additional compensation if during their planning period they were to cover as a monitor for another class uh, in a long-term uh, role for, for the rest of the year. Um, and then for our operational and staff uh, school and staff readiness, we are a go for levels two and three. And we do have a caution for group seven and eight for in working to maintain the six foot social distancing, 
with the existing school capacity. We do have um, some schools with challenges and we're working, our RAS are working, all of us are working with our building leaders in those schools for solutions prior to the return of those students. We know and we just heard tonight how important it is to keep that six foot social distancing in place um, and we'll continue uh, to make that our uh, focus as we move forward with return to school. Most importantly though, we are committed to overcoming these challenges and working together and they are, they are significant challenges, but we are working hard uh, to do it and we'll make adjustments as we uh, face the challenges that we have for individual schools uh, and if necessary for the system. But we continue to have a goal to return to school in person and this is our status for those groups. If we can conclude on the last slide with the summary, we have mitigation strategies recommended by the CDC that are in place and we are monitoring them. We've been monitoring them from so, some time anecdotally, and we are now more formally monitoring those division-wide, having those conversations with principals to be sure that mitigation strategies, which really are the linchpin, the key for successful return to school in person are in place. Our final decision-making tool, we've had our interim tool based on two of the three metrics. Our final tool based on all three of the CDC metrics will be shared with the board at our next work session on January 5th around return to school. And uh, given that mitigation strategies, when we implement them consistently and correctly, can reduce the transmission in schools, we are continuing to plan to resume our gradual phase reduction of students in the month of January. It will be, again, contingent on all the metrics involved of uh, our percent positivity, our, our rate of cases per 100,000, and the success of our mitigation strategies. And finally, our student social, emotional, and academic learning supports will be expanded. And we have, we have proposed tonight bold changes in student grading and workload that will help us mitigate the challenges that our students are facing with virtual learning. As I've shared with you many times before, there is no perfect return to school plan. Every school district in the country is working with the school board. Every superintendent is working with the school board and their community to bring forward the best plan possible. Our plan and our focus remains on meeting every child by name and by need. That is a high standard in any time. It is a extraordinarily challenging standard in this time of the pandemic. Uh, but we continue to have faith in Fairfax County Public Schools and our st staff, our teachers and principals and leadership team members. And working with you, I'm confident we will continue to move forward step by step in a measured way, but in a way that we can have students return in person to school during this school year. We're glad to take any questions now and thank you again so much for hanging in there with us for the last three and a half hours. I hope you found the information that we've shared tonight helpful and hopeful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Braybrand. And before we get started with the second round of board member questions, I just wanted to reiterate each board member will have three minutes to ask their questions and staff response will also be, we'll have a bell ring at the three minute mark. And, and I know it is running late, so as best we can be succinct, that will be helpful. But having said that, um, just reminder, board members can ask on anything they like. Dr. Gloria is no longer with us, but if you wanna ask about the first part of the presentation, by all means, go ahead. With that, I'm gonna turn to our first speaker, Ms. Corbett Sanders, followed by Ms. Keith Kamara. Thank you, Ms. Seismer Heiser, and thank you, Dr. Braybrand, Dr. Presidio, and Mr. McDonald for your presentation. I do have a few questions and a statement. First, I agree with you, Dr. Braver, and the critical piece here is the um, implementation of these mitigation strategies. And I would like to better understand how you will ensure that we have a fidelity of implementation of those strategies. And so we can stop there and... Sure, sure, we're, we're gonna bring you the data, as Mr. Plannenberg said, we'll bring you and format the anecdotal data from the last several weeks and then we'll report the more formal data as well at our January uh, work session so that you, the entire board, the community can see uh, that mitigation. And the other nugget from tonight that I heard from board members 
is we'll share, we did FCPS by the numbers, but you all wanna see that through a timeline of how does that look over time? Is it rising as the community transmission is rising? And we'll be glad to do that as well. I'm actually looking for how you're going to hold people accountable if they don't um, fully implement the uh, mitigating factors. Yeah, I'm gonna hold people accountable by working with our RAS to identify schools where the teams go in and there's a consistent issue. We're gonna have that data by school. Um, it's very important, and I think you heard Dr. Gloria say it, we're not here to play uh, a gotcha game with principals. We wanna educate them and create the culture. Uh, and we've been doing that now for several weeks. And you heard some principals earlier tonight talk about it. I think we've got a good culture on it, but we've got to monitor it and we will rectify any schools that are not doing it well. And I'm not saying it's not the, it's the principals or the staff. It's also when students don't adhere to the uh, mitigating measures. Next, if I can just briefly talk about the capacity issues, because as you know, this is something that I raised beginning in last April, May timeframe. Um, the six feet social distancing and the um, current capacity of our buildings, we know that there are going to be um, tens of buildings that are high school and middle school that will not be able to accommodate the 50% return to school. Um, what is the plan uh, and how are you utilizing neighboring facilities? This has been something that we've raised consistently that we have to think out of the box about partnering with the Board of Supervisors as well as looking at capacity and neighboring facilities to be able to do this. Um, and secondly, will there be a prioritization of some students such as the ones that are um, having a higher number of F's and D's or decreasing numbers um, to get them back four days a week or two days a week, whereas others might only be one day a week? Well, a couple of things there. We do have our RAS who are going to work with those schools to do everything we can to get them uh, to overcome their capacity challenges. And we do have Becky Danig here and Fabio Zulaga if they want to share uh, some points. But we are looking at it. Um, if we have to start at a little bit reduced capacity, we will because we want to return kids to school. But we're going to look at all those ideas and including, as you said, the in some cases through the county and our own facilities, opportunities to put kids in additional spaces. Uh, Ms. Bainick? Yes, um, thank you for the question, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Uh, the region assistant superintendents and the executive principals have been working uh, very hard over the last several weeks for with each group uh, to assess the school's readiness. And so our focus most recently has really been on our middle and high schools and assessing their readiness and honing in on that classroom capacity issue that you speak of. So um, we are already, you know, for the, I'll share for the most part, the news is really good. I think that many of us anticipated more challenges than we actually are finding. And a lot of that credit goes to our DSSs and our principals and how they uh, created their schedules. So we're working through that and uh, we're, we're moving sections where we need to, to larger spaces. And most recently, Mr. Plattenberg has also arranged for some teams from the facilities planning office to go out to some of our schools that do have more challenges and provide some more support. So we're actively working on that um, as we speak. I just encourage that we also start having conversations with our community because there has been an expectation that was set and we want to um, at least address any concerns up front rather than having surprises. Um, the next piece is regarding the um, grading. And my question is, why are we starting to change the grading policy right after um, the break rather than waiting until the second semester? Because there are some pretty dramatic changes um, and it could put additional pressure on our teachers. Well, this is a this is a this is a great question. Uh, our kids had a strong a message to us. The data sends a strong message. We've got to do something. We've got to do something different. And I don't want to wait for a semester of grades. Seventh semester for seniors is key. I think we need changes to how we approach grading now. I recognize it's powerful. It's for this year. We'll review the data. But this is an equity moment, and I think we need a bold response to how we've been doing grading. I want you all to know, though, as a board, 
Most of our middle schools have been doing this for years. The biggest split is at high schools. And many of our middle school principals feel the middle school kids go to high school and get a whole different experience about what um, equitable grading looks like. We've debated this for years in Fairfax County Public Schools, and we've left it to principals as we've left many things. Tonight, after weeks of listening, I think it's time to have a division response and that this is the appropriate response. The era of zeros needs to be over in Fairfax County Public Schools. So Dr. Abraham, I would request that you send um, the school board more data on um, this best practice and why, because we are going to get a lot of questions and the timing of it, and we just need to better understand the thought process behind it. We don't, as a school board, really have a role in determining how many, um, how you do your grading. I think that's operational, but I do think that it's something that we be we need to better understand. Yep. Um, the, the next piece is on the, um, the querying our um, families and our students. I would suggest that it's going to be very important to um, do an assessment on the social emotional impact of this extended closure and how we can best support all of our students, not just those that are um, getting Fs or two Fs because um, it is quite the trauma is and the fact of even just dropping from an A to a B or a B A to a C is significant. So I would suggest we need to do that. And last, I hope somebody does bring up the um, early start time for elementary schools because that is problematic. Your time was up. Thank I'm you. Down. I'll let somebody else address the early start. Time. Thank you. Does someone want to respond to the best of Ms. Corbett Sanders said? I didn't really hear a question there. So if there's no response, I'll go ahead and move on to Ms. Keys Gamara. I, I think it's the later start time and the bottom line is we've got to make the switch if we're going to start bringing kids back and, um, you know, Mr. Plannenberg, do you want to add anything to that? Actually, um, Dr. Graber, and I was not going to, I'm letting that to somebody else. The issues that I wanted a commitment on was uh, giving the board more information on the best practices on grading and a commitment to uh, get the survey on um, social emotional impact of the trauma of the extended closure. Yeah, we'll get you that information. Yes, uh, I, yes. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. If I could go on to Ms. Keys Gamara, please. Yes, I'm coming, thank you. Okay, so first I want to thank uh, Dr. Presidio for uh, this extensive look at addressing uh, the concerns of our students who have really been uh, advocating and um, letting us know how difficult this time period has been for them. Um, and so I, I thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I agree with Ms. Corbett Sanders that this will uh, I think require, and I'm not, you probably have already considered this, Dr. Presidio, but certainly additional evidence as to what the best practices are, as well as continuous monitoring. I'm grateful to see uh, the support uh, that you are suggesting. Um, and so I'd like to make sure that we are getting um, as mu much as possible regular reports on how we are doing so that we can collaborate with our students. And I think one of your suggestions was to elevate the student voice. So I'm assuming, Dr. Presidio, that that means uh, we will be getting input from our students during the process. Is, am I assuming correctly? Uh, yes, absolutely. We have some activities already planned as part of um, the updates on distance learning that uh, ORSI will be developing. and. Uh, we've had some opportunities to meet with students, um, interview students, run some focus groups with students already. So uh, we do plan to continue to do that throughout the year. Thank you. I'm also concerned about the difficulty of this transition on our staff members. That may not fall quite as much in your bailiwick, but I'm hoping that some of those conversations will also be happening with our staff um, and getting them supports uh, in terms of the difficulty of transitioning between virtual to in-person, in back to virtual, back to in-person, and making sure you don't lose students in the process. So is that part of your thinking as well? 
Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, that that's a partnership between, you know, central office and our school based leaders to make sure that um, teachers have the support, the time that they need uh, to be able to do the things that we're asking them to do. So, you know, we just need to continue to look at what we can do uh, to support teachers where we can be flexible. You know, the Monday um, time that we've put in place when we return to in person, Mondays will be a full day of planning and preparation time for teachers. So, you know, we think that's incredibly important. That's one way that we can uh, start to address some of those needs that teachers have. But yeah, it's a partnership between um, central office and our school based leaders to support our teachers with this work. Okay, and as I looked at the groups that you mentioned, I didn't necessarily see Title I schools. I know that a lot of those groups are within Title I schools, but I wondered if we are specifically looking at the impact of the virtual learning time period on our Title I schools. Yeah, I'm, I really appreciate you bringing that up because the the impact is on the students in those schools, um, but it's also on teacher workload in those schools. You know, when you do have more students in the classroom um, that are experiencing, you know, some of the challenges of virtual learning, the teachers are having to work even harder there to make sure that those students um, get all the support that they need. So it, it really is an issue of student workload, student challenge, and teacher workload in those schools. So. Um, we do know that, um, again, those, those schools need additional support, um, you know, and when I talk about some of the supports that we have at the central office level for, you know, helping design intervention services, um, working again with the, uh, with the school leaders to do that in those schools, um, we are targeting and spending a lot of time in those schools that do have the highest need. And that, that's a big part of the work that our Department of School Improvement and Support does is really looking at the schools and tiering schools um, and making sure that those schools that have the greatest need are getting the most supports that we can provide at the central office level. Thank you. And one of the categories that to me just uh, through my experience is, I'm sure you're familiar with the ACE test and um, how those students who have experienced trauma have already been, had difficulty and now they're in a different uh, atmosphere uh, where we're transitioning yet again. And so can you tell me how those students who may have already um, fit on that scale, how we are reaching out to them and possibly supporting them during this transition? Well, again, you know, we're looking at not just academic needs, but also the social emotional needs that students have. and. You know, that's a big piece, again, of what we've heard from our students is the feeling of, you know, isolation and disconnectedness and virtual learning. So we have a lot, I think, of students who are really looking forward to being back in school in person, um, which is why we're working so hard to try to figure out all the operations and all the logistical elements necessary uh, to be able to get our students back in school so that they can not just have those academic supports, but have the opportunities um, to have those connections with their peers, um, and with their teachers, additional supports on uh, the social emotional side. And I see it looks like Dr. Brabrand might want to add something. Uh, you know, Dr. Presidio, that's a great response. And I see Deb Scott is with us. And uh, Ms. Scott, would you like to share any additional information around the social emotional supports that we're providing for kids now and that we're looking at as we look at the rest of this school year and beyond? Um, I think one of the key pieces that Fairfax jumped into right away um, as we reopened was the advisory period and the morning meeting. And mm -hmm. Not only encouraging schools, but asking schools and to put that in their schedule. So that gives everybody an opportunity to face through an instructional lens, but also um, giving those students support that they know that those teachers are there and they're able to talk with them. It also gives teachers a wonderful time to assess through conversation, whether they need to pull in um, our clinical staff, our counselors, our social workers, and school psychologists are all pushing into those social emotional learning times um, at every level available for students, available for families like they've always been, but teachers are key to making those connections. Um, so those are some of the things we're doing. We also um, 
asked for purchase a, a wellness screener and through our procurement system on its way in January or February, which is going to help teachers and others again assess the needs in social emotional learning at a level that Fairfax has not done before. So we're very excited about that. Mm -hmm. And so COVID has, COVID is challenging, but COVID has also brought us to a place in social emotional learning where I think we all hoped we'd be and we're well on our way. So those are some of the things we have. We have lists of other things, but I won't take any more time at this moment. No, I really appreciate that. I can say in my experience in, in working with families, what I have discovered is that um, anecdotally, those folks who have had traumatic experiences are already having those um, experiences that they are particularly hard hit during the virtual environment. Um, and it's quite easy to get lost. And so is that wellness? screener uh, comparable to uh, and like an AC evaluation? Um, I don't want to say too much about it because I'm not the school psychologist or school social worker. So um, okay. in discussion with them, yes, it would be on par with trauma-informed practice. Um, it would be on par with uh, the CASEL competencies. So we're looking at it from both those lenses. Thank you, I appreciate Ms. that. Kumar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Keith Gamar. I appreciate that. Um, next, we have Ms. Marin, followed by Dr. Anderson. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to, oh, sorry, I have my, I'm endeared my son's Hanukkah present. Um, <laughs> I am, um, sorry, just give me one second, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so two things, please. Um, about returning students and staff per the plan. So I am shaken by the health director's acknowledgement that she has not been in an FCPS building during this time of COVID to see what staff is trying to stand up. Um, she's not aware of the range of operational challenges through no, no fault of anyone's in particular, but rather through the sheer size of this endeavor um, and that we are dealing with children. And um, she's not walked in our shoes. And so while I want to consider her counsel and the experience of running the health department with the public visiting and employees there, you know, I feel that this experience is unapplicable to FCPS reality. You know, I'm deeply disappointed and I don't really know how to take the information from her because um, it's not informing our situation. Um, second, about the student focus um, in today's presentation, yes, I'm very relieved to see the specific efforts to provide relief to students. Thank you for being responsive their advocacy. I wish we had hold on it sooner, but at least we're doing it. Um, I must say changing the bell schedule will seem to wreak havoc even more than is ready, you know, already done in this tumultuous situation. Um, I, I heard no one say that they want this. Um, and then just to share my thoughts with my colleagues and, and the public and the staff, you know, I, I want to believe that we can implement a plan and, um, you know, reflecting on each presentation and set of plans from month to month, I see today the expansion in the thinking and the responsiveness to the board and the public requests. But what I hear from staff, administrators, teachers, and support staff is that there are still missing details and that the amount of work still remaining to operationalize this, including creating a third master schedule so far this March, is just a huge risk. But when I think about sending staff to, over to the holiday break, knowing that they have to do a ton of work, um, they've been working full full speed ahead since March. You know, I, I'm I'm left. I I just want to let you know that that that's where I'm at. And um, you know, I wanted us to be bold and be strategic and follow our plans. Um, nothing can be perfect, but you know, the health department info did not help bolster my confidence in in what we're trying to do. So, food for thought, and I welcome any feedback from anyone. Thanks. Well, thank you, Ms. Mayor. We'll, we can certainly invite Dr. Gloria to, to come in our schools and come through with our safety teams. I know she's extremely busy, as we all are in the pandemic, doing our jobs. Uh, and uh, her role has always been to support and interpret the health uh, department guidelines and data that we're getting. And I've appreciated very much her role. We do expect some additional support from the Virginia Department of Health around the modeling that she is working on for us to try to make it clear um, that uh, school districts focus on mitigation strategies and how that balances out. So uh, if I have it in January, uh, January 5th, I'll certainly share it. 
And uh, the issue of bell schedule is it really just comes down to if we're trying to return the students to school, we are going to need to do the bell schedule shift. Um, and, you know, in the end, the bell schedule shift has to happen if we're going to return kids to school in a significant fashion. Um, and, 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 and so that's a conversation this board can have. But right now we're prepared to do it on the 12th, anticipating that more kids would come in over second semester. Well, thank you. I just want to say one, one thing, you know, from the outset, I've said that, you know, the governor has told the school boards to handle this and we are trying and the school division is trying. If our county health department can't meet us where we are, that it, it's too much on us. And, you know, we are trying to do all this work and we need the county, you know, we need the board of supervisors. We need the health director to understand we are half more than half of the revenue comes to FCPS. There needs to be that support. I, I just can't understand, fathom doing this public health mitigation without better support. So um, I, I'm yeah. just at a loss. Let me let me let Dr. Boyd, uh, if I could, before I, I know your time is up, but I'd like Dr. Boyd to just respond to that last part. Dr. Boyd. Or yes, thank, yes, thank you so much, and I, I will be brief. I just wanted to share that while Dr. Gloria has, you know, shared that she hasn't been in our schools, we have had very detailed conversations. We share information with her about the, the various dynamics we have, um, the social distancing, the six feet. We've talked in detail about things that happen in some of our unique departments, food services, things like that. Um, as well, we've been able to have opportunities for our staff, our administrators, to collaborate and have discussion with the health department staff about some of our challenges, about how we support students, whether it's in the care rooms or in the clinics or in the classrooms. So we have had very, very detailed discussions and um, both Dr. Gloria and her support staff are aware of our different challenges, but we do communicate that. And actually following our meeting when I, to this evening when I called to thank her, um, she expressed a, a willingness to be able to go out with us and and to be able to stand up some model processes in our schools that can be replicated in our other teams. So I just wanted to share that um, that that piece of insight. Uh, and if a final comment, one thing, Ms. Marin, too, it is a ton of work. I mean, you, you're you're a board member, and many of your colleagues, of course, too, are out listening to our staff and principals. It's a ton of work to return to school in this pandemic. It was at the beginning of the year, and it remains so. Um, and it is just it, all of us, this careful balance of all the factors. And I know it's a heavy burden for the board too, uh, as, as I feel, to try to get it right and to balance all the factors um, as we look at trying to return kids to school. So it's not easy. I'm not going to pretend that it is. Um, and what we want to do, what I am trying to do is present to the board our best thinking, our best planning, uh, and then uh, again, this is for information tonight, but obviously as we look ahead uh, in, in January 5th, um, your guidance about uh, these plans, uh, you know, I certainly uh, respect the feedback and know uh, it is a tremendous amount of work to return. And uh, until we're way out of this pandemic, it will remain challenging whenever we're bringing more kids back in school. Like you said, the flight attendant analogy really stuck with me. There will be some turbulence when we return to school in person. There's just no way around it. It's about when that happens. Uh, and that is a discussion we can certainly continue to have. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Thank Brabrand. Um, we have Dr. Anderson. Ms. Marin, your time was up. Um, we have Dr. Anderson followed by Ms. Cohen. Thank you. I'm just going to rapid fire my questions here. I want to get them all in. Um, some of our constituents want to know when group five returns, will the high school pilots uh, um, that are taking place at Woodson also return? Uh, Mr. Greenfelder, you were doing pilots. Uh, can you share a little bit more on that one? Yes, as soon as we're, any of the groups are allowed to return, we can open pilots back up. The only reason the pilots were put on uh, pause and that was for any new pilots to um, begin or any uh, current pilots to expand was when we paused um, bringing in those groups. So absolutely we can continue and we're looking forward to that actually so we can get as much information because much of the information that we wanted to update the, update the board on with 
you know, metrics and best practices really started to um, get put on pause when we paused those groups. So we were just really starting to get a lot of that. And we are in the process of sharing that. And we have been with principals and we have some things that we shared with the board about how uh, our pilot principals are sharing those best practices with colleagues. And that's gonna be uh, further, continue further in the next few weeks during our uh, principal meetings. So, so Mark, that could be January 12th, as early as January 12th, we could begin to add some uh, pilots back into the mix as they're Absolutely. ready. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, next quick question regarding teachers' leave of absences. Will that window be reopened? How will it be handled for teachers who currently want to take advantage of that at this point? Uh, Mr. McDonald, you want to respond to that one? So the leave of absence window closed on November 11th. Uh, and at this point, there's not a plan to reopen that. Um, so uh, as I mentioned during the course of the presentation, folks that had applied for those leaves of absence, um, if their group uh, has been put on pause, we are delaying the start of that LOA. Okay, thank you. Next question. I realize that you all do not have a crystal ball, but we do have some parents here who have taken their children out of school into out of FCPS and into some private settings and they're looking to return. What assurances can you provide, if any, regarding the 2021 school year, the 21-22 school year? Will we have Will we be a little bit more advanced into our uh, our plan for in-person instruction? I know we hope but I have some friend, some folks here who are looking for a little bit more um, information so that they can make decisions regarding private school admissions at this point. Yeah, wow, that's a that's a million dollar question. Uh, that's a million dollar question. Uh, we stand tonight with the uh, FDA uh, approving. Uh, the first vaccine that will start to be distributed very soon. I am very hopeful. I'm very hopeful that next year uh, will not resemble this year uh, as as in that will not resemble this year. I, I'm hopeful next year will be as near normal as possible. Um, but I read everything you read. I try to study every day the vaccinations. Uh, rollout will be important. Um, getting to herd immunity, which is 60 to 70 percent of the population to take the vaccine. Um, there is some additional work trying to be done on being able to offer the vaccination to young people. Um, I am hopeful that we'll be able to return, but it would be probably honestly premature at this time for me to guarantee it. I've learned a lot in the last nine months. Um, I've had successes and some real challenges and failures uh, to some, and one is over-promising and under-delivering. So I don't wanna promise yet, uh, but I am hopeful that we are getting close to the beginning of the end of this pandemic and its impact on our schools and our society. Um, and uh, I'm very hopeful for next year. All right, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. My next question is regarding the bell swell. We realize that we're in this uh, situation, and um, and Dr. Um, Gloria did say that these are strange times would require some unusual response. I wonder if we could impact the bell schedule by impact by impacting the level the number of students who ride the buses. Is there opportunity there to evaluate how parents want to handle transportation, which may offset the number of students who would require to be on our buses, which may impact the bus schedule? Kind of a domino effect there. So, Mr. Plattenberg, I'm not sure if you're the one to ask this. He's the one to ask. Jeff? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Anderson. Um, Logistically, when we look at the transportation model and the number of students we normally transport of approximately 145,000 a year, it's providing transportation for those that are uh, within the areas beyond the walking zones. So it would have to take a logistical um, 
machination and a huge effort that I can't even conceptualize right now in my head trying to respond to your question to be able to identify exactly the numbers to make it so it would be possible to do so. Uh, we do have Francine Furby on here this evening as well. And um, certainly if the desire is, you know, we, we came up with this exactly as uh, Dr. Braben had mentioned. We had to accommodate the social distancing. And in order to do that, we came up with a number of scenarios, a number of bell schedule scenarios, and all of them were terrible. They were either a matter of uh, having, well, we had some logistical issues with conflict with the civil twilight for the elementary. And that's one of the reasons why the elementary has that split shift that goes into the evening. And um, we looked at having the middle school start at that second shift, if you will, going into the evening. Um, and in order to provide the cleaning of our buses. So to Dr. Brabrand's point, um, if we were to change any of that, we could make adjustments. Or if we could take a look at uh, some way, as you suggest, to identify different ways of different modalities of transportation that could impact our, um, our approach and the routing and the aspects of our transport. I would like to add that as a next step, or maybe I just email it to you, Mr. Plattenberg. I'd like for us to see if there's any possibilities there to help offset the schedule, which is less than ideal. Um, very quickly, the ESOL support um, slide 45, um, is there opportunity for there to, Dr. Presidio, for there to, uh, for the, to look at increasing the number of interventions that's being provided right now to some of our students on Mondays in person, I'm so sorry, for in-person intervention to help offset some of these grading issues? We really don't have um, the ability to do that at this time, you know, Obviously, when the health conditions uh, worsened um, and uh, we paused bringing any new student groups into the schools and obviously returned some student groups uh, home, we're only serving a small number of students in our schools right now um, that uh, that we had identified for those first uh, those first three groups of uh, students receiving services. So, I think once the conditions, the health conditions allow us to bring more students in, we will absolutely do that. Um, that's part of the intervention plan that we have. Um, and we're hoping to, you know, health conditions, you know, permitting, we're hoping to be able to bring more students in for in-person interventions beginning on uh, Monday, January 11th is the timeline that we've established to do that. But we really don't believe that we would be able to do that based on current health conditions between now and then. Thank you. My last question is regarding grading. I, I'm glad to see some of the things that are on the slide from even um, not having zeros be part of the grading or the impact of late work. There's a whole body of research from Marzano to DeFore to Bloom regarding how grading should take place. And I'm glad to see some of those things are making their way into the plans there. Uh, but I'd like to call on Mr. Anabudo to maybe help me answer this question. I want to hear from someone who is not only hearing from other students, but living this experience. How does this match up for what you believe you need as a student? Dr. Anderson, I, I, just to interrupt real quick, I'm, I'm more than happy to let Mr. Anabu to answer, but he will, I've also given him a chance to speak on his own later on, but I'm more than happy to let him answer your question. I just wanted you to know that. Thank you. I would love it if he were to answer my question so he could speak, so he could use this time for whatever he's planned for. If it's okay with staff, I'm gonna let Mr. Anabuda answer that question. That's fine. Hi, everybody. Go ahead, Nathan. Nathan, we can't, go ahead. Can everyone hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, I just, I think that to your, to your question, there are two pieces to the student issue, and I really appreciate the chance to speak to them briefly. The one piece is the workload um, piece, and that's obviously leadership has been trying to address that for quite some time now. Um, it's still very prevalent. Um, the workload concern is it's a piece that's on, it's, that's on its side. 
but the piece that's kind of been touched on tonight in the presentation is the grading piece. And that's sort of the second part of the equation that works in tandem to kind of contribute to this culture of student stress and overwork. Um, and that grading piece is multifaceted and we've touched on some of the things like there's no zero policy that kind of helps to mitigate some of that stress, especially with students um, who are receiving grades on the lower end of the spectrum, like D's and F's. But there's a whole slew of other students who are receiving C's and B's that had never done that before. And that can cause stress to those populations as well. And I think that that piece is a lot of it comes from the assessment side of things. And I think that work in general is, or learning in general is less efficient in a virtual model. Um, as we all know, learning in classroom is obviously the optimal place, but learning in, in the virtual environment is harder and less efficient, but we're being asked to test in the same way at the same level. And for high level college board and IB classes, the tests aren't even from our teachers, they're from the college board but they're put in the grade book in the same way and we're not learning in the same way. And the amount of time and the time and effort that goes into that kind of piece of everything is extremely excessive. And I think that that's a lot of what the students are dealing with on that end of the spectrum who are taking, let's say, high level classes. I think that is a huge piece of what leadership is hearing from students and from me is that there's that whole other world of we have this ideal of what we want to be doing but the pandemic won't let us do it but we're still trying to reach this i guess dream island i don't know if i'm putting it in the best possible terms but essentially there's not really there's no grace i feel like that's being given to students to that recognizes the current climate that we're learning in and as a result there's just an overwhelming amount of stress and the kind of things that i've proposed i know i recently gave them the leadership so i I, I give them all the time that they need to kind of review what things are sent, but re de emphasizing tests, re emphasizing other things in the grade book, shifting weights, you know, eliminating minuses in the grade book, those kinds of things might help. But I appreciate the time to speak to that, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Dr. Presidio, you want to add anything as per Nathan's comments? Well, I mean, Nathan has been a, a great advocate um, and you know, partner in helping us uh, develop plans um, all school year. And um, he's an amazing representative to the school board. You know, I would say on the workload issue, um, you know, we did outline a number of things that we're trying to put in place to address the workload. Um, so again, I talked about really working with our teachers to use our model of instruction that we refer to as the workshop model or the engagement model where students have time to complete work um, in class and get help from their peers in class, as well as their teachers. Um, you know, when we talk to students, we hear that that's one of the, the missing pieces is, you know, when you're in school, if uh, you do need help or you don't understand something, oftentimes you can talk to your friends. You might do that in class, you might do that, you know, during lunch or in the passing periods. And, you know, that's missing right now. So if, if we can have that time in class, that we think will help a lot. We are asking schools again to, you know, have sessions uh, with their students in their schools uh, to listen to students, to hear some of their ideas um, and to be able to work uh, to put some of those ideas in place to reduce workload um, as well as um, really getting the teachers of the advanced classes where we know the workload concerns have been so prevalent uh, to work together with the administrators um, to try to organize strategies again to reduce that workload. So, for example, um, we're asking to consider publishing calendars and agendas um, so that students don't have major assignments due um, in multiple classes at the same time, trying to coordinate, you know, when those major assignments are due to reduce that workload as much as possible. Um, we've also reduced, as uh, Ms. McLaughlin had uh, advocated for, the minimum uh, numbers of assignments that teachers have to put in place from nine to six per quarter. Um, as well as Nathan said, looking at different types of assessments. So really thinking about performance-based assessments where um, students have an opportunity to demonstrate what they know um, in a way to then, uh, if they need to make up work uh, or, or redo part of that assessment, they might not have to redo the whole thing. Um, they might just have to make some tweaks to it or some edits or some adjustments to it in order to be able to raise their grade. Uh, so we're looking at a number of things to reduce workload. 
Um, there's not just one strategy. It's going to be a multi, uh, a multi, multiple approach uh, that we need to take to address this issue. And we want to continue, as I said, to work with our students uh, to hear their ideas and definitely to continue to work with Nathan, who's been uh, an amazing partner. Thank you for that. And also as a bit of a sixth grader, I would be who's in middle school because we're in Mason, I would be remiss if I didn't share. It's not necessarily just the workload that's causing the overwhelm. It's also the number of platforms that are being utilized with seven teachers who do it in seven different ways. The organization alone, the executive functioning piece can be quite um, overwhelming. And this is a kid who has support. So I, I'm seeing it firsthand. Uh, my other question is regarding the governor's order, Dr. Braybrand. Do you see any impact on winter sports? The impact on winter sports that we're hearing about, um, a couple of things. Um, it will still be 25 uh, people um, uh, in indoor sports, spectators. And actually this month, we're not doing spectators in Fairfax. We're not going to add them in until January. For outdoor sports, the governor said two, uh, VHSL, excuse me, said two guests per player. Um, what did come out today because of the governor's universal mask uh, uh, requirement um, is that VHSL has sent out something tonight as we have been meeting that athletes will be asked to wear a mask during, uh, during conditioning, during practicing with the exception I think of, of swimming, uh, cheerleading and uh, one other sport. And again, we'll get you the press release. It just came out about an hour or two ago. The governor also did say that they're encouraging uh, schools to support having the need for no spectators by giving spectators other ways to see the games. And we are doing streaming into our gyms and all of our Fairfax County facilities uh, Mark Greenfelder, you want to add anything else on sports that I may have missed? Uh, no, Dr. Braybrand, I think you covered it all, and Bill Kern is with us as well to answer it. Um, really, the main change is we will be requiring all of our athletes to wear masks during the whole time of their sporting activities. The ori original guidance was that they would not have to wear it when there was extreme physical exertion. Uh, that was based on the World Health Organization and the CDC at the time. Uh, they've reversed course a little bit. Um, the CDC and Virginia Health Department and now say that we should wear that. Wrestling is the other sport uh, where we wouldn't um, do that. And through Dr. Braybrandt's uh, leadership and Bill Kern's done a phenomenal job. We are working on getting the live streaming. Uh, that process is going through, um, you know, the typical Fairfax process of getting approved and all those things. We are trying to fast track it as best as we can. And our goal is to try to get um, that approved and get those cameras um, and that service up and into schools as soon as possible. So we're, we're very hopeful, but that is in process. Thank you for that. I know we have a number of concerned um, constituents regarding the no mastering sports. My last question. Dr. Anderson, um, so let me interrupt you. I think this, um, Dr. Ivy wanted to speak as well, if you're okay letting her answer. I was just going to clarify, um, and, and uh, Mr. Greenfelder, can you, or, or Mr. Curran, I believe when we looked at the live streaming, we looked at it for not only in our gymnasiums, but also in our auditoriums, so that uh, the arts and other activities as we uh, begin to bring those back could also be uh, live streamed. Did we finalize that? I know we were looking at that. Dr. Ivy, you're uh, absolutely correct, and I apologize for omitting that. Let me let uh, Mr. Kern speak a little bit more to that. Good evening. This is Bill. Just um, real quick, the uh, we have had the opportunity uh, through the contract process to talk about the mounting of the cameras within the auditoriums as well um, that would access the live stream service through what is the National Federation's live stream service. So that's an add on those cameras are a little further behind because they're not as well developed, but they will be put in as soon as possible throughout the, the duration as, as we continue to negotiate the final parts of this contract. Thank you so much. And I have one last question, Ms. Eismo Heiser. This is for Dr. Boyd, I believe. When we're discussing slide 13, this is the first half of our presentation. 
where you talked about students who would uh, and who would require more supports for max exemptions. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Because what I'm hearing and I just, just to be clear, is that those students are going to be transitioned to virtual instruction if they're not able to tolerate masks. Is this the plan? Yes, under the um, under this particular slide, as we look at mask exemptions, that we need to assess if we're able to appropriately support um, each student in their environment. Some of our classes um, are able to space students farther than the six feet to provide that additional social distancing. Um, if students have mask exemptions, um, some classes the students are able to remain in their identified spaces, as I think Mr. Plattenberg shared before. Um, if you go into our schools, a number of them have the tape where there's identified space for each student, identified spaces for desk. But some of our students um, are still learning their space and things like that, just, just based on their unique needs. And so we have to assess each of those situations individually. Uh, we certainly want to be supportive of students because, again, these are our most vulnerable students, and that's why they're in school right now. But we also need to make sure that those students, as well as other students and staff, can be safe. Um, and so that's why we're taking the perspective now to do individualized assessments of those needs. Thank you. I think that was the timer. So I'll follow up with you. Um, Thank you, Dr. Anderson. That was your timer. Um, next, we have Ms. Cohen followed by Ms. Omesh. And Ms. Sizemore Heiser, did Nathan want to go ahead of me or is he hanging back? I have not heard back from him, so I let him know that he can pop in. And I know he has school tomorrow if he needs to, but I've not heard back. So I'll let you go ahead and go, and then I'll check back with him. Okay. Um, um, my first question is, I, I, I know that Dr. Gloria referenced the six feet over and over again. So Dr. Brabrandt, I wanted you to talk us through how reasonable is it to expect six feet at all time um, and on the buses, as Mr. Plattenberg mentioned. We're going to be able to do a really good job of six feet in our schools. And again, we have some capacity issues at some schools, and we're going to try to work through those. Uh, our buses, um, you know, and we've been uh, upfront about that from the beginning, um, we're not going to be able to completely have six feet on our buses. We're going to do, uh, again, that's part of the bus cleaning, part of that bus, the elementary bell schedule being changed up so that we really can do extra cleaning and sanitation on the buses. Um, but we are going to have uh, one kid per bus, uh, excuse me, yeah, one kid per bus would be 60 feet, um, one kid per seat, which is a little bit less than uh, six feet. So, but, but like everything, we're going to have to monitor that data and if we begin to see COVID transmission as a result of, of bus routes uh, uh, from that, then we'll, we'll, we'll look at the issue. There are a few districts, even in Virginia right now, doing three feet. And I'm going to be working with Dr. Boyd to pull that data as well for both transportation and for classroom purposes. I don't have it tonight, but I will continue to uh, pull that and look to bring some of that to you all moving forward. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I, Dr. Gloria was like super clear 1 million times about six feet. Yeah, so that, absolutely. yeah, that I, I definitely, I, we'd be going in the wrong direction in my mind if we start talking about reducing that. Um, the next, I just wanted to point out the pie chart. Um, there was a pie chart that showed 3% um, of folks have gotten COVID and then said 97% have not gotten COVID. Um, and that is not accurate, right? I mean, we haven't, if we tested a hundred percent of people, then we could say that, right? Yeah, I, okay. I, okay. Pointing. I just, Pointing. you know, you know, I'm going to give you a hard time. Uh, uh, I, this is just, it's too important. To, no, this is a hard time. This is called the board doing what the board needs to do. I understand. Thank you. That's a good point. Um, the next one is, again, I, it's a broken record here, but elementary school start time. Um, is there any thought given to, are there even opportunities where we could add in like an asynchronous hour so we're meeting our state requirements, but we get kids home earlier or asynchronous hour plus recess or some, is there, that is the number one thing I'm hearing from parents today 
is, um, and staff, honestly, but is the idea of their kids getting off the bus at six o'clock, knowing that they've really been done um, earlier than that, and the online kids too. Is there anything we can do? Uh, we've spent months looking at this, I'll tell you that. I mean, uh, Jeff, if you've got something else up your sleeve, you can share it, and I think it's a next step, but I, I don't know. We've looked at this for, I mean, hours. I've gone gray trying to figure out how to do it and do all the things that we're asked to do with it. But Jeff, if, do you have anything you'd add? Yeah, Dr. Brabrand, just because it was the next step, we'll follow up with any possibilities and all the machinations we looked at. Um, as Dr. Brabrand mentioned, we've we've really struggled over that and um, we'll provide that information for you. I, I, th I think Jeff, and tell me, just because Ms. Cohen likes it just straight up, right? We could, if we only bring limited numbers of kids back, we don't have to change the bell schedule, right? But you, well, can't, bring back, you can't bring back kids at every level in any significant way without having to flip the bell schedule. Is that right, well, that, Jeff? That's a fact, yes, sir. But, but even if we reduce the number of students that ride, we have the AB schedule, so the routes still have to be run. So your, your diminishing effect of being able to appreciably improve the time um, is challenging. But again, we'll provide what we've looked at in the next steps. And in the meantime, if we can come up with anything else, as I said, Ms. Furby's on the phone, she and her team have done an incredible job of looking at this and, and in as many ways as possible. But we'll provide that as part of the next step. Thank you. Thanks. All right, next um, group. Groups one and two would like you to stay for the folks in the back. What are the metrics that lead them to going virtual? We don't have in the thresholds for decision making we currently have, those groups represent uh, our most vulnerable kids. And Dr. Boyd, when she looked at those guidelines, uh, said that those kids could remain in school when the risk is the highest. So, uh, Dr. Boyd, I don't know if you'd add anything to what I've just said. Sure, Just and just to clarify too, so we've referenced the Virginia Phase Guidance for Schools, and in Phase 1 of Virginia's Phase Guidance for Schools, most students are virtual, um, students that can be in-persons or your students with disabilities, again, who have those very unique needs. As we look at groups, um, one and two, two particularly, those are our students that are in two of our most vulnerable groups. There are pre-K students, um, being those young learners that are vulnerable, and additionally, those are our students with disabilities. And so we truly wanted to prioritize those students. And again, it's in alignment with the Virginia Phase Guidance for Schools. Um, but, but just as another piece, we don't want to, we know there's significant concern from our pre-K, our PAC, school, PAC teachers, our EECB teachers, um, that are in, and we know that it's it's a challenging time. You know, we talked about this on yesterday. This is truly the first time where teachers in one room have been in school, and the teacher next door is at home. And we understand that that's that's really challenging to understand and to grapple with. But we truly are concerned about everyone's health and safety. Um, you know, again, we've decreased our numbers because the fewer people in school, the fewer likelihood that we're bringing community from out COVID, excuse me, from outside in. Um, so we understand the challenge, but we are truly, truly monitoring this and we're going to continue to work hard on our mitigation strategies to support all students and staff. Yeah, I, you know, I would say that it definitely, it doesn't, it does not feel that way to staff. Um, you know, what they feel like is they saw multiple times a chart that showed, you know, greater than or equal to 10, over 200. And that is what, you know, they base decisions off of. And then they feel like they're just left out there with groups who are not able to handle mitigation strategies for all kinds of reasons. There is no way in a packed classroom that you can be six feet away from a kid. It just is not possible and can't be the same. And I know I'm driving you nuts with this. I know that I keep hammering on about it, but, but these are critical staff members these are critical kids who, if they get sick, the likelihood that horrible things happen to them is far greater 
than other kids. And so I really am struggling and I know I'm driving you nuts about it, but these kids are worth it and these teachers and staff are worth it. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Does anyone want to respond before I go on to the next speaker? I think it's one of the toughest questions that we have in the pandemic, right? Our neediest kids that need to be in person and the staff to serve them who all have hearts for kids but want to be safe. I think it goes back to Dr. Gloria's comments today uh, about what does that look like in our schools? Can our schools be safer with good mitigation strategies? We've done a pretty good job thus far, but I absolutely understand the burden that's been placed on those, uh, those teachers. I do, and I don't dismiss it. I don't take it lightly. And I don't take lightly the responsibility I have in this job for the thousands of people's lives I'm responsible for. Um, I don't, it, it, it weighs on me a lot. This has been a heavy, heavy burden. Uh, we are trying to follow the best state guidance, too, that said those most vulnerable kids do everything you can to try to keep them in person. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. But I certainly understand that point, And it's not giving me a hard time. It's being an advocate for your community. That's your job. I understand. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Thank you, Dr. Barry Brand. Um, I'm just going to deviate a little bit and let Mr. Onabudo take his turn now since he does have school tomorrow morning and then we'll go back to the order. So we have Mr. Onabudo followed by Ms. Lomesh. Thank you, um, my colleagues, for being patient and letting Mr. Onabudo um, jump in here. Thank you, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. Um, and thank you, everybody else, um, too. I appreciate it. Um, I, there's uh, one thing that I want to bring up first and I'll kind of circle back to what I was given the chance to talk about earlier, another point briefly. But first, I wanted to talk, um, ask a little bit um, of Dr. Braybread and the rest of the leadership team about what, about if there's possibility moving forward to be, when we're framing the talk around returning to the classroom, to be more upfront, particularly with students who may not be tuning in to all of these board um, work sessions in their entirety, to be upfront with about the, um, the draftness of it all. I, I can't, the word is escaping me right now, but I know that everything right now is a draft and it's all tentative. And I feel like students sometimes get zeroed in on the dates that get put out there. They circulate super fast. And then it's kind of traumatic, I guess, when it gets taken away a week before, two weeks before, because they expected this to happen the exact day that it was set on the slideshow. So if we can do a better job of making sure that students are aware of the fact that everything is super tentative and it's subject to change because of COVID, I think that that would be a lot that would go a long way on the part of students. Is that something that we can do? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, the night's presentation <laughs> had drafts and maybe we need to make the font bigger. I mean, this, <laughs> this is the challenge, right? I mean, we, we I have to decide. We have to decide, are we planning to return kids in person this year? We don't have to, but we have to decide if we want to. And if we want to, We've got to start to do plans, which we've been working on since July when I recommended virtual for the start. And I believe that was the right decision operationally and at the time with what I had, and I believed I could execute as superintendent medically as well. Um, and we've been doing the planning and how to plan without raising hopes and then dashing hopes. I don't have the easy answer to that unless we want to plan not to return to school or not to review it until X period of time. And I have not heard that expressed by this board at any point. Uh, it's been about updating monthly on where we are to return to school in person. So I'm going to continue to do that and bring our best thinking. And yes, it is hard to do. We brought some kids back. We were about to bring back more and then um, some of the metrics have spiked. Uh, we brought back several athletes. Uh, actually, they've been here since June. Now they're getting to compete. Um, and so this is the real issue. How not to, you got to make plans to be able to execute them, but how do you manage not giving people's hopes up? So I, Nathan, you got other ideas. Let me know how to do it. We can do a town hall together or, or, or send a message together uh, to kids. Um, what they need to know is they've got someone who's trying their best and who's trying to listen and bring ideas. We've, 
This is the first time ever that we would have no zeros in our school system across the entire division in its history. So it's not um, that we're not listening. It's trying to uh, just manage expectations, and it's hard to do in a pandemic. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that response, Dr. Bregman. I mean, and part of that could also follow me too. I, I vow to do a little bit better with my messaging to other students because I'm not the best social media person. But well, yeah, I, I appreciate well, it. You know, Nathan, one idea might be honestly is to work with Ms. Caldwell and talk about a way that our SAC can send out sort yeah. of school board action plans afterward. You know, we communicate out to a lot of stakeholders, but we may not be being a direct, maybe we need something that directly goes to kids around school board work that uh, they can get. And maybe we can talk about that offline. I think that would be a great idea. We can continue that conversation. I think that would be very much appreciated. And so to kind of um, close out the conversation I was having earlier, um, and I wanted just to take a moment to thank you, Dr. Braybrand and the rest of the leadership staff. I I see, like you said, very responsive stuff to the complaints that I've been raising and the complaints students have been raising to about student workload stress. And I don't know that they will realize this no zero thing. It's very, it is very powerful. I've already had people who've mentioned it to me, like you said, because my school's already had it and I've benefited from, benefited from the policy from a long time, but many students have it. So I really wanted to thank you guys for that work. Um, but also I wanted to point out that I think that that's a step, but a lot of students in our system already had that. And I want us to be able to think more creatively and more boldly about what we can do to address the fact that we're learning in the middle of a pandemic. I think we're getting there. I'm not sure we're all the way there, but I, I'm trying to be more solution, solution oriented in my advocacy. And that is partially what the letter was about to you. I know that was all sent, but also another thing that I've been working on with other students is this idea of applying the weights. So I, I guess my question to you was what would stop us from, another idea I have is applying the weights that we have for our, our honors IB and AP classes, which we have for the GPA to the actual grades that show up in the grade book. I don't know if leadership has looked at that idea yet, but I know it's something that I've heard other people talk about. And I was wondering if our system has looked at that. So like, for example, if you have a B in an honors class, that would be a B plus in the grade book. And I guess the idea is that there are many students who I personally heard from who are nervous about, particularly for seniors, their mid-year grades for colleges. And I just, I want to know what the system is doing to allow us to be able to compete with schools, with students who are in person full time, because that mid-year data is coming up extremely fast. And there are a lot of students who have been suffering because of um, early, early decision, early action applications already that have passed with the grades that have gone in. So if there's anything our system can do on a granular level to, to help us before that, before that deadline comes up, uh, that's a big, that's a big thing that students, and, and that policy that I was just talking about that I've been thinking about would help everyone, but particularly those seniors. And I was wondering if you guys could speak a little bit to what would be stopping us from doing something like that. Let me just make, uh, uh, Dr. P uh, Nathan, let me make sure I understand what you're saying, waiting. I, I believe that our honors and advanced courses are already weighted. Um, in the GPA, sir. But colleges don't honestly care about GPA. They care about the grades we get in individual classes. And it's not showing up. A B in an honors class is the same as a B in, in a regular class. In the grade book in the gpa it's not though so what i'd be proposing is for us to actually make it in the grade book be different so a b, b in a regular class would be a b plus and it shows up on the mid-year on the actual mid-year report dr presidio do you have any thoughts on that well i would say that you know we have a, a work group um with uh, principals um, and other school-based staff members that's been working on the grading policy revisions. Um, that's definitely something that we could continue to have discussion about. As I said, we're, you know, we're not finished. Uh, we're going to continue to work on some other items for a third and fourth quarter um, regarding final marks. Uh, so that is something that we could take under advisement and certainly have some discussion around. Um, that's not something we had recommended at this time. Uh, we were leaning more towards allowing uh, liberal makeup policies uh, so that students could uh, resubmit work, make work up, uh, and, re -com uh, and com uh, complete uh, makeup exams if they needed to do that to raise their grade. But uh, we certainly can share that feedback and other ideas that uh, Nathan and other students have with uh, that work group. I appreciate that. And I thank you um, for answering that. And I guess what I'm trying to get at is just 
I will keep advocating and keep pushing for the system um, as a whole to be look for to look to, to look to take really bold actions to help students as we move through the rest of this really unprecedented year, especially for moving kids back and forth between online, and virtual, and hybrid this and hybrid that. That's a lot for our teachers and it's a lot for students as well. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Anabu. I appreciate your insights. Um, the next we have Ms. Omesh, followed by Ms. Bukarski. Thanks. Happy to follow Mr. Anabudo. Um, the young man at our house has been sleeping at 3 a.m. on average doing work, so I can certainly appreciate your advocacy. Um, so just real quick, um, I, I'm, I'm still stuck on where we are and, and where we, you know, we want to move forward here uh, based on the plan. So just looking at the metrics, I'm going to go back to just a final question on this. Um, right now, uh, I I would love for us to go back and to be excited about that and looking at this, you know, the proposed schedule, but looking at slides 25 and 47 kind of in conversation with one another, we're at 10.3%. We originally said we're going to be at five, right? That was our threshold. Then we said, okay, CDC changed their guidance, blah, blah, blah. We're going to be at 10. Groups one and two have been greater than 10 for a significant amount of time. So it's just not adding up for me. Uh, I'm trying to understand when, you know, are groups one and two just going to permanently be, uh, you know, going to school. Um, when we look at uh, the mitigation strategies, which are the primary piece we need to rely on. I know Dr. Uh, Adoyensu earlier mentioned that it's going to come down to that. We don't even have our audit results yet. So we don't even know how well we're doing on that. Uh, and then the, the other piece really was, her advocacy on, okay, when we looked at her slide 25, right, where she was talking about minimal, moderate, substantial risk, substantial risk is over 200, and we're at 477. So can, can that just be explained, please? There's a lot of inconsistency, and, and I really want to be, you know, on board with starting and opening school, but I, it just, it doesn't add up. Dr. Boyd, I don't know if it, Dr. Brabant wants to, sorry, go Dr. Brabant. No, D D Dr. Boyd, <laughs> Dr. Boyd, you want to start and maybe I'll go afterward. Sure, thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Mesh, for the question. So as we look at slide 25, where it talks about um, our community transmission at that top table and our school factors at the bottom table. So we are, if you're looking at our community factors in both, whether it's the number of cases and percent positivity, we are in the substantial area. But as you go down, if we were to apply um, this particular logic model or decision-making process, if you look at, look at slide 26, we do that overlay with our school factors. And so if our mitigation measures are strong um, and that we would, if we were at the lower or lowest risk, we would be able to um, implement hybrid instruction even when our community transmission was high. However, if we weren't doing well with our mitigation factors, you'll see that we could potentially have to pause or, or go back to remote learning because that community transmission is high. So that's why uh, Dr. Gloria, you know, spoke in depth about just the impact and the importance of those mitigation measures. And um, even, even with our groups, as we look at the Virginia phase guidance, again, with our groups that are in phase one, our groups that continue to be in, in schools now, and even with our, our group three, that um, has the potential to transition back to distance learning, the implementation of those mitigation strategies are, strategies are going to be truly our number one defense in, in keeping everyone as safe as possible and minimizing the spread of COVID in our schools, even when those numbers may be high and even as the numbers in the community are higher, we may have more folks walking into the building um, with COVID, but we don't want it to be spread from one person to the other. And that's where those mitigation strategies come into play. Yeah, I mean, precisely, right? Because we're putting all our eggs in that basket, which is fine with what it is, but we haven't been able to keep ourselves in moderate or minimal. Like we've gone, we're far beyond substantial. That, that's the piece, more than double, right? Like, so, so given that that's the case, why are we confident that our mitigation strategies, I mean, if we don't have the data yet, which I understand Mr. Plattenberg explained earlier, we're working on that piece. Uh, all we have is anecdotal evidence, and that's sure not reassuring. So I, I we have less than 10% of our student body right now, right, in school. So I, I just, I'm sorry to say, I, I, I don't see it. Um, 
let me just add one one other nugget or two, just a couple other nuggets. FCPS by the numbers tells you the cases we've had in, in the schools. So that's an important part to look at. The CDC's changed guidance. Yeah, it was 5% back in May. And guess what? They changed it. That's what drives some people crazy. And, oh, you know, you've moved the goalpost. I, no, it was the 10, Dr. Rayburn. They changed it to 10, yeah. right? They, they, <laughs> cre they created ranges. So that's part of the frustration. And, and people have turned, who can we trust? I am not the medical expert. I'm not ever going to be one. I'm an education expert dealing with a pandemic crisis and trying to return kids uh, to in-person, which Dr. Fauci has talked about, which studies have talked about, that transmission is low. A lot of societies, you know, th th we've had this the debate, right? Other societies close bars and open schools. We close schools and open bars. And, and we did start virtually and we're trying to return in person. Is this an aggressive timeline? Yes. Is it going to happen for sure? No, I can't promise that it is. But it's back to, do we want to create plans and try to communicate them? And, and this is, and this is, I brought you my best thinking. This is the school board. If you think this is wildly aggressive and absolutely not and bring it back in March, then you can tell me so. I'm bringing it in, in January, even though I can't predict the future of whether the, the cases, if they keep going sky high like they have, do I think you all are going to support this opening? No, I don't. But they could go down as quickly as they go up. We could have more vaccination news. Um, we'll have more data. Um, our, our COVID transmission in schools is low in terms of the epi link. I mean, that's the data we have thus far. It is. Um, that gives us hope that we could bring some groups of kids back. Even for staffing, our monitors, we know we're in pretty good shape on some of those groups, like uh, groups four, five, and six. They're, they're go. We could do it. Can we get everybody? I don't know yet. I really don't. Um, and, and I do want to say, and I think everyone knows, it's a lot harder trying to plan each month to do it than to just say, yeah, you know, come back in six months and let me know or come back next year. That's the easier way. Um, and the hard way is doing what we're doing right now, which is to try to continue to give hope to, to our kids and families to get back in school in a, in a safe, responsible, measured way. So it is tough. Um, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, it, it, it has gone really high. But I think the governor today is trying to set the tone of what we just said. How do we close all this other stuff and then try to let school boards work with getting some school um, uh, to serve kids as best they can? Kids back in school. No, I, I appreciate the difficulty. And, and, and you know, were you going to I apologize. I have, um, uh, Dr. Goodlow has her hand up. Would you mind letting oh, her please. answer your question? Thank you, Ms. Amish. Go ahead, Dr. Goodlow. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just I just wanted to very briefly just, and thank you, Dr. Brayburn, and thank you, Ms. Amish, and, and all of the board members. I, I just want to express that I want the nugget that I took away from what Dr. Brayburn just said and where I just keep my focus right now as a school leader and a community person and a parent of children in Fairfax County Public Schools and an educator is that we have to have a plan. We, we can't, yes, the metrics look challenging right now. Yes, there's fear. We don't have all the answers. We're doing our due diligence. We're preparing our schools. We're working with our staff. Families are our partners. You all are our partners. But without a plan, we have nothing. So right now it, it looks aggressive in January, but it's a goal. And if we hit that goal, that's awesome. And if the goal has to be moved back a month, that's okay. But, but we have to have a plan. And I just wanna applaud the leadership team and the board for working on this and for my principal colleagues and my teacher colleagues and our families who are partnering with us. This is a plan we're all working on right now diligently to make it work because you can't get anything done with just hope and and kicking things further down the down the field. So, you know, I, I try to be very measured in what I share. And I just want to share that insight that we have to continue to plan. We have to continue to collaborate. We have to continue to have a goal. 
And I think Nathan um, really underscored that too. Students need this hope as well. And we need to, we need to be clear with them about um, what that looks like. So thank you. I appreciate you listening. Thank you, Dr. No, no, and, and, and I appreciate your, you know, your point and and a hundred percent, you know, months ago we we would have wished we would have planned for now, right? And, and to have been able to open earlier. I think what I'm hearing is there's a, a huge conditional on all of this. And Dr. Brabrand, you know, clarify for me here, but all of this is there's an if. And that if is if we stay within a certain threshold, right? Or or am I mistaken? Currently, we're only using two of the three indicators, right? We're trying to bring the model. We shared a draft today. You know, school board members have reacted. The VDH, I think, may have more. We're trying to bring that third core indicator. If we only stick with those two core indicators, right? Right now, um, again, if it stays like it is, we're going to only have groups one and two in school. So if we keep our current decision making, Again, on Saturday, group three, if it keeps up by Saturday, group three would have to revert next week. We'd have two groups in school. That's it. Um, we're trying to add this third. That's why we brought Dr. Gloria to show that matrix that even if it stays high, there could still be hope and plans to keep moving forward. And that some districts and some societies have been able to do it and keep COVID low. It still depends. And you're right about this, Ms. Omesh. If you do a sloppy job on mitigation and you have high community transmission, you're dead in the water. It ain't going to happen. You'll have high COVID in schools. Schools will shut down as quickly as they open and we won't be reopening. That is the reality. And that's why, to be honest, and again, this is just Fairfax, right? And it, it, I love this place, but it's also the, um, we spent weeks practicing, like Jeff said, with the teams, and we didn't think it was good enough for prime time to be sliced, diced looked over 50 times, we brought in ORSI statisticians, integrator reliability, stuff that you do in a dissertation, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and I know about that, to make sure it's going to pass muster with the thousands of people who are smarter in this, this community and wanna see it for themselves. So that that is the trick. It makes it sound like, oh, you've, you've only got data now? No, we've had data for weeks but the kind of data that we want to put out and have people, you know, look at from 50 ways, uh, it, it's got to be great or it doesn't pass. And and that's always been Fairfax's uh, great challenge. Um, it's it, it's what's great about this place, but it makes it challenging too. Dr. Baker, I'm going to... Yeah, coming off, I know. I apologize. We just left, many board members left. It's almost 11, so I... and the staff timer went off a while ago so i apologize for being up quickly but please if you can thank you um yeah no and 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 i think that if or that conditional dr Brabrand should be communicated alongside all of this because we, we we create hope and then and then we don't realize that right um and it, it incentivizes kids to conform to the guidelines as well to know that that's the reason right and my 10 second answer is i don't help me board board Help this superintendent with, I put draft. Tell me what else needs to be on to tell the community. It may happen, it may not, and I will do it. I will do it, I will communicate it, but I need help from the board on what it is you want me to do or not to do. I'm bringing you what I believe this board wants me to do. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Brabant. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. I appreciate it. Um, and just a reminder to everybody, it is 11 o'clock, so as much as we can be succinct with our questions and answers, it would be helpful to let the rest of the board who haven't had a chance to have their first question on this section yet speak. I would appreciate that. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us so late. I appreciate all your time. Um, I just another reminder, we have the Next Steps document in the chat posted the link, so if board members have Next Steps, go ahead and um, use that link. Um, and on that note, I will turn to Ms. Pekarski, followed by Ms. McLaughlin. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Bray Brown, I want to thank you and your team. I know you're trying very hard and I want to acknowledge that and I want our community to hear that. And I also want our community um, to, to realize that we want our kids in school. We need our kids in school. You want our kids in school. Um, and we have some very serious obstacles, have had all year and continue to have. Um, and we need to be very upfront with our community and, um, you know, when we look at this timeline, uh, what 
what uh, Nathan said about setting people's hopes up high just to take them away um, right at the end. That worries me. We have a big hurdle with monitors, with vacation um, time, with getting them prepared. If we are able to hire them, we have capacity issues. These are large issues to which we don't have solutions. Our community needs to understand that. So I just wanted to um, make that very clear. Um, the bell schedule, as others have said, I just it's just not good for kids. We can't have young kids uh, walking home in the dark um, with the social emotional issues right now. Our middle school kids need sleep. They do not need to be up earlier. Um, have we looked at extending our walking distance, which is something that I know had been brought up earlier? Or will uh, we? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know. The yes, question about extending walking distance. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Walking distance. Oh, I was listening. I was listening. Uh, Jeff, I think we looked at that. Do you want to make any comments? Yeah, we did look at that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I miss Karski. I could add more to it. I just was trying to be brief. Okay. I mean, no, that's fine. Anyway, add, point is some of the, some of the, the bell schedule issues. doesn't work. Please go look again. Shorten the day. I don't know what, but it just doesn't work. I've even got elementary school kids emailing me. This is not good for their social emotional health. So um, that's my advocacy, and I appreciate that it's difficult. I have very serious concerns around the grading. Um, you know, I appreciate you trying to address the workload, but when, you know, that ORSI report was very important because it also, um, is a source, it's an accountability measure for us. And if we are, you know, looking at 50% and passing kids in the short term, that may be helpful. I don't know that in the long term that is helpful if they haven't mastered the uh, curriculum. And I'm very concerned with that. Have we looked at maybe doing a no mark or something like that to kind of ease the stress, but also ensure that we're keeping up with these kids and where they are? Uh, Dr. Presidio, do you want to answer quickly? I'd say we, we've done a no zero approach at many of our schools. This is really uh, about a few schools that we had not. And uh, Dr. Presidio, could you talk about the no mark versus 50? Yeah, and we'll get you some additional information. Uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders, I think, was the board member who asked for a little bit more information on uh, the grading policies and the research behind uh, the changes. Uh, but there is a lot of research on the 50. Uh, uh, no mark lower than a 50 on a 100 point scale. That is still an F, um, but it's 50 points away from a zero or 40 points away from a 10, which makes it impossible for a student who, uh, virtually impossible for a student um, who continues to work hard to make up that, uh, that deficit of points um, that they would have uh, on, a, on a grading scale that has a zero. So we can get you more information on that. There's a lot of research on that. And it is widely used um, around the country as well as uh, widely used in many of our schools uh, in Fairfax for uh, really more than a decade. So this is about equity of grading practices and making sure that we have that grading scale in all of our schools. Uh, but there's other grading adjustments that we're really looking at that we think will make a, uh, a more impactful difference. I, I think Ms. Pekarski, as you said, so allowing late work with minimal penalties so that students aren't penalized if they do the work later. Um, and are able to submit it and demonstrate uh, their mastery of the knowledge uh, and the skills that are being assessed. Um, also looking at grade weighting, reducing the number of required assignments. Um, and then as you said, we are continuing to look at um, grades uh, at the final term. So we are looking at pass, no pass options. We're looking at no mark options um, and incomplete options. Uh, but those are things that we don't have to have in place until the very end of the school year. So we're continuing to work with um, our work team on those options as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Dr. Brasillo. I look um, forward to reading that. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the ESOL support. I think you were, um, you know, this is a group of students that I've been very worried about and advocating for from the beginning and trying to get them in school um, because I guess, you know, I wasn't surprised that the learning um, issues were going to be um, 
you know, a as serious as they they seem to be. Do I are, know our special ed students have case managers that check in with them and kind of, you know, touch base with them one on one. Do our ESOL students just systematically have any support to that, um, you know, one on one level? Uh, no, not to that level, but we do have um, lead ESOL teachers in our schools um, who sometimes act as a quasi case manager for students. Um, but again, it's not funded at the same level at all. Um, but we do have some additional supports with our ESOL teachers, those lead teachers and the department chairs in our schools who oftentimes will assume um, some additional responsibility to support students. But really what we're trying to do here is have our classroom teachers um, certainly, first of all, complete that professional development that I uh, mentioned by the end of second quarter, which provides a lot of resources and strategies for working with and supporting our English language learners. Uh, in a virtual learning environment, and then using our ESOL teachers in the schools to support the classroom teachers in providing those supports to students and doing the outreach to families. Again, we have purchased uh, this year using COVID funds and some grant funds, um, some translation services and interpretation services that teachers can use to communicate with families in their native language, which we didn't have previously. Um, so those are things that, again, um, are additional resources for teachers to do that work uh, in supporting their, their students in their classrooms. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you, everybody. Ms. Bacarsi, are you done? I'm assuming that you done. are. <laughs> um, so next we have Ms. McLaughlin, followed by Ms. Tolan. Thank you. I'm just turning on my video. Um, obviously, it's very hard for us as board members to take a 50-page uh, PowerPoint slide and uh, squeeze this into uh, six minutes of commentary. I do want to note that in five hours, board members have taken up one hour of time and four hours have been responses. So part of it is we ask so many questions and we have a lot of great um, people here to answer those questions, but I want everybody to be mindful again. Board members have spoken for an hour and we've been at this for five hours. So I feel like we get a lot of grief as board members from each other. And I just feel like it's important to point at that time. Um, Dr. Presidi, I just wanna quickly say thank you for talking about best practices on zeros. Um, absolutely, the research is there. Um, digging out from a zero versus digging out from a 50 is entirely different. And um, a 50 is a failing grade and a 50 getting to 100 is a big span. Um, so any educators in the Fairfax County school system who are upset about um, eliminating zeros, I'm troubled by that because Dr. Garza, um, our former superintendent, had an extensive grading, um, grading policy task force. And I thought this problem was tackled and we had consistency. So Dr. Brabrand, Please get the regional area superintendents to work with their principals and find out where this is happening, why there's a lack of understanding on the best practices. Um, we shouldn't be having this happening, particularly in a pandemic. Um, and after nine years on the board, I'm disappointed to hear this is creating a problem. Um, at a very macro level, I just want to share with my colleagues that um, I, I actually found Dr. Brabrand and his team and also uh, Dr. Gloria, um, very compelling in terms of taking what we know is um, the most comprehensive best practice data out there about operating schools. Um, you can talk to any expert in the country and they're telling you, you've got to make schools a priority. Schools are a low spread. Uh, there are countless uh, research and news stories on this with the data to prove it. Um, I just want to leave everyone and the, and the public um, aware that I have every confidence that this school system can live up to its reputation. I do think that, as Dr. Gloria said, we can get strong mitigation practices in place. The uh, support for schools, uh, support for return to schools program run by the county has shown that we can do this and mitigate spread. Um, Dr. Gloria not visiting our schools, I don't find that problematic at all. She certainly um, again, has been keeping um, tabs on the 
SRS program. Um, she can tour it, but she's a public health expert trying to help a county of a million people. Um, and I, I, I just really found some of the pushback on Dr. Gloria Troubling. She's the expert. We invited her to give, her, give us her expertise. And um, people just seem to then think that she doesn't have a voice to um, lead us and guide us and I don't get it. So um, thank you. Anyway, I know I ran out of time. There you go. Um, thank you, I would Robinson. like Dr. Brabrand though, I would like Dr. Brabrand though to, to speak to why we're only discovering this cell schedule problem now when we had a project management plan in place already in September. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Dr. Brabrand? Yeah, uh, we we knew about the bell schedule that we had to make a shift once we went from virtual to um, in person. We we knew that over the summer, and if I didn't communicate that well, then I guess that's shame on me. But uh, Jeff, I know you knew it, and we're working on it. Uh, um, you know, back in the summer, Jeff, anything you would want to add about it? Well, just that we had presented that in the earlier conversations um, to the school board. Um, and because we went virtual, all that shift went away. Um, it's something that we had been talking about for quite some time, but that would be the only thing I would say. I mean, no matter what, they're terrible bell schedules to the point, and, <laughs> and nobody likes them. That's why, that's why I said machinations, because it's the definition of that is looking at creative ideas for, for evil, and this pandemic, this virus is an evil. Thank you, Mr. Plenberg. I do think the elementary bell schedule is untenable and we have to fix it. We just do find solutions. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Next, we have Ms. Tolan, follow Ms. Dana Kofax, and hang in there, guys. We're almost done. Thank you very much. Um, I won't say anything else about the bell schedule. I know it's a tough one but we have been talking about it since July. Um, so I look forward to seeing any more information on that. Um, I wanted to go back to the um, sports. Um, I know it was brought up a little bit earlier, but I think even just for the public to understand, um, I've had a lot of questions about, um, you know, how the sports are working. And so in, just some information on um, BHSL and their thinking and uh, metrics that maybe they're using. I know we're, we're moving forward. I know our athletes are super excited and parents are excited. Um, so just a little bit more information about how we can do that and how it's different. And, you know, having kids in school right now, is it the small groups? Is it the mitigation measures around the sports, um, et cetera? I think that it, that would be helpful for people to hear. So that's Bill Curran or Mark so, Greenfelder. I'll give it a I'll give it an initial go and then turn it over to Bill. Um, the one thing I would say, Ms. Tolan, is there really is uh, no specific metrics that the BHSL has given us, and even with the governor's most recent announcement, he basically is leaving that up to schools and school divisions. So uh, Bill has been doing a phenomenal job of working with our surrounding jurisdictions. He's on calls virtually every day with them to make sure that we're in alignment. And, and you know, there, there definitely is some differences, but as Dr. Brabrand said, you know, 80% of school district divisions are moving forward. I think it's really important to do what we can for social, emotional health and all those things. As you saw at the very beginning of the presentation, um, you know, our mitigation strategies in sports have worked. They're far from perfect. Um, we have had, you know, a few issues, but based on the number and the volume, I think we've done an outstanding job. So we've used really clear guidelines that were put together by the VHSL, which actually um, Mr. Kern had a, a big part in, in helping to develop um, because of his relationship uh, with that organization being in, in such good standing with them. So, you know, I'll let him talk a little bit further. You know, I wish I could say, hey, if we hit a certain number, we would close down. But, you know, like, like many of you have articulated very well, um, we are left a little bit out of our on our own on this one. And, you know, we have erred in the side of closing down practices and shutting down workouts early, earlier than we would typically do um, if we had to rely solely on the health department or other metrics. Um, and, you know, I take responsibility for that, but I also think that it has helped us to um, contain anything 
um, from becoming spread. And, and it's, it's working so far. I just, you know, hope um, for, for all of us that we can continue doing that. So let me let, I know I got to keep quiet. So let me let Bill answer a little bit more in detail. It, it, thanks for bringing this up. It's, it's a point that I, I can't tell you how proud I am of the fidelity that our coaches and our directors of student activities have had with regards to our expectations and what we've asked them to do. And remember, they've been doing this since June and, and, and pretty much on without pay. I mean, they're doing it as, as a volunteer or piece of this because they're just starting their season now. We're just starting the winter season. We've gone beyond what the recommendations were from the Virginia Department of Health. Um, we work closely with our folks with internally regarding the safety that we can provide to make sure we can be as secure as possible and as safe as possible. Um, er, even just how our students enter now that we're inside, enter a gym, and how they leave it is choreographed. It, it's not as simple as just what it used to be, and nothing this year is going has looked like it used to be. So we are we are doing now all we can. I feel very confident in that piece. We are learning lessons every day, as Mr. Greenfelder said. It's it's. There's always something to learn, and, and frankly, we've learned some things this week that are that are going to change. Um, we know that we just had the order from the governor that and from the Virginia Department of Health with agreement that we'll be wearing masks, with the exception of a couple of sports, um, during the high intensity periods. So it, it's worked well. Um, that though is we're in new territory with the practices, and we're going to continue to do to, to provide that fidelity to the expectations. But we are starting practices, which is a little different environment. I just want to say, like we talked about our teachers, our coaches and our DSAs, our directors of student athletics and activities have gone above and beyond. And I cannot tell you how proud I am of them. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I, I really appreciate all your efforts. And I know our um, some parents appreciate it as well. Um, OK, the girl from Wisconsin. The outdoor educator, I have to say it. Um, I have a plea out to um, Jeff Plattenberg. Um, you know, as we move forward with opening schools and getting kids in, even if it's winter, you know, one, can we um, make sure our outdoor spaces are ready for um, use? You know, we have over 100 schools with great outdoor spaces. Every school has outdoor space. It's a good time for grounds maintenance to be out there, you know, cleaning those spaces up so so um, students and teachers can get out there. Um, whether it's around curriculum or whether it's just to eat lunch, you know, we heard all kinds of concerns about you know kids eating lunches without masks on. Take them outside with a jacket on. Um, and a plea to um, Dr. Presidio. Uh, the, one of my big worries about concurrent learning is that teachers and kids are going to feel tied to that room with those cameras and they're not going to, you know, take kids outside and get fresh air and have math breaks and, you know, things that they need to do and that they can do, um, you know, using the amazing outdoor spaces that we have. So that's my advocacy on that. Um, Dr. Presidio, I was wondering if you um, are grading changes or thinking about, you talked about assessments and changing assessments, if you thought there might be any changes to um, midterm exams, um, it, you know, in an effort to, um, you know, kind of ease a little bit of the burden on our students. Well, again, um, you know, teachers do control obviously um, the assignments uh, in their classes and the grades uh, ultimately that they give, but we are encouraging flexibility around exams, thinking about exams in different ways. Uh, we have seen, you know, um, advocacy in school systems uh, that are doing different things. And um, so we're encouraging performance-based assessment tasks where students have an opportunity to demonstrate in different ways, uh, their knowledge and their mastery of the content. Um, so that gives students the ability to, again, you know, um, on a reassessment, not have to complete um, an entire uh, new assessment, but they can start from where they were on a performance-based assessment task and improve it, um, which minimizes the workload for uh, students and teachers. So we are encouraging types of practices. Um, so, you know, again, uh, we'll continue to provide resources and guides and models of what that can look like. And, uh, we do hope to see, um, you know, different experiences in place uh, uh, for the remainder of the year as much as possible. All right, thank you. Um, and this might be a question for um, our principals or perhaps Dr. Presidio. 
Um, as we're moving forward with opening um, and you know using some concurrent teaching, I, I'm a little bit unclear as to what the impact may be to our um, virtual participants. You know, if any, or do you anticipate those virtual classrooms seeing? I know they may be teaching, et cetera, but I just wondered what that impact might be. Um, I'm certainly happy to bring any of our principals in, but could you maybe just briefly restate the question? I don't think I'm I'm entirely clear on it. So I'm just thinking, you know, so right now we have students in virtual learning, right? And I understand the logistics of, you know, we might need to change a teacher here or there, depending upon, you know, ADA accommodations, things like that when we open. But um, I'm wondering, you know, are we planning to use concurrent learning for some of those kids or will our, will we pretty much be able to keep our virtual classrooms or you know people involved in virtual learning for four days separate from the um the in-person learning okay no that's good uh thank you um and i see paul has his hand up i'll i'll let paul weigh in here in just a second but i would say we are going to have to use a lot of concurrent instruction um, across the school system. Um, there are some schools that were able to separate out uh, students in virtual cohorts and in-person cohorts um, a little bit more easier than others. Um, but it is gonna be a strategy as, you know, we had discussed previously that we're gonna need to use concurrent instruction in many of our sco uh, schools and many of our classrooms across uh, K-12 um, this school year. So we've got a few principals with their hands up and I think we'll go to Paul. Yeah, I just, it's really a mixed bag. I think uh, a lot of um, combina different combinations of different schools, I for one have uh, mostly been able to do an all virtual with, um, you know, uh, just a few concurrent uh, classrooms. Uh, but it really depends on the size of the school and how many kids uh, or folks have decided to send their kids virtual or send them in person. So it's really a mixed bag. Got it. I don't know if, um, Dr. Lynch or Dr. Lynch or Dr. Goodlow, just briefly, if you want to address that, and then we'll go. Thank you. I just underscore what uh, Mr. Bestock has said. Yeah, it really depends on the school and the balance of virtual and in-person students. I know we're trying to avoid schedule disruption, but frankly, there some teachers will change, classes will need to change in order to make sure that we get our in-person match with their teachers and the virtual, stay virtual and accommodate ADA. We're trying to minimize that wherever possible, but um, it will happen. All right, um, I don't see Mr. Lipsy hand up anymore. So I'm gonna go on to Ms. Darnack Kopax and then- Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. And Mr. Frisch and then I'll take my turn. So Ms. Darnack Kopax, go ahead, please. Yes, um, thank you. So I'll basically just start with some comments. Um, medical experts from state to state do not agree on what are best practices for us right now. There's an interpretation of CDC guidelines is being translated differently by different medical professionals. So here we find ourselves as a board, as a community, basically agreeing to disagree on how we need to proceed here. I know and I am 100% on board that school is the best place for our students. I would never be on this board. I would never advocate for all that I've been or spend nine years of my time if I didn't understand that completely and thoroughly. However, I have been consistent in my advocacy for the health and safety of our students as well as our staff. I think this plan is very aggressive and I want to ensure that I understand the basics of this draft, Dr. Braybrand. So even if case numbers per 100,000 and the percentage of positivity rates are in the high level or the red level, if with this draft, mitigation metrics show us in the low level, we will open. Is that it in a nutshell? Am I correctly interpreting this? Yes. Thank you for that succinct answer. All right. So no surprise that I think um, 
I really think we need to have more conversation around this. I think we need to see where we are in January. And again, because medical experts do not agree on what are the best strategies for opening. Um, they agree we need to be open, and I agree with that. I want that point to be very loudly heard and very clear, uh, but how best to do it is still not understood. So Dr. Brabrand, on page nine of the report, um, you said you would try to get that data. I think that has to be updated weekly for us. Do you know which page I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I, I see that page. Yeah, we can start to make that. Uh, this chart's a, a very important chart, and we can start to work, uh, do FCPS by the numbers, sort of an update that we can put on the BB uh, and, and try to share what the trends are like uh, by time, by week or I think I think a weekly update would be appreciated. Um, I also would like additional data currently be get, being given to our regional assistant superintendents. Um, we as a board got get data or used to get data when school was in session about um, how uh, if an incident happened in our school, if a student had to it fell and had to be taken to the hospital. Right now, our RASs are getting information when a COVID case occurs in their region. I would like our board members to get that information. Can that happen? I'll talk to Ms. Codwell about that. I know we were giving you communication around outbreaks before. I'm sure we can work on making that happen. All right, so that was his time because I wasn't speaking then. I just I, I just want to. I'm just gonna, I, I, Okay, um, give me give me ten seconds. You know, I'll give, I was gonna tell you ten more seconds as Jenna goes back, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I think um, I, I about the metrics um, groups one and two. I'm concerned elementary school start time observations should not be scheduled. Three schools in my area have capacity issues. I definitely want that to be followed up on. I appreciate the charge, but showing the majority of quarter one marks were A's and B's. And I thank Dr. Presidio for all of those special needs groups that need addressed, um, especially the English language learners. Um, that comes as no surprise to those, those of us who represent a large portion of those students. And I look forward to working with you to address those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ivy, I didn't know if you wanted to speak before I move on to the next member sure I'm, I'm just trying to put my camera on. Don't mind. okay um mr annette Koufax, the web the our fcps web uh web page uh has the cases just on each day um the individual right. cases and it's Thank separated you. by student and by staff I think it's, um, uh, we have a plan and I think we need to revisit that plan as far as um, letting you know if there's an outbreak, you know, but, but as far as those individual cases, it's, it's there every day. I do, I do know that, okay. Dr. Yeah, I would appreciate the way we used to get it before uh, updated um, when they break out. It, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's information for the board and, um, it, it would just, and since I know we're already giving it to staff, it, we would appreciate it this way as well. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nagelfax. Um, Dr. Ivy, if you were finished with that piece, I'll move on to the next board member. I am, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ivy. So we have left, I know it's late, hopefully we'll finish today is the plan, Mr. Frisch, followed by myself, once the last two board members to speak. So go ahead, Mr. Frisch. Thank you, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Uh, following up where Ms. Derenek Kofax left off, um, I believe individual, we all get emails whenever there's a 911 call at one of our schools. Um, I'd be interested in getting, you know, updates. I do get updates from uh, my regional assistant superintendents when there's a case in my schools, for the most part, at least I think I do. Um, it'd be great to systematize that, um, not just for outbreaks, but for individual cases too. Um, as is reasonable. Um, I want to talk about um, the plan. I think it's on slide 32. Dr. Braybrand, um, I think it's good that we're acknowledging right now that we're having trouble finding the monitors, especially for the, the final groupings. Um, have you all thought any more about um, trying to find members of our staff from uh, Gatehouse or Willow Oaks who can help out in a pinch? 
Yeah, we, we're looking at that, uh, Mr. Frisch. Uh, we are going to look at that. That's one of the things our principals have asked for help on. Uh, and even if it's not drop everything, can we come up with a way right. to rotate in and help? So, yeah, I don't have the I final. It, the added benefit of that is that you're getting eyes in the schools and you may be picking up on things that you wouldn't have otherwise picked up on. Um, and I say that in part because we're asking, if we're asking teachers to do it, we're asking them to give up planning. And if we're asking them to give up planning, we're asking them to give up planning in a new concurrent model where we told them that planning was essential and that it would be one of the benefits of, of the new system, right? Yeah. Or the new, the new method. Yeah. yeah, we're asking them to give up and we can look at what we can do to help central office. So uh, trust me, our central office people are also working very hard, but yes, oh, we're all- I mean, Y'all are, I mean, it's 1125, y'all are working your tails off. I mean, it never stops. Um, I just want to make sure that we're doing everything we can, right? Yeah. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask about, if you could, you know, one of the, I'm not going to belabor the point about the bell schedule, uh, only to say that it's probably the single biggest issue that I hear about is the bell schedule. Um, one other issue that I've heard about um, a great deal is people not understanding, uh, on, I think it's slide 45, uh, are leaning into the transitional grades of seven, nine, and 12. Can you talk a little bit about that on why they're coming back first? Yeah, well, you you want to um, you want to get well. Seventh and ninth graders are new to the school, so you want to get them acclimated to knowing where to go. Uh, obviously, social distancing is more important than ever. Um, and you know, when you're a freshman in high school, you're wandering around, not even knowing which direction to go. So you want them in first to get acclimated to the new building. Um, the 12th graders, we want back simply part of the theme we've heard from the board and from our students who are seniors. We want those seniors back in school as soon as they can be. So, um, that was part of how we looked at staggering, uh, those groups for this timeline. Um, thank you. On slide 14, we talk about the mitigation around mask usage and, you know, doing our best to instruct on that. Um, what is the trigger point where uh, the inability to wear a mask moves somebody to distance learning? We've been rather opaque with the way we talk about this. Michelle? Yes, thank you, Mr. Frisch. So um, what we've done now is we, you know, we try to be very patient and understanding that our students have skill acquisition at different rates. And now groups one through three have been in school approximately six or seven weeks, dependent, dependent upon their group. One group returned 1019, the other group returned 1026. And so this week, um, we will be having the PSLs to work with schools to disseminate warning letters to families for students who have not consistently consistently as, a term, as defined as wearing their face masks 90% of the time and correctly wearing their face masks over their nose and their mouth. And we understand that all students need those prompts. So that's why there's that variance with the, the 10% so that they can be prompted and adjusted. Um, but at this time, those persons will be getting the warning letters this week and if compliance um, is not mastered by consistently and correctly, um, at the end of next week, then those students would start um, in distance learning following the winter break. But again, our desire was to truly support students because we understand that this is not a refusal, but more of a developmental and sensory piece. And we really encouraged our staff um, previously to work with students and support students to try and build that mass tolerance. Non-passive communications to students and staff and families about best practices for social distancing, hygiene, et cetera, um, one of the things that I've, I've brought up to staff is the importance of using the time we have with the students on a regular basis, whether it's weekly or every other week, to review what those best practices are so that we are constantly impressing upon people the things that they're going to have to be doing when they re-enter the school. We can trust that parents are doing it, but we've got to play a role in, in getting that across. What can we do to make sure that something like that is happening that's more active than passive instruction? Absolutely. And a number of our teachers have been doing that um, actually even prior before students came right. back to the to the classroom. Um, that was part of the instruction. Much of the instruction was mass tolerance, building it, talking about it, doing fun things with the mass so that students would be 
um, not be fearful of the mask and would see it as a part of what they're doing. So our teachers have been and are continuing to do that to make that a truly, truly active um, part of the environment. And I've had the opportunity to be able to see some of the great work that they're doing in their classroom. And even when students are transitioned um, back to distance learning, we've asked that the PSLs work with schools to develop a plan so that it's just not you go back to virtual learning and that's it. But so that we develop a plan for ongoing instruction to support those students because we want to be able to bring them back. Thank you. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up related to the teacher planning time um, deals with the grading issue. And I, I appreciate much of the, the presentation that Sloan went through about um, what we're doing to mitigate those issues. Um, one of the things that ties to teacher planning time is if we are extending the amount of time that students have to turn in their assignments and to you know get their work in, you're you're kind of tightening the grip up. Just just to finish my point, you're tightening. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you're you're making it you're you're making it more difficult for the teachers to get all of that work done in the normal order of their day. So what are we doing in that regard to help teachers again? If we're also encouraging them to give up their planning time, it, it kind of creates this scenario where it's far more difficult to get their job done. Yeah, we need to continue to look at that and see if there's other ideas that we can come up with. But I would say at this point, one major thing that we've done is uh, when students return to in-person instruction, Monday would become a full day of planning time for, for teachers. So they would not have that same responsibility that they have now to be available um, for uh, three hours a day uh, to support students um, on Monday. So they would get that additional planning time once we're back in person. So that's the that's the uh, probably the biggest thing that we've been able to put in place thus far. And our hope is that they wouldn't just be using their, their planning day for, for grading though, right? We want them to be able to prepare for the week ahead. No, absolutely. And I mean, there's no question teachers need as much time as we can give them. So, you know, we're continuing to look at strategies, but that's, that's again, one thing that we have put in place. Mr. Fish, your time was up. It. I stole an extra question. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I am going, I'm going to pass Go the gavel on yep. to Mr. Fish um, to take my turn, but my computer's acting up. So if it crashes, I may call you, Mr. Fish. Okay. Um, having said that, I just wanted to start with talking about um, I think a point that Dr. Goodlow made of the importance of continuing to plan to move forward. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get caught missing a window of good opportunity with health metrics as would happen in September and October. So, you know, I do want to just put out there that I think it's important to continue looking at fidelity of implementation. It's continue. It's important to to look at all these pieces. Um, I, I do want to make a mention, Dr. Boyd, when we're looking at the current number of, of cases positive, and he's 3% positive on that slide nine and 0.3% of all in-person students and staff. Most of the people who are in-person right now are some of our more needy populations, including a lot of our special ed kids who may have more trouble with mitigation measures. So this is kind of a slightly skewed number of in-person in some ways because of the, it's not sort of everybody as we look at. Can you sort of speak to, to how the mitigation measure might be different when we have different populations in? Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Sadler Hasner. You're, you're absolutely correct. So, um, you know, a lot of people have asked us um, in the discussions around mitigation strategies that, um, you know, how will we take what we're finding now to scale? But as you shared, um, our students who would likely have the most challenges with the social distancing, with the mask compliance that require um, a lot of assistance with the hand hygiene um, and things of that nature, those are our students that by and large are in our our groups too with our PAT classes and our ECCB and our PAT B classes that are in group three um, and that were in group four with, with some of our students that were in. And so I think we're learning a lot about what's happening now. Um, again, we certainly don't want to minimize to any degree any transmission in our schools because we don't want to have any zero with the target. So, so I want to be very clear about that. But even with the things and even with this being, this is our first time up at bat for any pandemic. We've not had this before. Um, and we're learning as we go based on information with our partners. And so giving those different variables, um, we're, we're making progress. And again, we want to get better, but we, we, we encourage that we can do good things, that we can support safe and health, safety and health, and also support our students academically, social and emotionally.
it's really important to keep an eye on the health metrics to make there you go. Yeah, to make sure that we're not putting our students in when the community transmission is too high, but also to keep in mind the importance of the mitigation for all populations. Um, I wanted to bring up a concern I have around teacher workload, in particular when you mentioned case manager every two week check in, which I think is important, but also the backlog of eligibilities and our ability for our central office specialists, ABA coaches, the OSS staff that were normally in buildings supporting teachers. Do we have availability to help with, with some of the, I mean, case managers are full-time teachers. Do we have ability to help with some of these check-ins and social emotional check-ins and eligibilities and other workload that their um, our teachers are dealing with? Dr. Boyd? Uh, we, we will um, certainly continue to look at that. As you know, we are um, having some other shifts in, in terms of our district practices as we talk about um, our transition with restraint and seclusion. And so we're retooling and re revamping some of our personnel to support those efforts, but we will certainly look at that, look at that information. I am very concerned about putting too much on the teachers in the same way with monitors, uh, you know, asking teachers if they want to do that. But what about IAs, other staff members, again, OSS staff, DSS staff, I know you're all working hard, but you know, all hands on deck. Is there a possibility for other people to be able to be willing to be monitors if, if needed? Um, Mr. McDonald? So Ms. Heismarheiser, yes. Um, Principals uh, may assign folks within their building to provide coverage. So you mentioned IAs and in many cases, um, principals that um, have gaps have um, reassigned those folks. Um, ultimately, we want to be sensitive and I know they are being sensitive to the fact that pulling those IAs out of those rooms, especially when uh, working with students with special needs does impact um, the level of of uh, service or support for students. So they're, they're, they are trying to be, to utilize that minimally, but uh, where needed, they will. What about um, our OSS staff or um, our specialists or any of the central office folks to really pitch in, even as subs for special ed classrooms? So I think Dr. Brabrand mentioned earlier that, you know, that's something that we're looking at. Uh, we don't have a, um, a fully developed plan to, to give today, but certainly it's a conversation we're having and looking at how we might be able to provide that coverage. And I'll just add, um, it's, it's really a balance of trying, you know, because um, uh, our principals and our schools need the resources that our OSS and DSS and ISD uh, um, staff prepare and how they support. And uh, at the same time, uh, and as was stated earlier, there could be a benefit of them helping, you know, and seeing what's going on in the classroom and supporting those efforts. Um, but it, it, it would be hard for it to be on a permanent basis. Um, could there be some kind of rotational schedule? I don't think it could be everyone because we need the resources, you know, that that these various central office staff supply. But we realize this is a time where we have to do things differently and it's all hands on deck. In fact, Dr. Brand and I were just saying today, maybe we should go out. I'd love to go out and be a monitor and, and serve in a classroom. And so we have to look at everyone pitching in and, and we will. Thank you. Um, I also want to just, you know, Nathan talked a lot about grading and, and our concern about teachers grading and, you know, some of these changes. I just want to make sure that overall we're looking at a do no harm mentality when we're looking at grading changes. I know there's been concerns about the rolling grade book and whether that helps some students and hurts other students and the significant number of D's and F's. So I really just want us to put a plug in for being really creative about ensuring the accountability while doing no harm in some of these changes we're trying to make. And then when you talk about having the student voice, when you talk about disconnect and overwhelm, I wanna just put make sure that we're looking at a broad cross section of student voices. So we're really hearing from a lot of our different populations of students and how they're feeling um, right now. So just to make sure we're doing that. And I, I wouldn't, I'd be remiss by saying that I, I have concerns. I, I know how important it is for our athletes, but you know, again, 
we're looking at parity between sports and arts. When our metrics are good, I really need our, our arts people are hurting. So I, I would like some answer about really getting some firm dates based, of course, on health metrics about having some parity for our arts programs with our sports. We have a meeting tomorrow on that, Rachna, with our uh, principals already set. And uh, we, we had plans. They paused when we paused group five. Um, with sports, we were just following VHSL. We didn't know if they were going to pause or delay. But yeah, we're, we're planning as we brought the timeline tonight for return to school. We know we need to go ahead and relook at uh, the co curricular, extracurricular piece. We have a meeting tomorrow with those principals. I think just last note real quick, if I can beg 10 seconds, Mr. Frisch, it's important to really put out the importance right. of the need to plan with a real serious look at our health metrics and knowing that we're going to put all these pieces together and keep safety and equity at the center. So thank you. Thank you. So I'll take back the imaginary gavel. I'll hand the gavel back over to you, Mr. <laughs> there you go. Um, so we are at the end of our meeting at 1144. We have a next steps document in our chat. If people want to add next steps to that, to the Google doc, um, given the lateness of the hour, I do not think we will, you know, we did three minutes and three minute rounds to try to give the board members plenty of time to ask questions around this. So um, at this point we do, we have had board members speak to everything. If there's additional follow-up questions, I know Dr. Gloria welcomed emails from board members and follow up with staff as well. So um, go ahead and put the next steps in and put your um, your yeses and nos and for the charts. And otherwise, I will say that this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.